Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve Belize, our beloved country. God of might, wisdom, and justice, please assist our Belizean government and people with your Holy Spirit of counsel and fortitude. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct their plans and endeavors so that with your help, we may attain our just objective. With your guidance, may all our endeavors tend to peace, social justice, liberty, national happiness, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. We pray you, O God of mercy, for all of us, that we may be blessed in the knowledge and sanctify in the observance of your most holy law, that we may preserve in your union and in that peace which the world itself cannot give. And after enjoying all the blessings of this life, please admit us, dear O Lord, to that eternal reward that you have prepared for those who love you. Amen. Announcement by the speaker. Good morning, members. Apologies for the delay in the start. I remind everyone that the time for tomorrow will also be at 9 a.m. Clerk. Bill brought from the Senate. I recognize the Honorable Minister of Home Affairs and New Growth Industries. I recognize the Honorable Minister of Home Affairs and New Growth Industries. Uh, sorry, Madam Speaker, but I do not have the papers from the clerk as clerk, yet. Can you assist the Honorable Member with Madam Speaker, I rise to move that the House do now consider the Senate amendments with respect to the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Bill 2022. Honorable Members, the question is that the House do now consider the Senate amendment. All those in favor, kindly say aye. aye. Those against, kindly say no. I think the eyes have it. Misuse of Drugs Bill 2022, amendment agreed by the Senate. Long title. Delete the long title and replace it with the following. Bill for an act to amend the Misuse of Drugs Act, Chapter 103 of the Substantive Laws of Belize Revised Edition 2020, to amend the definition of industrial hemp and to provide for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. Clause 2. Delete Clause 2 and replace with the following. The principal act is amended in Section 2 in the definition of industrial hemp by inserting the word under the Cannabis and Industrial Hemp Control and License Act immediately after the word prescribed. Clause 3. Delete Clause 3 and replace with the following. Clause 3 1, the misuse of drugs. Industrial hemp regulation 2019 is repealed. Subsection 2, notwithstanding the repeal, license issued under the misuse of drugs act, industrial hemp regulation 2019, and is enforced immediately before 
the coming to force of this act shall continue to be in force. Subsection B, every application made for a license under the misuse of drugs, industrial hemp regulation, wholly or partially, heard by the Hemp Industry Oversight Committee, when the act comes into force, shall continue to be dealt with in respect of, in respect as if the act had not come into force. And C, nothing in the act shall affect anything done, any proceeding taken, or a right which has accrued or liability that has been incurred under the repeal regulation before the coming into force of this act. Clause 4, Clause 4 deleted Clause 4 in, in its entirety, and Clause 5 delete Clause 5 in its entirety. Honorable members, the question is that the amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Bill 2022 as proposed by the Senate on 11 March 2022 be accepted. All those in favor, kindly say aye. aye. Those against, kindly say no. The ayes have it. Presentation of report from committee. I recognize the Honorable Chairperson of the Public Service, Labor, Industry and Trade Committee. Report from the Public Service, Labor, Industry, and Trade Committee on the Village Council's Amendment Bill 2022. Honorable members, that report is ordered to lie on the table. I recognize the Honorable Chair, Chairperson of the National Security and Immigration Committee. Madam Speaker, I raise to lay on the table session of paper number HR 105-1-13, report from the National Security and Immigration Committee on the Cannabis and Industrial Hemp Control and Licensing Bill 2022. Honorable members, that report is ordered to lie on the table. Motions relating to the business or sitting of the House. I recognize the Honorable Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, Economic Development and Investment. Madam Speaker, I move that that, is, that, that is raising the House suspends to Friday, 25th March, 2022, at 9 a.m. Honorable members, the question is that the House, at its rising today, suspends to Friday, 25th March, 2022, at 9 a.m. All those in favor, kindly say aye. aye. Those against, kindly say no. The ayes have it. Public business, government business. Honorable members, the debate on the second reading of the General Revenue Appropriation 2022-2023 Bill 2022 is about to be resumed. Before we begin, I would like to remind honorable members about Standing Order Number 64, presentation and the second reading of the Appropriation Bill, especially Paragraph 5, which reads, after the motion for the second reading of the Appropriation Bill, has been resumed on the paragraph four of the standing order. The debate shall be confined to the financial and economic state of the country and the general principles of government policy and administration as indicated by the appropriation bill and the estimates. Members are therefore asked to confine their debate within the prescribed limits of the standing order. I would like to remind honorable members of other parts of the standing orders, specifically standing order number 42B, which states that an honorable member shall maintain silence while another member is speaking and shall not interrupt except in accordance with these standing orders. 
We now have the resumption of the debate on the General Revenue Appropriation 2022-2023 Bill 2022. I recognize the Leader of Opposition, Member for Mesopotamia. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues on the government side and the opposition side. Good morning to the people of Belize, especially in Mesopotamia, Corozal, Orange Walk, Toledo, Stan Creek, Cayo, Belize District, and I just came from Belize Rural South yesterday. So acknowledgement to all the rural areas. Madam Speaker, as the Belizean people walk through the valley of the shadow of inflation, standing on the periphery of depression, I stand before you in this honorable house to debate this bogus budget that falls woefully short of the drunken promises and hollow hopes of Plan Belize, Madam Speaker. This $1.3 billion budget of wastage does not reflect the new horizon of equal access for the Belizean dream, Madam Speaker. Rather, this budget reflects the continued night of dark nightmare of cronyism, waste, and neglect for the masses who are still suffering from the lasting impact of COVID-19 pandemic and are now reeling from the illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has sent prices soaring and has caused inflation. You know, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister and his government come into this house and you know the minister from Caribbean shores had a term called barragans. Barragans, as you say. And, 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 and what I have noticed about this government, nothing that they have done is an original. Everything that they are doing are all policies from the Barrow administration that they have painted with a blue PUP Plan Belize brush. The roads that they are building, the hospital in San Pedro, that is a UDP administration <laughs> initiative that was started under the UDP, Madam Speaker. So again, you have a budget that is being proposed by a government who, when they were in opposition, they had all the answers. They said, well, we are going to give this and we are going to give that. They say hardies and broadies and dan dan. And none of that has materialized, Madam Speaker. All we see are higher taxes and inflation and nothing, nothing in this budget reflects any satisfactory address of the crisis that we find ourselves in coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and going in to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I know that there was talk about uh, $20 million for NHI. I don't see that. I heard there was a letter sent to the health uh, or, or to, to the hospitals. You need to go back and also write a letter to provide, to satisfy 
the needs of the Belizean people because despite what the, the SIB says, despite these Shakespearean declarations of a booming economy and this uh, Herculean recovery, that is not what the Belizean people are saying. And I am not going to trust the statisticians that you are relying on. I am going to trust what the Belizean people are saying. And they are suffering gas pain. Whatever jobs that they have gotten back, the inflation that the Belizean people are dealing with is not adequately, uh, adequately addressed in this budget. Madam Speaker, this is a 1.3 budget of wastage and misprioritization. You have to look no further than the move to capitalize the central bank with an additional 20 million. When I spoke of it, the, the member from Freetown got up and eloquently tried to correct me. But I stand by my position. This is another example of misprioritization, Madam Speaker. With the additional 20 million, creating a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. The problem we have is inflation. The problem we have is a housing problem. The problem we have is a poverty problem. Those are the problems that we have. The, the, the central bank has had the capital it has had for the last 40 years. It has not been a problem. You could have taken that $20 million, Madam Speaker, and invested it into education, the student loan scheme that is failing the Belizean people, the housing, the, the minister, not just the minister, Plan Belize promised 10,000 houses. Now, I appreciate the five houses we will give to mess up along with the other 31 constituencies. But on a like talk about lie, me omitting opposition leader of the House of Representatives is not a lie. You saying that you would give 10,000 houses in this term is a rank lie, Madam Speaker. And that is what this budget represents, a betrayal of the Belizean people, Madam Speaker. We were elected to this honorable house, to serve the Belizean people. That $1.3 billion is not your money. It belongs to none of you. We are custodians of the people's purse. And you promised that you would do better. No better. You look at the loans, they used to like to say, oh, oh, we burn the people with loans. You go and look at your loan, you're still at $112 million in loan. The way one of the talk before when they get elected, one of me get elected and voila, one of me wave and one. And all the problems of Belize would have been better. But they are getting worse. The good things that the UDP were doing, you are cutting them at the hazard of the Belizean people, Madam Speaker. As I said, that $20 million could have gone to DFC, right? Development Finance Corporation to develop the country. And what better way to develop the country and grow the economy than to make access to financing a reality for the Belizean people, Madam Speaker. The, the member from Belize Rural Central always says, oh, um, we don't want to give hands out. I agree with you, member from Belize Rural Central, but what is the alternative as the Belizean people are suffering? Provide the real alternative. So rather than take $20 million for capitalization to protect special interests, because we needed no capitalization of the central bank for the last 40 years, what we need is access to financing for the Belizean dream. You know, I was in Belize Rural South yesterday. And when I talk about the Belizean dream, you have the people that have to clean the seagrass. That is a business. That is an entrepreneur waiting to happen. But under your government, they can't go to the bank. 
and say, listen, I have this vision, I have this dream, I want to help myself. Because I can't get nothing from the Ministry of Human Development. God has said everybody can't get. The sun gone from everybody. If you win, to everybody can't get. And right is right. We need to help our people to help themselves. I agree with that. It cannot be that the people will just rely on the government for social safety nets. And the people want to help themselves. But how will they do that? If you are giving $20 million to capitalize the central bank, a problem that doesn't exist, when we have a problem of people that cannot go and get access to financing. Why? If you don't own a piece of land, if you don't have collateral, if you don't have a job, you can't pay a loan. And none of the banks, none of the commercial banks will give it because in their view, that is bad risk management. But that is what the DFC was created for. That is what the National Bank was created for. I look through, you know, I look through this budget. I look through this budget in the Ministry of Finance, and there's a line there for the National Bank. You know what is committed to the National Bank? Zero. Zero. But we have $20 million for the capitalization of the central bank. Who is that for? Who are you protecting when a bill is coming in this house that is raising the taxes on personal loans and distributions and other things? Who are you protecting? This budget does not represent a protection of the Belizean people that you cried, you wept for when you were in opposition. You said you would do it better. Last year, you know, I, I got up here and I talked about human development and the, the, the criminal response to the COVID-19 crisis. But I could understand why the Belizean people would have excused your underperformance and your initial betrayal of your promises because it was a COVID-19 crisis, the money wasn't there. But as you kept raising the taxes on gas, you kept coming back with supplementaries, and again, you kept misprioritizing. You kept spending on things that brought no relief to the Belizean people, Madam Speaker. And now, again, this, is, this budget is based on the fact, Madam Speaker, the facts as reported by the Prime Minister and some of his ministers that the economy is in great shape. Everything is pretty in Brasenio land, Madam Speaker. So where are those changes that you promised when you were in opposition? Where are the increases? We see increases in the office of the Prime Minister, Madam Speaker. Strategic management and administration has gone from $3 million to $13 million, Madam Speaker. How is that benefiting the Belizean people? How is it benefiting the Belizean people, Madam Speaker? And that is why I call this budget a bogus budget, Madam Speaker. Under my leadership, a UDP administration, our government would give priority to the dreams of the Belizean people. You know, when I fly back to this country, my beloved country, and I, and I look, I look, I look, I look at all the beauties, I look at, the, at, at all the beauties, Mem I look- Members, silence, standing order for the 2B. I members, look, members. I, I, Madam Speaker, I could let them talk and, and then I will wait. You know, no matter. Mr. Leader of Opposition, <laughs> please proceed. Yes, thank you. I know I may have left you alone for Orange Walk South, but I will get to you soon. Um, when, I, when I come back, when I, when I fly back and forth, because listen, listen, 
on a, on a like, on a, on a, boy, before I, I, I started traveling to the States, that was your political narrative. Oh, you know what they are? Oh, it a criminal. Oh, it a deportee. <laughs> Uh, 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 that is not the case now. I go to and fro. I go to and fro. And one of God for said, no, I just, I just bring back, even though I was in Africa, even though I was in Africa, the motherland, I just brought back a letter from the mayor Madam Speaker. of New York City. Madam Speaker. Sister City on, relations. On a, point, on a point of order, Madam Speaker. We, we have a point of order. What is the point of order, Madam Speaker? Uh, member Ms. for Mesopotamia, Mr. That's, that's my role in the House. Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I know the leader of the opposition is on a campaign rage for Sunday. But I want to bring to his what attention. Point of order, Madam I want to bring to his attention the, the point Minister of order. When the Prime Minister gave his budget presentation, Madam Speaker, I did not object. And you know I know my standing orders. Please extend the leader same courtesy opposition. to the leader of the leader opposition. Of opposition when, the, when the speaker of the house is on his or her feet, members sit. Members, when you rise on a point of order, you must state your point of order. We've been at this now for over a year, and we must be reminded of standing order 42B. When, we're, when you continue to breach that standing order, this is where we will land up. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just wanted to raise a point of order. The standing orders are very clear that during the debate, the matters must be on the relevant matter being debated. And in this case, the leader of the opposition is obvious that he has diverted from, from the budget. He's now speaking about his trips out of the country. That is not in any way relevant to the budget, Madam Speaker. And that's the point that I wanted to make. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Point, point taken, Member for Toledo West. Mr. Leader of Opposition, we are debating the budget. Members on the other side, I indulge, I'm asking your indulgence, standing order 42B. Silence so that the Leader of Opposition can proceed. Madam Speaker, before I was interrupted by my friend in Toledo West, the point I was trying to make is that when I am traveling back to my beautiful country and I see how magical Belize is and the dream of Belize that we offer to tourists and foreigners. It hurts my heart that that dream is not available to the Belizean people. And I accept that this has been a problem for the last 40 years. But the reason the people voted out the last administration and elected this administration was that they had hopes that this administration would deliver a budget that would address the problems of the Belizean people, Madam Speaker. And this budget does not, Madam Speaker. Again, we talk about the access for the Belizean dream. That is not reflected in this budget, Madam Speaker. You know the office of the Prime Minister, you look at the budget, the Prime Minister now has $24 million itemized to give to organizations. Now, which organizations will they give to? I am very, very suspicious of the Prime Minister having that type of discretion. Who will they give that money to, Madam Speaker? Again, it would have been better to give that money to the DFC or to the National Bank and make financing available to the Belizean people. Not just to start their businesses, but what about education? Because the dream of free education is not a dream, it is a lie. It doesn't exist, certainly not under this administration, Madam Speaker. And our revenues would have to grow and increase exponentially for us to get to that point. So it is not that you fault this government for not having the revenues to satisfy this dream of free education. You should not have promised that in the first place, Madam Speaker. But again, rather than 
the Prime Minister have 24 million as village councils approach and village councils acts are being passed and the Prime Minister now has 24 million, I quote, to give to organizations. Why not give that money to the DFC or to the National Bank so that the Belizean people, the students, can have access to finance their dream of an education. Why not, Madam Speaker? Why not be honest to your plan, Belize? Promise. Come close, all right? We can't give you no free education, but here what? We are giving you 1% interest rate loans from the DFC that you will not have to pay until you get your bachelor's or your master's and you get a job, Madam Speaker. That is not reflected in this budget, Madam Speaker. Again, empty rhetoric. Shakespearean stanzas with absolutely no substance of change and impact for the Belizean people, Madam Speaker. It is a simple thing to do, and I've spoken to the Minister of Education about it. And this is all in relation to the misprioritizations of the monies when you look at the Ministry of Finance and you look at the office of the Prime Minister and where the money is going. The money is not going to the judiciary. We talk about crime in this country. The member from uh, Caribbean Shores, I nearly feel like they set you up because they know you want to lead the party. I hear you are care prime minister at a convention either this year or next year. I nearly think they the set budget, you up the budget. With, with, that, with, with, with that ministry to, to burn you and to and make, make you look bad because you have, you have a task before you that I don't think you appreciated and you're not getting the support that you need. They cut your budget from, from, from the borough administration, from the UDP administration. You're cut by, by $10 million. So where is this commitment to citizen security, Madam Speaker? Where is it reflected in the budget? But we see increases for the office of the Prime Minister by $10 million. Increases for the office of the Prime Minister by $24 million to have a, a, I don't know if that one, village council slush fund. I don't know what it is because it's not described, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, again, we see a theme in the budget. Travel, go to the line for travel. Again, now I call no name, but if you said a name as to who owned gas station and who run the Ministry of Finance, I want whistle, right? Right? So this is great for that person that in every ministry, practically, there is an increase in travel. That good for Shell, that good for Puma, but bad for the Belizean people. Make their carpool, make their park the car. When business hours of public affairs are finished, make their park their car. So again, Madam Speaker, we see, I'll give you a, an, an example in the office of the Prime Minister. The office of the Prime Minister had a, a line for violence prevention. That has been decreased since the Barrow administration. And the same office of the Prime Minister is spending more money on furniture than violence prevention, Madam Speaker. What does that say to the Belizean people? What does that say to the people on the south side of Belize in particular? Those young men that were just like me and having hardships with a single mother, trying to find their way, and so they get misguided and they fall into the hands of the wrong people. Where is the commitment when the office of the prime minister is spending more on furniture than violence prevention? And then, you know, when I was reading the budget, I said, well, make a wait 
and go to home affairs. Because maybe that money is reflected in home affairs. But home affairs has been reduced, Madam Speaker. But you know who will not get reduced? Infrastructure. Because again, I, I, I really believe in infrastructure. I agree with all of the, of course, that is a UDP agenda. Infrastructure is a UDP hallmark policy. And when we implemented our infrastructure agenda, all of you on that side got up and rant and raved. And we need human infrastructure, and I agree. I agree that we need human infrastructure. We need a balance. We need a balance. But what I'm saying is, before I take an increase in a infrastructure, give me an increase in home affairs. Give me an increase in the judiciary. We don't see it. Give me an increase in human development. We don't see it, Madam Speaker. So when I say misprioritization, I am not just picking a fight. I am not quarreling. It is real. The Brasenio administration has betrayed the Belizean people with this budget, Madam Speaker. They can't blame it on COVID, not according to the speeches of the Prime Minister. Everything good. So if everything good, give the people where you promised them. Let it be reflected in this budget, Madam Speaker. Don't spend more money on furniture than you do on violence prevention. You know, the office of the Prime Minister had a budget that was 100,000 under the Barrow administration for back to school. This Prime Minister cut that. So again, Madam Speaker, this was a government in waiting that promised paradise when they got elected. And I have been very cautious in persecu persecuting and crucifying the government because you have to give time. Problems that have been created over the last 40 years can't be solved right away. But forgive me that I was so convinced by your campaigning that when you took office, there was no on-the-job training. You knew what you were inheriting and that you would find a way to deliver on your promises. And Madam Speaker, this budget does not represent that, Madam Speaker. You know, the Brasenio administration criticized the Barrow administration, the UDP administration, for not investing enough in human infrastructure, Madam Speaker. Yet, they have the opportunity. You are the government now. I don't know if we're still on a day in opposition so long, 13 years now, a long time. So like sometimes you guys still feel that you're in opposition. No, you can't blame us anymore. That ship has sailed. Remember, you may come up with, what well, you said, COVID-13? You, you may try to blame the UDP? No. The owner, no. No, no COVID. COVID gone. According to the Prime Minister, the economy has recovered. The jobs are back. So let us see that reflected in this $1.3 billion budget. All the promises that you made to the Belizean people. Let us see it. You promise to strengthen ju the judiciary, Madam Speaker. They promise to strengthen the ju judiciary. They cut the Supreme Court. They cut the general registry. Now, again, I am looking at the numbers from 2019-20 budget because that was the UDP administration that you rail against. So I don't want to come in here and give a budget that 
is the same as the UDP. Ono fedo better. I would have been satisfied if at least ono me do the same. Ono do the worse. Philip Gosen talk all day. And so I could talk all day because I'm dealing with the budget. I am dealing with the budget. You can go to page 26 of the judiciary, which you promise to strengthen. The Chief Justice, who again, you still have as acting. I wonder why. Huh? Strengthening the judiciary would be to give people tenor. I don't know what it is that you are trying to accomplish by not giving the Chief Justice that job. But she, maybe it's because she complained bitterly against you. Last budget, that the judiciary was underfunded. On a point of order, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the, the honorable member of, or the leader of the opposition should know that she, he cannot come here and speak about the Chief Justice and, and how she feels about anything. I mean, that's simply just not accepted. In order is that, Madam Speaker? Yeah. We can't speak I'm about, about legal law. matters. Please I'm talking about the Chief the Justice. You're not allowed to speak about the Chief Please Justice. Please state the point of order. Yes. <laughs> Maybe your father does because he's on top. But not Madam Speaker, what point of order is he speaking of, ma Madam Speaker? Mem can you have your seat? He can't leave can, it to can you. Can you have your seat, member? Mem members, I have stated before in this house that when you stand, it would be helpful if you name your standing order. It is under standing order 38 -8. The conduct of Her Majesty and members of the Royal Family, the Governor General, the Speaker, the President of the Senate, members of the National Assembly, judges and other persons engaged in the administration of justice shall not be raised except upon a substantive motion moved for the purpose and in any amendment question to a minister or debate on a motion dealing with any other subject any reference to the conduct of any such person as aforesaid shall be out of order now members to be fair both sides of this house do not consistently or regularly point to the specific point of order. It would be helpful if you don't specify the number, you specify at least the content. That was done. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it says I should not speak about conduct. I am not speaking about conduct of the Chief Justice. I am merely talking about the failed Brasenio administration's policy when it comes to strengthening the judiciary. And I am substantiating that failure based on what the Chief Justice herself has said. This is not conduct. This is what she said. The judiciary considered equal, I quote, in status and legislature, as, as with the legislature and the executive, its budgetary allocation was a minuscule 0.00824% of the national budget and was reduced by $1.5 million on the previous year. This is woefully inadequate while the judiciary is fully cognizant of the need for cost-cutting measures, especially in this COVID-19 pandemic era. I'll stop there because you get what she's saying. That was last year. This year, they cut again. And, and there is no COVID-19 excuse upon which this government can rely, Madam Speaker. So stop the dishonesty. Stop the betrayal. And do what you say. If you do what you say, you know, they call on a one-term government. I don't know if you want to read it out at the streets. But in the streets, the one-term government. If you don't want to win again, do what it is you promise. It's easy. Politics is not complicated, you know. If you make promises to people, you make promises to the Belizean people, deliver on your promises, Madam Speaker. Strengthen the judiciary. Strengthen the DPP. Strengthen the Ministry of Home Affairs, Madam Speaker. 
Because what we have, we have a citizen, we, we, we have a citizen security problem that is driven by the poor treatment of our security forces, Madam Speaker. Under a UDP administration led by me, I will make sure that our security forces are well paid. For too long, for too long, we have mistreated our security forces. Then what do you expect? How do you expect that the crime scenes will be processed adequately, Madam Speaker? How do you expect that our security forces will not be susceptible to compromise when they are living paycheck to paycheck? So let us see what it is you promised, Madam Speaker. How can we have a criminal justice system that works when you refuse to increase the budget for the judiciary as you promised? That don't mean to make it up. That don't mean to rail up, we don't know, because this is the way I think. Next year, you will see that. I will present my own budget. And I will show the opposition will present its own budget and we will show the Belizean people how we will spend their money. You said you would do it. But again, Madam Speaker, the Belizean people need to recognize that as the member from Caribbean Shores said, the government of the Prime Minister is tacos, loan talk. No deliverables, Madam Speaker. There is no COVID-19 pandemic to blame this woefully wastage budget on, Madam Speaker. They have the money according to the Prime Minister. Spend it in the right places, Madam Speaker. You know, I, I was looking at education. And again, I spoke about education earlier. And you know, the, I, I, I'm not going to quarrel with the ministry, the Minister of Education. It is not that he's not, his, his heart isn't in, in the right place. His mind isn't in the right place. But the numbers are the numbers. The numbers are the numbers and the promises are the promises. So the numbers have to add up to the promises. And when they don't, I have to point it out. That is the oath that we swore in this honorable house as opposition members. So again, you go to education. Grants for education are done by $10 million. I don't mean to say this. The budget is there for everyone to see. So Madam Speaker, how do we go from a plan Belize that promise free education to know that they cut the education grants, Madam Speaker, while expanding in the office of the Prime Minister $24 million. Where is the priority, Madam Speaker? Where is the priority? Some money for Prime Minister slush fund, money for capitalization to solve a crisis that does not exist. But you are now reducing monies for a crisis that does exist. Education is the centerpiece to growing the economy. Education is the centerpiece to fighting the crime and violence that is ravaging our country all over, not just Belize City. The Cayo, uh, man walks out of his car to get a, a tacos and come back and his partner is murdered. This budget does not address the issues that we are having in this country, Madam Speaker. We are not having a central bank capitalization crisis. We are having a poverty crisis, Madam Speaker. We are having a citizen security crisis, Madam Speaker. We are having a weak judiciary crisis, Madam Speaker. A weak criminal justice system, Madam Speaker. And the budget, the 1.3 billion of 
the people's money. Because I have to emphasize that point. This is not the government's money. This money belongs to the people. Madam Speaker, you know, many of the children that do go to school in Belize City, in the rural areas, are from impoverished households. And the Ministry of Education used to have a school feeding program. The money for the school feeding program has been cut under the Brasenio administration, Madam Speaker. So where is the commitment to this quality of life that you promised the Belizean people? The time for campaign done, I could campaign now, but for only time for campaign done, it is time for you to deliver the excuses. The excuse window has closed because according to your prime minister and his declarations, the economy is recovered. The biggest growth in, the man not just say, you know, the region, he said North, Central, South America, all America. According to prime minister, you guys have the growth. So let me see it in the budget. Let the Belizean people see it. Let it reflect in the budget, Madam Speaker. You know, they had the school feeding program. They also had the Messio America without hunger to feed students. It went from seven or $10,000 under the Barrow administration to zero under the Brasenio administration, Madam Speaker. And again, you know, we have 112 millions in loans. So on still the borrow, because when you used to make borrow look like one borrow thing. But all governments have to borrow. It is what you do with the money, Madam Speaker. And every house meeting, they come in at this house with supplementary for this loan and that loan. Sometimes I have to look Twice I have received that the, the Prime Minister borrowed the Sidon over there. The Prime Minister Brisenio or, or, or borrow. Because what I realize is this government, they, they were so envious and jealous of the borrow administration. They just me want for their turn to do everything where borrow do. Because the borrow playbook is the best playbook. Only under the borough administration has this country seen the gains that it has seen. Only under the UDP management of this country has this country thrived. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, and as I said, all around, not excluding the Ministry of Education, you see travel going up. I see that you have added $7 million for school transportation. You know, um, I give credit where it is due. I, I, I am hopeful that that will benefit the rural areas. And all I ask, Minister, is that you be fair and let this not be an orgy of cronyism, but let everybody participate in those bids because we don't see that. We, we, we don't see any transparency. We don't see any bidding processes. Huh? Infrastructure, they spend all the money, and never I hear about any bidding for all those contracts. Never I hear about Auditor General when they gave the, the Microsoft licensing. They, they went after the fact to the Auditor General, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I was talking earlier about home affairs, you know, Madam Speaker, I tried to work with the Minister of Home Affairs. I even visited Hattieville, the Kobe Foundation, with him to talk to the young men that are troubled and find themselves in a world of crime and gang relations and murders. And in this house, the record will reflect that I refrain from criticizing the Minister of Police, Madam Speaker. For, for more than a year, 
And I ask to join with him. I ask that let us make crime what it truly is, which is a national issue, not a political issue, Madam Speaker. I said that in the house. I said it to him personally. When he called me to go with him, I went with him. Then, Madam Speaker, in politics, it's not personal. The opposition has a right to criticize the Minister of Police. Not because I choose to not criticize the Minister of Police, thinking of the greater good, trying to extend the olive branch so that we can work together and solve a problem that will impact any administration and must be done in a bipartisan fashion. The Minister of Police get vexed because opposition members are criticizing him. So he reneged on his promise to have a member of the opposition be a part of the multi-sectorial team that he has to address crime, Madam Speaker. So when I say that he should resign, it is not malice, it is not personal. He is failing, Madam Speaker. He is failing. He failed by the... the, the, the Madam Speaker, it has to do with the budget. Are we tying it into the budget? Yes, it has to do with the budget, Madam Speaker. Thank you. It has to do with the budget, Madam Speaker. Crime has gotten worse, Madam Speaker. And so the minister is failing. And when you look at the budget, the Madam. money for criminal investigation Madam Speaker. remains the same as the Borough Administration, one, Madam one Speaker. Second, member. What's the point of order, member from Toledo? Madam West? Speaker, the point of order is order in the House and in Committee 44-1. The Speaker of the Chairman, after having called the attention of the host or of the committee to the conduct of a member who persists in irrelevance or tedious repetition. Madam Speaker, we have been here for quite some time now. And it, the leader of the opposition has been ongoing and ongoing and not making reference to the figures, to the budget, Madam Speaker. He has been very repetitive. And it clearly it's I am wondering what it is, whether he doesn't want to deal with the budget or it's just a sign of ill preparation. I've, I've heard your point of order. The speaker determines the irrelevance or repetition. I have not determined that. I have cautioned member to tie in and not to digress too much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good trial, Chapo, but you will not deter me. Very, very clear. Very, very clear, Madam Speaker, is what is in this budget. Prime Minister never referred to one page or one line item in his presentation, and respectfully, I did not interrupt him, because I believe in a different democracy. You should have your say, and we should too. Let the voice of the Belizean people be heard, honorable member from Toledo West. So as I said, you go to the Ministry of Home Affairs. Under the Borough Administration, Madam Speaker, Criminal investigation had a budget that remains the same under the Briseño administration. The same administration that promised to do better. But while they may play with numbers, murders are worse now than they were under the Barrow administration. You could go back, you could go back to one year where the numbers may have been one or two more, but that is not what you promised. You promised a magic wand that when you got elected, it would all go away. And so what I'm saying is, I, I accept, I accept, Madam Speaker, that it takes time. But what I'm saying, I cannot accept. I cannot accept when the effort is not being made. And that has to be reflected in the numbers, Madam Speaker. Where is the increase for criminal investigation, Madam Speaker? National security and intelligence was 24 million under the UDP Barrow administration, 2019-20 budget. It has been reduced to $19 million under this PUP administration, Madam Speaker. So again, you see the Belizean people, my dear sisters and brothers, you see how when it suits 
the Bresenio administration, the numbers increase. But when it suits you, when it is important for citizen security, for education, the numbers go down. For strengthening the judiciary, the numbers go down. So, in a in a cruel terms, they got money for what they want, got money for. And it is not the things that they promise, Madam Speaker. You know, community policing services and crime prevention went from sixty million dollars under the Barrow administration to fifty odd million dollars, 52 or 53, Madam Speaker. So again, I want the Belizean people to take notice, to take notice. This was supposed to be the budget. This was supposed to be the budget where the PUP would have come in here and showed the Belizean people who they really are, how committed they really are to the promises that they made, Madam Speaker. And this budget does not reflect that, Madam Speaker. It does not reflect that, Madam Speaker. You go to the Ministry of Health, and you look at, there's a, a line item there for $7 million, Madam Speaker, for COVAX. They are giving away vaccinations, Madam Speaker. All of these countries, the, the, the Prime Minister just went to Taiwan, where he received his, his PhD. I hope it wasn't in, in public uh, service management. I would have hoped that you would have come back with, with all the vaccinations that we need. And Taiwan have a lot of vaccination. Kayomi the brag that you, you only gave me six days and the opposition six days to deal with the budget, which has never been done before. Never. The, 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 the borough administration always given out two weeks. Huh? I would have hoped that the Prime Minister would have come back with vaccinations for everyone instead of, instead of slipping this $7 million. That $7 million you could have given to the Minister of Education so that he could stay on par. So he, so he could stay on par. He could stay on par with the borough administration's commitment to education, Madam Speaker, not cut by $10 million. How shame it would be if that was cut by $10 million to give $7 million for vaccination. And again, if you're the borough, if the loan on it, get, get the loan for the things that the people need. We need housing, Madam Speaker. We don't need no five house per constituency. We need the 10,000 house. If Uno would have give the 10,000 house, Uno would win again. But Uno would not win again because Uno betrayed the Belizean people. So it is a one term government, Madam Speaker. My, my opposition, Madam Speaker, cannot support this budget, Madam Speaker. It doesn't matter what the Statistical Institute of Belize says. It doesn't matter what the member from Toledo West say when he get up there and, and the member from um, Belize Rural South and then they talk about how strong this economy is and how great everything is. And my goodness, I, I wonder which Belize. They went to the Said Musa School of Oratory Preparation because the dreams that they sell to the Belizean people, Mad Madam Speaker, is not reflected in this nightmare of a budget, Madam Speaker. People are suffering. Inflation is real, Madam Speaker. From the rural areas, to the towns, to the cities, from the west, to the north, to the south, to the central, it is real, Madam Speaker. And this budget does not address, does not begin to address. In fact, it betrays the responsibility of this government to address the crisis that our country is in, Madam Speaker. So I cannot support this budget, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Um.
Member Felicai, allow, allow me one, one, one quick second. Members, um, may I kindly remind members, as well as members of the media and members of the gallery, that as of today, we're still on the protocols for COVID. So please, if you're not talking or having a sip of your water or coffee, your mask should be on. Thank you. Member Falekai. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> you know that's the uh, yeah, it's um there's open hostility over there. You know it's you know that's the beauty of being in opposition. You can say anything you want, any ways you want, even if you know better. The truth of the matter is that. The member from Queen Square, the leader of the opposition, should know better. Mr. Soon. Mr. Potem should know better that the $20 million for the capitalization at Central Bank is absolutely necessary. And if he doesn't know better, he should ask the member from Alberts. I'm sure she knows better. He should also know that the Oh, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. She, he should also know that the budget in the office of the Prime Minister for furniture is not for furniture for the Prime Minister's office. It's actually for furniture to pay, it's actually to pay for a bill that this government inherited, to pay for a contract signed for furnishings for the Ellen War Hall fancy building on Lake High Boulevard. I mean, I've heard that building is worth, uh, uh, not worth, but cost, 26 million. I hear very big difference. Words have meeting. 26 million, 28 million, 39 million. I don't know. But what I know is that's an overpriced building. What I know is it's a really fancy building in the middle of our community where they could have taken some of that money and shared with us. But the budget in the Prime Minister's office is actually to pay for a contract, to fulfill a contract we couldn't get out of. You know, Madam Speaker, I'm tempted to, to dismiss much of what the member from Mesop said, because it sounded quite a bit like a campaign speech for the leadership contest this Sunday. And I totally understand. If I were in your position, I'd do the same. And I'm a political animal, so I enjoy listening to stump speeches. Um, beautiful. But the truth of the matter is that this is serious business we're talking. And in talking serious business and dealing with the national budget, there has to be some truth telling. The truth of the matter is, Madam Speaker, that the former Prime Minister, and perhaps it was only the former Prime Minister and his inner circle, who knew what a bucket of slop he was leaving for us. The problem with that bucket of slop, members, is that we can't pay to take it out. We have to take it out ourselves. That is the trouble with that. They well knew what a mess they were leaving for us. They well knew that in the last two years alone, they had racked up debts of $700 million. They well knew that in the last year alone, they had wrapped up a debt of $500 million. And then the member for Mesopotamia says that they left a lot of good things, but I dare to ask what good things he's speaking of. Okay. Beautiful. The problem with that is after you spent all those billions of dollars, poverty went up, not down. Crime went up, not down. Homelessness went up, not down. Unemployment went up, not down. You spent all that money, a lot of fancy stuff, fancy buildings, fancy streets, and fancy roundabouts, but the actual lives of people got worse. Not better, got worse. You see, you see, Madam Speaker, we need to speak some truth here. Right? And it's easy for us to get caught up 
in what we should or shouldn't do, because that's the job of the opposition. They should be trying to instruct us, and they do it well, because that's what they are perennially used to. They've mastered that fine art. But the truth is, Madam Speaker, we have to tell the nation the truth. I want to ask your permission to read my speech, as we usually do in budget debates. And I want to say, Madam Speaker, that the truth is the UDP screwed up this country royally. Weeks after they left office, came the IMF to our doors, telling us we need to shut it down. The country is broke, that we needed to fire 3,000 public officers and teachers and raise GST to 19%, that our debt to GDP ratio was a whopping 135%, the sixth worst in the League of 200 Nations, that we were borrowing a million dollars a day just to pay salaries, and we really couldn't continue borrowing anymore. All this, remember this, 60,000 people at that time were unemployed, 82,000 people were underemployed, poverty, at an all-time high, going at 60% and rising. It was the worst of times, but it was made all the more painful because it didn't have to be. Not with all the billions the previous administration had at their disposal. 600 million in BNE taxes, 500 million in Petro Caribe, 1 billion. One billion dollars in domestic debt, over two billion in overall debt. As I said before, 700 million in just the last two years alone, 500 in just the last year alone. And what do we have to show? Well, you all know what we have to show. While their favorite contractors, Emer Hernandez and the Arguez boys, laughed all the way to the bank. Those two groups, well, Emer is one, and whoever else is with him, and the Argus boys, between the two of them, they took home nearly half a billion dollars in contracts, just those two contractors. The folks on the other side dealt with our money, like monopoly money. You guys need some real world testament justice, you know. I recount these things not to be the guy who wants to rehash how terrible your last lover was, but just to try and put into perspective for our people where we were a year ago, that we met this country in the worst economic condition ever, that these guys left us with that proverbial bucket of slop. We had two choices. Either we dutifully follow the IMF, and cause irreversible pain to our body politic, or we bet on ourselves and our ingenuity and try to manage the pain. But first, we had to convince the teachers and public officers that we needed to do a salary adjustment and continue the freeze of their increments. Needless to say, they didn't take it sitting down. But, we can talk about our recovery today because they responded with earnestness and efficiency. That salary adjustment gave us the credibility with bondholders to resolve once and for all the matter of the super bond, replaced forever with the blue bond. It gave the multilaterals some level of comfort that we were hard at work at reducing our indebtedness and getting our fiscal house in order. As government, we made the tough choices, but the towering economic achievements of the last year has a lot to do with the patriotism and sacrifice and commitment and competence of our public officers and teachers. They felt pain like no other year in recent memory. This could not have been a more challenging year for teachers and public officers. They were, asked to ask, they were asked to sacrifice in the very worst of times. And yet our public officers did their jobs. 
with finesse, collecting taxes in record numbers. The ministers don't collect taxes. It's the public officers who do. And God knows they were unsurpassed last year. They had to work harder than they ever had for less pay than they ever had with world prices, the highest they had ever been. But they did. So they hold a very special place in my heart. Every few weeks we go on land clinic in the villages and towns across this country. And I get to see firsthand our public officers from the lands department work like they never had before. I see them humbly. I see them humbly, diligently, with care and compassion, serve hundreds of people without complaint. Last Friday, our staff worked until 12.30 a.m. 12.30 a.m. in Orange Walk North, from 8 o'clock the morning till 12.30 that night. They sat and ate at the same spot, used the bathroom once or twice, and it was right back at it. Eyes red, shoulders drooping, totally exhausted, but they kept going. It was our public officers at their absolute best. And I get to see this every few weeks. And I get to be reminded working with them while we have to fight for them and why we have to be eternally grateful to them for their cooperation and commitment. It could not have been easy. In my ministry, some people come in on Saturdays. Sometimes during the week, they work until 7 or 8 at night with no overtime being paid. I could never ask for more. And that's the case at our hospitals and our clinics, at customs, at immigration, in the police, the BDF, and in the classrooms. In the time of COVID, with galloping inflation and rising fuel prices and a pay cut to boot, they put their lives on the line time and time again. We can't ask for more, and we can't pay them enough. And it is why I am extremely happy, Madam Speaker, that we get to keep the promise we made to them, that we are not going to keep this salary adjustment any longer than we needed to. Yes, we could have done better on our side. We could have been more disciplined as a government and as ministers. We could have communicated better been more sensitive in spots. We could have heeded the people more times. But what we were able to do this past year is nothing short of amazing. We stood head and shoulders above the rest in Central America and the Caribbean, in the Americas. It's easy to stand up as opposition, you know, and criticize the budget. We got to do that for 13 long years. It's easy. You can attack in poetry. You don't have to be responsible for a nation of 430,000 people. You can speak for your diehards, but we don't have that luxury in government. We have to govern in prose. We are responsible for every single public officer, teacher, police officer, nurse, stevedore, laborer, child, student, parent, single or otherwise, disabled, elderly, unemployed, unemployed in this country. Whether they are PUP or UDP or no P, we are responsible for all Belizeans. And it's a responsibility we take very seriously. And yes, we may disagree and quarrel sometimes. They may even protest sometimes. That's their fundamental right. But notice how much different we are than our predecessors when it comes to protests in our democracy. We respect and embrace our people's right to protest. Remember this? 12 years ago, when the cane farmers and BSI and ASR fell out, the then UDP government sent in the police, unleashed the police on the cane farmers. At the end of the day, we ended up with one man dead. Now fast forward to 12 years later, when relations soured again, between the cane farmers and BSI and ASR. We didn't send in the police. The Prime Minister, in the middle of Christmas holiday, along with his other ministers, shuttled back and forth to ensure that we reached a transparent, peaceful, beautiful resolution. 
what could have been a very nasty standoff ended up being settled in a most peaceful way. And a few weeks ago, probably a couple months ago, when relations soured between the stevedores and the Port of Belize, no sooner than the BDF was sent in than they were called out, because that's not the PUP way. Contrast that with when the stevedores gave their 21-day notice of intention to strike back in July of 2020, and they followed that up with a 24-hour vigil. And you know what the then UDP government did? The same, did, the same thing they did 12 years earlier at Tower Hill. They sent in the police and rubber bullets spread everywhere. Member for Lake Independence, we have a point of order. What's the On point, the point of, order? of order? This, uh, where, how is this tied into the budget, Madam Speaker? Point taken. Right? Uh, you know, I'm a family, but... Point, point taken. Mem member for Lake Independence, let's please tie this let into me, the budget. Let me make my point, Madam Speaker. As a government, we are humble enough to accept when we are wrong and try to correct those wrongs. We have to be able to self-correct. The last government never had that capacity. They couldn't self-correct. Whenever they were right or thought they were right, they were right, no matter the cause. That should be the, pu that should be the beauty of our political system. That's what is at work with the ex-gratia payment to the stevedores. The privatization didn't go as planned, so we are correcting that wrong. I know some billionaire wants to tell us what we can or cannot do for our own people. But successive governments have made him believe that he can do that. So now we have to fix that. And once again, it's the teachers, the Belize National Teachers Union, leading the charge. What would we do without you? You're the best of what we have. Returning to the budget. Thank you, member. Jump high, jump low. This is our biggest national budget ever. This just two years removed from a complete shutdown of the country and the economy. This recovery is unlike any other. We are still not where we need to be. We are still not even at 2019 levels. But yet with this budget, we are pivoting ever so slightly towards the arc of our social justice needs. We can't do all we want to do just yet, but we are going to get some done. We will do more land clinics and provide thousands more house lots for first-time landowners. At our land clinics, at our land clinics, we don't play politics. We don't see colors. We don't see divisions. We don't see ethnicity. All we see is people, the Belizean people. We will build more concrete houses, concrete houses, because that's what the PUP does. We build concrete houses. We don't build plysem houses. And we don't, and no one said we have a one-year term. Even the village councils have three years. We have a five-year term. So judge us after five years. Don't judge us after one year. And you can't possibly judge us when you left us in this mess. No, 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 no. It's a marathon. It's a process. We're getting there. So 167 the first year. It's a nice start. It's 167 more concrete houses than was built. 13 years under UDP. Guys, they don't build concrete houses. Know that. Even though they borrow billions of dollars, right? Because poor people don't deserve that. That's the problem. So they're going to leave much box. They're going to leave like the same. Leave, leave. That is so. That is so. We will be providing free education at Maud Williams High and Sierra Vernon and Gwen Liz in this year's budget. And Excelsior. Because we understand that the greatest antidote to crime and poverty is a sound education, not more money for the police, more money to make sure that every single child in this country gets to go to school and complete school. Under the UDP, those billions of dollars that were spent, 2,000 kids were dropping out of school yearly, you know, out of standard five and out of standard six and first form and second form primarily. You know why? 
because the kids and their parents couldn't pay the fees. So we were spending billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars on road contracts, but we couldn't even find one. A million dollars, well, a one point something million dollars to ensure that these kids stay in school. And then we want to know why crime is through the roof. It will always be through the roof until we make sure that every single child, red or blue, stays in school because the kid that stays in school is not going to get caught up with the gangs. This one I like, Rodwell. I need to get some of this. We are providing a record additional $2 million for youth and sports. Right. Now, brother, me, they are for 1998. Well, I'm gone, I'll come back. And maybe something happened when I'm gone, I don't know. But we never had no money off of sports and youth. Never, ever. Never. All right. I know I lost something about that. I know I'm a bet for that. Nothing ever happened. $2 million for youths and sports. And more come. Can't remember that five years, right? Two years I lost this year, yeah? Two million I lost this year, yeah? Make sure I get my cut, right? Make sure me here I get some of this. I'm excited. All kids should play sports, man, whether they're good at it or not. Because sports teach you discipline, character. You learn for resolve conflicts. You learn for work with one another. You understand that you want to win so, and you lose so, right, my friend? <laughs> you want to win so, and you want to lose so. But you learn that if you work really hard, you could be really good. And if you don't work as hard as the others, then you'll get left behind. And nobody likes losing. So you learn hard work, and you transform that into your schooling. You get confidence. The kids are really good at sports. You get confidence in other things. So I can't understand why after all these, all these years, we never provided the additional monies for programs. Instead, with the last government, though, that spend money, they spend two million dollars per offense to Myron Jones, you know. Me never see that yet, brother. Me never see nobody building a fence before they build the structure. Right? Let me need a supplementary budget for the fence. But nobody never carried in a quote for that. But they want to carry with a quote when they provide only 1.5 for some ordinary man from outside, I believe, city. You see the hypocrisy in all of this? Right? There you go. So, $2 million for the offense, the Marion Jones. Tens of millions of dollars because every year, a lot, a lot, a lot of billions mean the budget for Marion Jones. And when, where are you going to Marion Jones? There's a big overpriced place where people go go exercise. You could do that anyway. You could do that anyway. Tens of millions of dollars. Right, Minister Bernard? For Marion Jones. Wasted money. We spent $33 million for the Civic Center. We really can't afford. I don't know how many times people use it in a few years where they're there. 33 million dollars. Like all of the bright guys that couldn't get together and say, you know what? I could spend about 10. I could spend only 15. I could get my, my, my stadium where I could, where I could go back and forth, where I could use the AC and you could, you could make an adjustment and you could use natural air. And I could spend the rest of the money on programs. Because our kids in this country, as talented as any other child in any other part of the world. For we kids, they may beat up, you see in both, you know. For we kids, they may run left and do a lot of things better than all the kids in this region. But what happened? As you get older, that then training become important. That then nutrition become important. That then financing become important. And so then we get, we get left behind. We start to lose football games by eight, nine, ten goals. We start to get blown in a basketball because we know to provide the kind of support our kids need. But sports build confidence. Sports build communities. There is nothing like sports to get the country I believe united. But we just don't take it seriously. The budget will see us spend $3.2 million more on national health insurance for a total budget of $22 million. Remember for Mesopotamia, I don't notice that. But that's a big deal. Because what I mean is that more of the people in the South Side could get registered, could get access to this good thing. The people in from Orange Walk will get to enjoy this good thing. The people in from Corozal will get even better service. 
We cannot overstate the value of NHI. We lost 654 persons to COVID, and we grieve for every single one of them. But without NHI, they are say we probably would have lost a lot more. But now, thankfully, we can finally get back to some real preventative medicine. And NHI plays an outsized role there in trying to prevent the cancers and cardiovascular diseases and cholesterol issues and diabetes that perennially kill hundreds of our people each year. San Pedro will finally get a state-of-the-art hospital. For how much millions? A lot, a lot of millions. A lot, a lot of millions. 34 million from a hospital where people want to use every day. No power building where we just pass and watch and say, boy, we got a nice building, eh? Yeah, yeah we got a nice building. We could just broke off piece of that and eat that. You know what I mean? And we go take picture there. We go pose off and take picture there. And then all the UDP conventions, they get held there when they're in a government. When they're in a government. In our position, they're going back to a good old reliable bird's eye. Brazil, Brazil. Henry Young and those. Y'all don't remember for Alberts? This thing I interested Sunday. <laughs> this thing I interested. But that's a beautiful thing, right? A democracy. That way it's supposed to be. You know, we have fun with it. Now, privilege we have. You know, for that opportunity, that's a big privilege. We will spend some more millions on the police. Again, state-of-the-art facility, right? To deal with, what do you have to deal with? Digital forensic. By the how much years they ask for that? You know, the house outside, the house wrong the lane. We can't get that. <laughs> like that, we just, they, they just couldn't wrap their mind wrong spend while money for digital forensics. When everywhere in the world, People is solve crime that way there. And then they wonder why we can't get convictions for the simplest of crimes. Every year, every year, every year. Every year. Right? We have to break the law of the jungle, man. We have to find a way to get some enduring peace. We young black men, they have to want more for themselves, you know. There's some impoverished increasingly. Unforgiving society. We have to really think long and hard because when a young black man kills our next young black man, he'll kill himself. There's a monk of self hate there. We have to try to deal with that. Because I just common sense, man. It makes absolutely no sense for our people to be doing that to themselves. Or else everybody laughs at us and wonder what's wrong with us. We have to try to figure it out amongst ourselves, man. And if I was harboring any illusions about the extent of the recovery, I'm reminded every day, because all my constituency funds are more going to grocery bags. Every dollar I can get goes to that. And in this budget, I see we'll have a $6 million for, 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 for grocery bags. Member for Belize Rural Central means I'm going to leave it more. Come for that. We, 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 we dig deep, we dig deep, because the times are real. As I said, we inherited a real, real mess. We got a constituency development fund. We the, we the, not the money pay like you don't know about that. And I know I go collect it, thing, right? I know I go collect it. First in line, no. Six million dollars we have for that. All 31 constituencies. What we could do with these social projects, we could do with these infrastructure projects. Well, all of my hands have been going to food. I pray for the day when I will spend less than that and have money for other things. I have to big up the member for Port Lyola like, way there. Boy, you know we love that program, right? Out of the constituency development fund, I don't know if that he can come up with that idea or that who can come up with that idea, but take credit for it. The man two days ago gave five hundred dollars to fifty eight constituents to start up their least small business. Man has done a beautiful thing. I have to borrow the idea. You you do something like that? How oh, I don't know about that, because I know you don't do nothing and hide it. 
<laughs> but now, wonderful thing, right? Wonderful thing, man. I read that, Gilroy. I read that. I read that. And the long awaited adjustment to the minimum wage will take place this year. July 1st. No more starvation wages for workers. Two years, Two years ahead of schedule. I have to give it credit. We have to come back. I have to give it credit. It's all about having a living wage, man. How can I, or people be working full time and still live in poverty? That cannot be. We will also see the rollout of the Healthy Start feeding program in our schools. I never hear the Prime Minister say that in the budget speech. Because we have to make sure the kids don't eat. And I'm a teacher for a little while, 100 years ago. I had kids come in the classroom and tell her, like, I can't stay a teacher. I can't, I can't, do, can't do the work today because I'm hungry. You know, it's real. Hunger is a massive issue in our communities. I'm a big part of the crime situation, but we don't really talk about when things are openly. So uh, we have to welcome and big that up in a, in a massive way. History will judge us, Madam Speaker, on how much we've done for the people at the base of the economic pyramid, not how many cronies we make rich. The test of whether, of whether any government is successful is not how many elections they've won, but how well the least advantaged members of our society are doing, whether they live in a sea of despair or whether they are coming closer to the ocean of prosperity. Turning to the ministry. Over the years, we have seen the wealthy and connected use money to make major political and social decisions. It's been going on for a long time. It has had the consequence of great transfer of wealth to these folks. So much so that in our country, 264 persons slash companies, 182% of all the privately owned land in this country. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. No, 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 nothing so. You had an office? No, 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 no. You had to give a story. <laughs> the equivalent of 3.2 million acres of land. Our fabled land clinic is about doing just the reverse. It is about transferring wealth to our ordinary citizens, putting land that are valued at thousands of dollars in the hands of poor people for a fraction of the cost. And while some may get weak and fall prey to the temptation to sell, the vast majority are looking to start their family home and get title so they can mortgage for a better house or start a business or put their kids through school. It is the greatest feeling when we see the ecstatic joy in the face of a Belizean when they are able to get a piece of land for the first time. The tears that warm our hearts when we are able to solve a land problem that's been the bedeviling a family for years and years. Or when a teacher tells us we just made her dreams come true. It's why we do what we do. But that does not mean that we don't work just as hard to provide land for business ventures, to help spur this economy along, and to create jobs for the many unemployed in our country. So we can collect more taxes as a government and do more common good. I can tell you also that these beneficiaries are no less happy when they get their land title or purchase approvals. Land just does something to the soul. But that is not to say that we are without our problems at the ministry. The thing is still not moving fast enough to mow down the many, many thousands of backlog at the ministry that has left us with thousands upon thousands of files untouched. The long-awaited Land Folio 7 has still not arrived. And try as we may, we still do not have enough hands to deal with the backlogs. But that's an added benefit of the land clinics. We get to deal with quite a bit of the backlogs live and in person. And while we are doing better with the private land transfers, we still have tremendous room for improvement. But we are hard at work at it. We are able to collect more than twice what was collected the previous year in stamp duty, and 30% more than was collected in land taxes the previous year. And yet still, there are many millions of dollars owing in land taxes. If the wealthy was paying their fair share, 
we wouldn't be here in this deep mess. But chances are the last government may blow that too. As the Prime Minister announced in his budget presentation, it is hoped that the concentrated expertise that the newly formed tax recovery unit will be able to start slaying this dragon. Once more, I want to use this opportunity to inform the public. You don't need to pay any employee to get anything done at the lands department. Every time you pay your taxes, you are paying us, public officers. You do not need to pay for the same service twice. We don't condone that kind of scandalgery. We have low tolerance for that at the ministry, man. So whoever they do it, they need to stop. We also have low tolerance for people who get lands cheaply under the scheme where the lands already have an owner, and so the government does not have the power to let that land, to transfer that land. Those persons buy the land from government for very cheap, and then when we tell them, well, you know what? There's a problem. You can't have that land. You can't keep that land. They turn around and take us to court and want to collect millions of dollars. Not you. I'm 40 something mil. I'm 1,000. Yeah, maybe 30 or 1,000. You got to face a brass. Face a brass. You know that um, there's, a, there's a case that really gets under my skin. This gentleman um, bought, I think it was 170 acres for shrimp farming. Turns out only 30 of the acres was owned, were, were owned by the government. And so the next 30, 130 plus acres um, were not ours to give. A man paid $56,000 in a land. A man carried with a coat and wants to sue for $17 million. And then no matter how we try to tell the man, listen, man, we're going to give you alternative land somewhere else. We're going to give you a land because we're suitable nearby for the same thing we'll say you want to do. Man don't want to hear that. He wants $17 million. Never. You understand? I don't know how many man they walk wrong or drive wrong like nothing happened. Because that criminal, that immoral. Like how you could say you don't believe in and I want to do that to the believe in people, especially in a time like this. Never. And we got tens of any cases where the government believes and the people are believes upon the hook for millions of dollars. It's really, really, really sick, man. Finally, I can assure you that we are well on the way to provide land for our teachers and nurses and police officers and soldiers and public officers. We are concentrating our efforts there, as you can imagine. That is near and dear to our hearts. My constituents, the people of Lake Kai, who I have been married to for the better part of my adult life, for uh, turn about 20. You've been patient with me all these years. All the years when we don't got nothing, because there was a time when we mean our government, we mean our opposition too. And when they give trouble, we resign, we get fired, all the people lose their job, we suffer. When they stick with me, and they've been patient again last year as we tried to crisscross the country to make sure that we provide land service to all the many peoples across the country who have been left, who had been left out for the previous 13 years of the UDP administration. I am not here, if not for you. You voted for me when I was skinny and green. You still vote for me now when I'm fat and wool. All you do is vote for me. And my job is to make sure that I continue to give you everything I've got for as long as I could. This budget will be good for us, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Infrastructure and other, but I'm married down publicly. I guarantee me, when I get a fair share of houses and roads in this budget. The Minister of Education, you don't tell me, whisper to me earlier, you tell me all the time. I get a lot more school fees paid in this budget. The Minister of Health, we make sure that we stay healthy and safety and safe. The Minister of Agriculture, you only gave me one greenhouse last year, Papa, I need at least three more, right? So I, 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 I just to make you know publicly, right? No, 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 I know he's a man of his word, you know, you might be late, but he's a man of his word. <laughs> Why that thing not a big deal, man? No, no, no. <laughs> sorry, 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 I'll say. <laughs> That thing not a big deal, man. Like, 
Prairie sticks when any man don't plant up and they get some big, fat, juicy, sexy looking green pepper, sweet pepper. The man they want to share it everywhere. Um, just an exciting thing, youth swear. Normally, want to do nothing just to chill and hang out. Um, they watch things grow. I, I, I imagine that the most exciting thing next to see us is many blacks to go up for your house. Got a holy man going like a really big deal, right? And truth is, COVID teach you, we have to produce where we are eat and eat where we are produce because the price of everything worldwide to go up and there's no end in sight. So pretty soon, you yeah, get more real and real. The Minister of Human Development, well, they don't promise me when I get some extra grocery bag. And when I do this food court, the Mahogany Street from Boulevard to Jasmine, you don't got the money. There you go, yeah. There you go, there you go. So that they come, and with COVID slightly out of the way, I make sure we got a summer programs with kids and with Martin Fest. I can't wait, man. You know, a lot of the kids then grow up with summer programs, right? Um, big man and woman now yeah. look back fondly at many things, right? Yeah, you understand? Yeah. And then they quarrel it, yo. We make sure that you have it for finite kids because they know the value of it, right? So we really have to do that as elected representatives, man. Not a big deal. We might take it for granted as we grow older, but not a big deal. And I close where I started, Madam Speaker. Despite all the UDP rhetoric of pro poor policies and all the talk championing infrastructure spending and all the millions spent from Petro Caribbean BNE taxes. And over two billion borrowed. Man, they win three straight general elections, you know. Three. Four straight municipal elections, five village council, two by elections. And what we got for sure for it? It's not that we want to lament and nauseum about what the UDP left us, but it's worth repeating just to put in context why we are where we are and why we cannot ever repeat these atrocities of the past. The standards of accountability must be highest for those of us now in government, while the condemnation must be loudest for those who got us in this mess. A profound lack of concern for the next generation was what the UDP demonstrated. In fact, I believe it was a deliberate sabotage of the successor administration, the effects of which have fallen disproportionately on the poor and working class in this country. The last thing we can afford to do is to go back to the very policies and behavior that got us in this mess in the first place. So our party must guard against overconfidence with this recovering economy and with this 26-5 supermajority. That is when we are prone to make mistakes and don't do enough to support the people we really need to support. We need to master the art of listening and develop past policies that are in harmony with the views and desires and ambition of our people. It's not rocket science, but our people, especially those at the base of the economic pyramid, are veritable geniuses. We need a renewal, Madam Speaker, a renewal of spirit, renewal of energy, renewal of community, renewal of country. We need to be there for each other in this time more than ever before. We can't leave anybody behind, everybody for win. Madam Speaker, I stand in full support of this budget for fiscal year 2022 2023. I, I recognize the member for three tongues. Good job, brother. Good job, good job. Madam Speaker, I rise on behalf of the people of Free Tongue to support this budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 and to offer my contribution to, to the debate. You know, Madam Speaker, it's, it's, it's always a challenge following my, my good friend, the Honorable Member for Lake Independence, the Deputy Prime Minister of our beloved country because he does such a fantastic job of slicing up the UDP, slicing up the, the very feeble presentation made by the 
leader of the opposition this morning that I find myself kind of feeling sorry for them after he has spoken. Uh, so I, I kind of want, I'm sympathetic. I don't want to fire shots. I want to hold back. Um, but, yeah, but I won't, I won't. <laughs> you know, Madam Speaker, um, after a UDP press conference a couple months ago, a very clever but mischievous fellow um, described the UDP to me as a corpse performing its own post-mortem. Oh, you know what I mean? Well, like a dead body get up and they, they cut open itself to find out the how the way kill me. The how are dead. And that's exactly what came to mind when I listened to the the honorable member from Mesopotamia this morning. Um, it's really like a, a corpse performing it, uh, its own internal self-examination. Um, how in the world could you come to this National Assembly and cry and bemoan the challenges the country is facing when only a little over a year ago your party was in government for over a decade? So it's an admission of the absolute failure and neglect and incompetence of your own party that you have come here today to provide evidence and testimony for. You know, and in addition to that, Madam Speaker, the, the, the leader of the opposition, and I think we've known this for some time, but I think he, he really established it very clearly today. Um, he's not very comfortable with figures. He's not very comfortable with, obviously, with economic policy. Um, oh, no. What's the point of all um, that? You know, first, the member from Lekai was campaigning to be prime minister. Now, the member from Freetown is, first, I was a corpse. Now, I'm not comfortable with figures. Madam Speaker, we need to get to the budget. The point, the, the, the standing order says that, that we have to restrict and confine our speech to the budget, Madam Speaker. Member from Mesopotamia, please sit. That's not a point of order. The member is actually referring to your budget presentation. Member for Freetown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So what I, the point I'm making, honorable member, for your benefit, is that you really should, should, should get a, at least a 101 class in <laughs> yes. um, in, in just reading the budget book it's very important you're talking about the budget it's important for you to understand what is stated in the budget book and what it means sir and and, and the budget, and the budget, the capital budget for education was increased by 13 million. You don't understand, that's the very point I'm making. You're looking at recurrent expenditure, but you haven't even bothered to look at capital expenditure. There is recurrent expenditure, there is capital two, there is capital three expenditure. If you look at the whole picture, you will see that we are adequately funding every sector of the economy. The capital budget was increased by $13 million, sir. Understand what it is. So, you know, you really need to, to, to learn a little more about the budget book if you're going to talk about the budget. That's the point. The, the member, the honorable member talked about betrayal, Madam Speaker, and really, as I said, what he should be talking about is the decade of, of UDP 
betrayal. That is the betrayal of this country. And as the Deputy Prime Minister pointed out, it can't all be fixed in one year, sir. It can't all be fixed in one year. But we are well on our way to fixing it, and fixed it will be fixed. So we don't want to belabor all of these issues, Madam Speaker, but it's important, again, to talk about what our government inherited. We inherited an economy in recession, even in recession before COVID. Let's remember that the economy was in recession before COVID hit Belize under the UDP, a UDP recession. Four consecutive quarters of negative growth under the UDP, even before, reset, before COVID hit our country. COVID just took us over the cliff. It was a decade or more of corruption and incompetence, Madam Speaker. We will, never, we will not forget all the, the myriad of scandals, scandal after scandal, corruption and incompetence, growing unemployment. Unemployment reached as high as 30% under the UDP. A ballooning public debt, Madam Speaker. Both domestic and in external. We inherited a public debt of over $4.2 billion. $4.2 billion. The domestic debt alone grew by over a billion dollars. Over a billion dollars between 2014 and 2020. The domestic debt. You know what that amounts to? That's like borrowing $3 million a week, Madam Speaker. $3 million a week. Domestic borrowing. Belize was on the verge of devaluation, the dreaded D word that nobody likes to talk about. There was no plan in place to grow the economy, Madam Speaker. We had a UDP government that was focused only on winning elections, all the while Belize and the Belizean people were losing their future. We had a broken society, growing dependency, a collapsing health system, education system collapsing, complete rural neglect, broken infrastructure with all the billions of dollars they spent. We had a broken infrastructure, especially in our rural communities. No housing program, none at all. You know, for 10 years, we had a housing budget that was there just to pay salaries. Pay salaries, absolutely no housing program to improve the lives of the Belizean people. And very damning, Madam Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister referred to it as, as well, but it bears repeating. After 12 years in government, poverty, the poverty rate in this country had grown from around 40% to 52% under the UDP government. I mean, what greater indictment of a government can there be than having poverty grow by uh, over 10% under your watch. Man, you all should hang your heads in absolute shame. Absolute shame. And what was the response of the, the UDP? The former prime minister, when he was demitting office, when he was about to leave office, famously, of course, said, after me the deluge, after me the flood, after me the flood. How callous, how cold, knowing the great destruction they had brought to this country over the past decade. And all he could offer up was 
I sympathize with you. I sympathize with you. After me, the floods. Madam Speaker, it's no wonder then that the, when the IMF came to town shortly after the elections, that they were demanding that the new government has pointed out again by the DPM, that we fire over 3,000 public officers. That's what the IMF was demanding. Fire, send them home, 3,000 public officers. The, it's unsustainable. Increase GST to 19%. 19%, Madam Speaker. That is the legacy of the United Democratic Party. So when the honorable member for Mesopotamia talks about the Belizean dream, he should remember that it is the legacy of the UDP that has delayed that dream for the people of this country. You are the ones who have delayed it, deferred that dream because of your waste and corruption and incompetence for over a decade. So that led directly, Madam Speaker, to what we had to deal with last year, which was a very painful period for all of us in our country. It led to the 10% salary reduction to our public officers and teachers. And, and of course, Madam Speaker, um, tough, tough decisions had to be made. But we are here, Madam Speaker, one year later. And the evidence is very clear that we did not sit and cry. We did not wait for the floods. We rolled up our sleeves and got to work. The indicators as set out in the budget and as the Prime Minister has outlined in his budget presentation, show a strong growing economy. 12.5% growth. We have over 4.6 months of import cover in the central bank reserves. The banking system is very liquid, over $700 million liquidity. Unemployment is still not where we want it to be, obviously. Uh, but it is now below 10%. Tourism, agriculture, the services sector, all of these sectors are on the rebound, growing. New vision, new energy, new leadership, uh, moving these important economic sectors forward, Madam Speaker. Tax revenues, again, it shows when you have a strong, focused, committed, team the, at the Ministry of Finance led by the Prime Minister, tax revenues, they made a concerted, consistent effort to improve the collection of tax revenues. Tax revenues are up by over 20%. And debt management, Madam Speaker, not an important indicator of economic growth, economic strength. That's nothing short of miraculous. A uh, brilliant effort by the Prime Minister and his debt management team, um, which, led us, which led us to the blue bond for conservation, which reduced, Madam Speaker, we can't say this enough, the blue bond for conservation reduced the public debt of this country by over half a billion dollars. Tremendous work. It's being hailed all across the world as an innovative, creative uh, effort uh, to reduce public debt of countries. The debt to GDP ratio, the debt to GDP ratio, which is an important indicator of the strength of your economy. Um, Madam Speaker, again, because of the efforts at the public debt, the debt management, that has been reduced from 133% to 108%. The debt to GDP ratio 
absolutely remarkable achievement. So much so, Madam Speaker, that the same IMF that rode into town with doom and gloom one year, one year ago, same IMF, the Prime Minister talked about it in his budget presentation. And I happened to be in a room listening to the, 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 the head of the team, team leader, right? Yep. Singing now, one year later, singing the praises of Belize. Absolutely singing the praises of Belize, saying Belize is a trailblazer. Belize has done things that they could not imagine would have been possible. The very same IMF that came to town one year, one year ago after the election, saying you have to fire 3,000 public officers, raise GST, are now singing the praises of this government and the country of Belize. They were the ones calling for a structured program, um, even possible, as, as we have said, possibility, the, this looming possibility of devaluation. Um, they saw how absolutely committed Belize was to the homegrown plan and how well that plan was executed and continues to be executed because it's not done. A lot of work remains. So tremendous work done on that front, Madam Speaker, in terms of public debt management. But even as those efforts are being undertaken to stabilize the economy, um, to deal with the fundamentals of the economy, the cornerstones of the economy, shoring up public debt reserves, all of these other issues, managing the, the wage bill, all of those things. At the same time, the government did not stop making investments in critical social areas. So the investments in housing, as we have talked about today, the investments in education, the investments in health, the investments in land development, to name a few. Those investments continued through the past fiscal year and will continue in this budget to grow. We're not where we want to be, obviously. We're coming off a very challenging year, but we're moving forward. We're moving in the right direction. And has been pointed out, Madam Speaker, in this budget, in this budget, we are restoring salaries for our public officers and teachers. Restoring salaries over, over $50 million is costing the government. We make decisions in the national interest, sir. We don't make decisions just based on political expediency. That is what got us in this mess in the first place. And we're not going back down that road. We have five years to carry out our plan. At the same time, Madam Speaker, we're engaged in, in reform work as well. Tax reform, constitutional reform. I'm sure the Honorable Minister will, will talk, will tell the country about the People's Constitutional Committee. These are important initiatives that are also under, that also underpin the work of this year's budget. We still have, as I keep saying, a long way to go. The debt is still unsustainable. We still have a long way to go, but we have clear targets for where we want to, to, to reach. Um, unemployment, as I said, still too high. Poverty, of course, poverty is still at an alarming level. And everything we do has to be about reducing poverty and creating economic opportunities for our people. Cost of living, that's no secret, Madam Speaker. Uh, we see it every day. We feel it every day. Um, we understand very clearly um, that cost of living uh, is very high. Um, and as a government and as a cabinet, uh, we have addressed our minds to that issue 
in a very comprehensive way. Fuel cost is a part of that cost of living. Um, again, that is a critically important issue. So the government understands and appreciates the challenge, challenges our people are facing, Madam Speaker. We're not insensitive to that. But I have to keep making the point. We have to fix the structural foundation of the economy once and for all. The leader talked about, oh, 40 years. He kept lamenting about 40 years, 40 years, 40 years. Well, you were in government. Your party was in government, sir, for the last 12. You did nothing to fix the structural foundation of our economy and society. And this is what this government, under the leadership of John Brissenjo, is all about. Fixing the structural foundation of both the economy and the society. Once we do that, once we do that, then we can reach for the stars and get all of these other things that we have in Plan Belize accomplished for the Belizean people. And though you better rest assured that we will get them done for the Belizean people. So, I really want to appeal to the Belizean people, Madam Speaker, to give us that opportunity so that all Belizeans, all Belizeans, once we fix the structures, the foundation of the economy, will benefit now, all Belizeans will benefit now and in the future. Tough decisions have been taken. Um, as I said, tough decisions taken in the national interest, national interest, even if it means uh, a short-term uh, political cost. But we understand that if we fix these things, the benefits of that will come at a later point. Um, that is critically important uh, if you're going to be a responsible government. Now, Madam Speaker, let me talk about education for a few minutes. The The orders 12A. I move that the proceedings of the order paper may be entered upon and proceeded with at this day's sitting at any order do oppose. Honorable members, the question is that the proceedings on the order paper may be entered upon and proceeded with at this day's sitting at any hour do oppose. All those in favor, kindly say aye. Those against, kindly say no. The ayes have it. You may you may continue, member. You may continue, member. For yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this budget continues to reflect our commitment to education as a national priority. It's been a very challenging year, um, but we are on the road to fully reopening all of our schools. It's very important, Madam Speaker, it's critically important um, to get our students back into the classroom. It's not, it's not only important for their academic development, um, but also for their social um, and psychological development, equally as important. Um, so I am very, very I'm happy that we have had a united front uh, in moving forward uh, to achieving this objective. Uh, it's been very challenging, um, but we are well on our way to achieving that objective. We're well over, we're close to 90% of our schools uh, back open for face-to-face -face instruction. And certainly, uh, by the time the new school year rolls around in August, all of our schools, all of our schools at every level will be open uh, five days a week for face-to-face -face instruction. Um, I want to, of course, place on the record, Madam Speaker, my gratitude to the Ministry of Health, um, both under the leadership of both Minister Shabbat and uh, Minister Bernard, 
um, for their support. We could not have gotten this done uh, without their support, without their collaboration. And I worked closely with both of them. Uh, and my team at the Ministry of Education worked very closely with, with their team at the Ministry of Health to make sure, to ensure that we reopen schools in a safe and responsible manner. I also want to thank, Madam Speaker, all our stakeholders, because again, nothing is possible in education if we don't have buy-in from our stakeholders. And that means from our churches, who are managers of our schools, uh, the union, the Belize National Teachers Union, under the very able leadership of Senator Elena Smith, um, the BAPS, GAMAS, the ATLIB, um, parents, our bilateral partners or multilateral partners, um, you know, the UNICEF, uh, UNDP, IDB, CDB, all of these agencies, all of them were all in on the work of the Ministry of Education uh, over the past year. Uh, all of us had a shared goal of ensuring uh, that our students could return to the classroom and that we could put in place a plan uh, for recovery of any lost learning. Um, so it's been an absolute team effort. Uh, we've been united in our purpose. Uh, and I am absolutely, absolutely grateful uh, to, our, to all of the stakeholders. It's Women's Month, uh, Madam Speaker, so I want to, of course, as well, uh, big up and pay respect to our own team at the Ministry of Education um, who, who work along with me and Minister Dr. Louis Zabaré. Um, sometimes, at, you know, it, it's just Dr. Louis and I are usually the only males in the room. Um, they're all women um, for the most part. Um, and very, very absolutely brilliant, competent, energetic, focused, committed uh, women. And I want to, to pay special tribute to them uh, because they have led the work uh, that we have produced in the Ministry of Education. So thank you to all of them, our CEO, Mejia, our uh, Chief Education Officer, Chief Education Officer, Ms. Gongora, our Deputy Chiefs, um, Ms. Smith and Dr. Villanueva, uh, all of them have, have been absolutely committed to our work. Now, as we get back to school, Madam Speaker, um, of course, the great challenge we face is, is the recovery of these lo lo lost heirs, the recovery of lost learning. So that's a critically important priority for us as we move forward. And we have been doing a lot of work in that regard to prepare for that return to the classroom. We put in place um, what we call the Belize Diagnostic Assessment Test, the BDAT. And that test is administered at every level of the education system. And the whole objective, of course, is not to produce some tests that will give a, a grade for a child to take home or for public consumption but it is to be used for the purposes of the school, the purposes of the teacher and the classroom, so that they can then understand exactly where the gaps are as it relates to particular students. Uh, what is it that this particular student, after 18 months out of the classroom, um, uh, 18 months of online learning, um, what gaps exist in their learning? Um, and how can we best address those gaps? How can we fill those uh, those, those weaknesses and, and, and meet those needs. So it's a critically important issue that I want to share with the Belizean people because we provide for this in the budget this year to make sure that we are addressing this important issue of lost learning uh, through proper assessment. And then once we have assessed, of course, then you have to make use of that assessment. Um, you then say, all right, this is the data that we've gotten. How do we now apply it? to make sure uh, that we are providing our students with the best opportunities um, for recovery 
and moving forward. There are a number of other exciting initiatives, Madam Speaker, that I want to share with the Belizean people that are reflected in this year's budget. The first one is the Education Upliftment Project. And the, this was, I think the Prime Minister first unveiled this project in, I think in September on his, on Independence Day, uh, when he talked about this project for the first time. And the Deputy Prime Minister referred to it as well, uh, not by name, but he talked about the investments we're going to make in four government high schools on the south side of Belize City. Uh, Gwen Lizaraga, Maud Williams, Sadie Vernon, and Excelsior High School. And this, as the deputy rightly pointed out, is really the launch of our government's free education policy. And it's not only about providing tuition for students, Madam Speaker. It's a comprehensive approach to education. It's a comprehensive approach uh, to improving the quality of life for these young students. So it's also about addressing uniforms. Uh, it's about addressing books and e-devices, e, e um, digital devices. It's about ensuring proper transportation to school, um, making sure that young people who we went into these schools and we found that you know, some of these young people don't go to school because it's just too dangerous for them to get to school for some of them. And so we have to address that problem. And the Education Upliftment Project does exactly that. So even transportation is being provided under this project, Madam Speaker. And then, of course, we are also dealing with school feeding program. Um, and that leads us as well into another important initiative, Madam Speaker, um, and that is the National Healthy Start Feeding Program. And again, the Prime Minister referred to this in his, in his budget presentation. This is another exciting initiative, Madam Speaker. You know, for years and years and years and years, we've, we, we've talked about a school feeding program, and they've had um, you know, s s small targeted programs here and there. And I will acknowledge, of course, that all over the country, there are communities who are fully engaged in this school feeding work. Uh, we have churches who are doing it. We have private sector individuals. Um, we have businesses that have adopted schools and are supporting school program, uh, school feeding programs. We have representatives who, many representatives, who are supporting school feeding programs in schools in their constituencies. Uh, all of that is excellent, uh, and we want to continue all of that. But uh, we understand, our government understands that it was contained in our education plan Belize agenda that our country needs, in 2022, our country needs a comprehensive national healthy start feeding program. And so I am, yeah, he has no interest in learning. Um, and so I am absolutely excited about this initiative. I'm ab absolutely um, grateful to the prime minister and the foreign minister for including this as a part of the package that they took uh, to Taiwan. Uh, that will be a part of the financing, but we also, our government is also investing over two billion dollars in the National Healthy Start Feeding Program to get it started, to get it started. So our goal, our objective is that no child should go to school hungry. We understand, Madam Speaker, we understand that, you know, children who are hungry, uh, cannot learn in the same way as a child who is properly fed, who has had a good breakfast. Um, that child will not be able to pay attention in school if they have not eaten. Um, they will not have the, the strength. Um, so it's critically important for us to provide our children with a nutritious, healthy start uh, to the day. And I want to, have, have, as well, um, 
thank the special envoy. She has been a big advocate of this program. She has supported us and worked with us at the Ministry of Education every step of the way. Um, this and, and special education are two critically important areas that we are working along with her office on. Um, very, very important issue. Um, and I want to place on record our thanks to her for her strong support. Um, so that's a big project, Madam Speaker. We're not talking about, you know, they had, when I got to the Ministry of Education, they had a feeding program um, where they were spending, um, you know, I think one, almost $1.5 million on four schools. All of this run out of, out of the Collet Resource Center, Collet Division, on about four schools. Um, and of course, um, we could not continue with that. We had to develop a national program, a national program that would touch the lives of all our children across this country, uh, wherever they live. Um, so that is our commitment, um, and it starts in this year's budget, uh, Madam Speaker. Another big area, Madam Speaker, is of course the whole issue of digital devices. Um, technology, of course, is central to education. And the COVID pandemic has, has forced us all to fully appreciate that, to understand that. Um, and so, it, in a sense, it has sped up our efforts uh, to move Belize forward technologically. And certainly in the education system, um, to put in place uh, the structure, the technological structure, infrastructure that we need um, to facilitate education across our country. So that's a big issue for us as well. Digital devices, uh, Wi-Fi expansion, the in expansion of internet. You know, they, they've, they've had a program where they're providing uh, internet access to schools. Madam Speaker, that is not enough in 2022. We have to move forward now and make sure that we expand internet access into every classroom. And we have made that very clear. Um, and that starts, again, it is an initiative that we are starting here. Um, so digital devices, Wi-Fi expansion, uh, we are moving forward with that. I'm very, we have worked with the Ministry of Tourism and Diaspora. Uh, and I want to thank the minister for his efforts and his ambassador, the Ambassador for Diaspora um, Affairs, um, again, for partnering with the Ministry of Education on this important area, uh, understanding that need, um, making sure that our students, wherever they live in this country, have access to technology, have access to digital devices and adequate, reliable internet services. Um, so we've gotten an initial amount from Diaspora, we're working with many other partners. Social Investment Fund is working with us as well to provide opportunities for more digital devices. And we have our own, plan and our own plans and proposals uh, to access additional digital devices for students. So another important area, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> A few other critically important areas I want to mention very briefly are, of course, early childhood education. Um, that is the foundation of our education system, Madam Speaker. It's well documented, well researched, well established that, you know, those critical formative years of a child's life, um, that is where you have the greatest opportunity um, to shape the kind of individual that a child will be, to instill in them the proper values, the proper work ethic, um, even at that early age, creativity, stimulating their creativity. Um, so we are absolutely committed to that at the Ministry of Education. Um, early childhood education um, is, a, is a major, major priority for us at the Ministry, and we are working very hard to advance that, that issue. Um, making sure as well that we are developing um, you know, preschools all across the country, uh, where we have primary schools, we want to um, establish uh, a preschool within that primary school um, structure. 
There's no need for us to go out and build new buildings for preschools. Let's attach them. Let's attach them to existing primary schools. Um, so we are absolutely working on that, committed to that. Um, and we're moving forward with great success. Um, you know, in my previous term as Minister of Education uh, some years ago, uh, it is under a PUP government, um, under a PUP government, Madam Speaker, that for the first time we brought early childhood educators, preschool teachers. Imagine, before that, they were not being paid by the government. They were outside of the, the public service, in a sense, to say. Um, they were outside of that system. We brought them in, so now preschool teachers are paid by the government of Belize just like any other teachers. Um, so we understand the critical importance of this area, of investing in ed early childhood education. And we're going, again, this budget reflects our continued commitment to that area. Special education, again, uh, area of near and dear to my heart as well. Inclusion has to be central to our education agenda. Um, absolutely important. And we have been working with the Ministry of Human Development, um, the Disabilities Desk. We've been working together to ensure that we can identify our people, wherever they are in this country, um, who, are, um, who have these special abilities, as, as we call them. Um, and make sure that they have an opportunity uh, to get an education. They have an opportunity to lead full, productive, meaningful lives. Um, that has to be the objective of inclusion, of special education. We still have in our country, uh, regrettably, Madam Speaker, we still, I still find we go into communities, especially in our rural areas, and I have to appeal to my, my colleagues, um, those who represent rural communities, we have to make a bet to, to, to make a, a, a greater effort where we have children with special needs um, to identify them and bring them to the attention of the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Human Development so that we can support them. There is still some stigma attached um, to some of these children, uh, special needs children. Um, so, you know, we're still finding some of them being locked up at home. Uh, being denied the opportunity um, to go to school, being denied the opportunity to, 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 to come out and, 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 and make friends and, and form, you know, lasting relationships. Um, so it's a very, very, very important area. Um, you know, I, I grew up around kids from Stella Maris. Uh, you know, they were in and out of my house um, because of my, my, my father's passion for, for special education. Um, so I know, I know, you know, nearly all of them who have grown up, Donovan Renault, who's on Love FM at night, I know, you know, so, so, so many of them. Um, Victor from BCVI, who recently passed away, um, you know, Hector Hoare, who passed away a few years ago, um, Teresita Mo in Benke, um, so many of them who, who want a better life for themselves. Charlie Chiak, a great singer. Um, so we have to do better for these young people. We have to give them opportunities. And we at the Ministry of Education, working along with our partners, Ministry of Human Development, Ministry of Health, and all of our other partners, we are absolutely committed uh, to making sure that these beautiful, wonderful people with special needs have every opportunity to lead fulfilling lives. The IT vets, Madam Speaker, Again, critically important area uh, directly linked to, the, to what we're talking about in this budget. How do we grow and expand the economy? Um, one of the first things you'll hear from the private sector when you sit down and talk with them is that, you know, we need people with specific skills and training um, for specific areas. You know, I've talked to people in the private sector who say, well, listen, we still have to be getting our welders from El Salvador or from Guatemala or Mexico or Honduras, um, you know, and in so many other areas, people with specific skills, technical vocational skills, um, we still have to be looking outside of our borders. Um, so we need 
to do a much, much better job of training our people, of equipping our people with the skills they need, um, not only to, to find employment, but to create employment for themselves and for other people. The ITV, IT vet sector has been completely ignored, neglected by the UDP over the past 10 years. Um, absolute shame. It's an absolute shame. Um, you know, we, you know, we, we inherited a, a, an ITV, IT vet sector where all across the country, this, all of the IT vets combined, we had under 1,000 students, under 1,000 students, I think it was about 800 students combined. Um, so we have to do a much better job of providing opportunities for our people to get technical and vocational skills training. Um, and we, again there, we have to change the stigma uh, attached to technical and vocational education. Um, technical and vocational education, um, people can put food on the table for their, for their families. They can send their children to school. Um, these are good paying jobs. Um, and we have an opportunity uh, to work with our partners in the private sector, work with our partners in the public sector, to make sure that we have a clear strategic plan to grow and develop these technical uh, vocational centers. Um, so critically, critically important area. Again, our commitment to the IT vets uh, is reflected in this year's budget. Adult and continuing education, um, my friend, the Minister um, of State, Dr. Zabane, will talk about that some more when he speaks tomorrow, um, as well as curriculum reform, um, and that's a big area. But is adult continuing education is very important. Again, very important. You know, we have ACE institutions. We have a lot of people. The deputy talked about, you know, young people dropping out of school. Um, we have to make sure that we provide an opportunity for them to return to school, to, to get a high school diploma, um, or to get an associate's degree. Um, so adult continuing education programs are very, very important to the success of our country, to the success of our education system. We have to invest in them in a meaningful way. And we have specific projects that we're discussing uh, with our uh, bilateral and multilateral partners uh, aimed at addressing these issues in uh, dealing with ACE. So not everything is reflected in the budget, uh, but we have ongoing discussions uh, with our bilateral and multilateral partners. Uh, as I said, curriculum reform, an exciting initiative uh, that will be discussed um, by the minister tomorrow, but that's a big area as well. Um, you know, if we can change the, if we can fix the curriculum, um, we will go a long way in improving the quality of education that we provide to the young people of this country. Um, you know, we, we looked at, I mean, it was absolutely, you know, shocking in a sense that the number of outcomes that, that we expect from a primary school graduate or a high school graduate, outcomes means that means, listen, these are the things that, if, you, if you're a primary school graduate, these are the things we expect you to know. These are the learning outcomes. And I think at the primary school level, there were something like 10,000, 10,000 learning outcomes. So these are the things you expect to know. And we have to... This is not a minister's statement, Madam Speaker. This is the budget. I think the minister has done a thorough yeah. analysis and presentation. I see even some of his members point over taken, there member. are falling asleep, Madam Speaker. Point, please. Point. Um, member for Freetown, can, can we just please type into the budget? Thank you. <laughs> Mem so, members, I've ruled. I've asked the member for Freetown to pro continue with his contribution just to ensure that it's tied into the budget that's being debated. Yes, Madam Speaker. Yeah, so that's an important area, Madam Speaker. I don't think the member for Mesopotamia even understands what curriculum reform is. Um, you could listen, if you listen, if you listen a little and got off your phone, if, if, you, if you got off your phone, 
it's definitely not borrow economics. No. <laughs> if you got off your phone and stopped texting delegates, Member, if you stop texting member delegates. For, one second, one second. Um, member for yeah. Free Tongue, member for Mesopotamia, that will not be tolerated. No, 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 you should not point at me. Member. Member, you should. Stop cramping, man. Member. 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 I have listened come? to the member of Free Are you come? Sorry, 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 sorry. Member for Free Tongue, you have your seat. And you have to keep quiet. It, I recognize because of the event that's occurring not too far from today, this will occur. But members, please, indeed it is the budget for 2022-2023 that, that we are debating. Yes, on both sides there will be some leeway where yes, you go into some perhaps description or context, but it must come back to the budget. And member for Mesopotamia, leader of opposition, there's no need to point your finger toward me. There is no need to add to what I am saying, but there is every need to just respect the chair when she's trying to bring this out in order. Less crosstalk will result in less suggestions of name calling. Member for Freetown. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. So that is an important area, Madam Speaker, curriculum reform, because it, go it goes really to the heart of, of the quality of education, the content of education. Um, so again, in this year's budget, um, we are investing in that particular area of ensuring that um, we are engaged in curriculum reform in a very consultative way. Uh, traveling across the country, engaging with all of our stakeholders uh, so that we can come up with a, a final product um, that really reflects uh, what is critically important for our students to know. Um, already, I think, based on those efforts, we've been able to eliminate over a thousand um, learning outcomes which were bas basically um, useless. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done, but it's a very, very important area. They also want to mention, Madam Speaker, um, in wrapping up on education very quickly, um, of course, our National University of Belize, um, the, as I often refer to it, um, you know, it's the flagship of our education system. Um, and, you know, UB, uh, you know, unfortunately has been, um, you know, stag stagnant for quite a while. Um, I'm glad we have a, a new board of trustees in place. Um, I sense that we have, you know, a, clear, a clearer sense of, of purpose, um, uh, you know, a sense of energy um, about where we want to go with the National University of Belize, but we still have a long way to go. Um, but there are a lot of reform work is taking place there. Um, uh, you know, um, again, the National University of Belize um, has to be at the forefront of Belize's development, um, has to be engaged in our work, um, you know, in, in the work we do uh, to, to improve the lives of the Belizean people. Um, so over the past year, we've engaged in a number of uh, initiatives along with them. Um, they've worked along with, I think, both the Ministry of, of Youth, the Ministry of um, Tourism, they're working along with them, uh, using the expertise available at the National University. Uh, we are also working, of course, with them uh, through the Ministry of Education. Um, and I encourage always, as my colleagues can tell you, always encourage my colleagues um, to make use of the expertise, the pool of talent that we have at the, at the University of Belize. Um, so again, I want to place on record our government's absolute commitment to the development of the National University of Belize. Um, we finally, Madam Speaker, on that, I want to mention the, the, the Rural Education Grant Fund. You know, they talk about um, grants. Um, we introduced last year in the, in the, in the budget, um, for the first time, a Rural Education Grant Fund. 
a recognition and reflection of the government's commitment to providing educational opportunities to our rural communities. Um, so last year we invested a million dollars. This year again, the government um, has approved the, the, another million dollars to be placed in the Rural Education Grant Fund. And that's strictly, strictly for our rural communities to make sure that we are providing additional opportunities for those people who might otherwise be left outside of the education system, uh, who don't have access to, to educational opportunities. Um, it's been a remarkable success over the past year. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, uh, you know um, some Mondays when I'm in Belmopan, we get visits from, from um, families from, from deep south, from rural communities. Um, desperate to get their children educated. In some cases, it's the first child in the family who is getting an opportunity to get an education. And the entire family has traveled, you know, over a hundred and odd miles to come to Belmopan, you know. They don't know if they are seeing anybody, um, but they want an opportunity. And this, I can tell you from personal experience, this Rural Education Grant Fund has been able to positively impact the lives of hundreds and hundreds of rural families. Um, so I am so, so grateful for the support that the cabinet, the prime minister, the minister of finance have offered uh, in that regard. And generally in education, Madam Speaker, if we have had absolute full support uh, at every level of the government um, and in the cabinet uh, from our colleagues on education. And it, again, it's not where we want to be, obviously, um, the budget, um, but it is reflected that deep, strong, unwavering commitment to the education of our people is absolutely reflected in our budget. Again, it continues to command, um, you know, over 23 percent of the of the national budget. Um, so it demonstrates again our absolute commitment uh, to moving forward in education. I just, in really, in wrapping up, Madam Speaker, I really want to just say a few words about um, culture. Um, my colleague, the Minister, Dr. Louis Zabonet, will talk some more about science and technology, um, which is a new emerging area that we've been working on. Um, but we have a, you know, a renewed focus and energy, I believe, in our cultural community. Uh, Niche has been through an absolutely um, challenging period. Of course, the revenues dried up when COVID hit. Uh, Niche's source of revenues are really from tourism, where people visit the archaeological parks. Um, Niche is responsible for 14 archaeological parks, uh, seven houses of culture, um, the Museum of Belize, the Bliss Institute for Performing Arts, uh, the Golson House here in Belmopan. Um, all of those form a part of the responsibility of the National Institute for Culture and History. Um, so we're making a gradual comeback, of course, or, or revenue or financial fortunes are tied to tourism. Um, so it's a gradual comeback as the tourism industry comes back. Um, we are coming back. Um, but we do have a committed board of directors. Uh, we have a great team um, there providing support and leadership. Um, you know, just, you know, we had, you know, we've engaged with so many artists, Madam Speaker. Uh, we recently had a very successful woman in art uh, exhibit um, just last Friday um, at the Bliss, um, you know, led by the Miss Kim Vasquez, Miss Kim Vasquez and Brihida Haylock. Um, they, she was the curator for that exhibit, um, fantastic exhibit. Um, you know, giving um, our women artists uh, a platform to showcase their work. So, tremendous work. You know, and Madam Speaker, you know, again, the budget reflects our commitment to culture. But I have to say, you know, that, you know, what we found at the, at the Ministry of Culture, at Niche, is absolutely nothing short of disgraceful. Um, after a government that, uh, 
as has been you know, said over and over, so access to so much money, so mo billions and billions of dollars, um, did not invest in any of these institutions. It is our PUP government, our PUP government, our the niche having to appeal to the Prime Minister, appealing to the, to the Ministry of Finance for, for, for little, little additional funds, even in the time of COVID, um, to repair the Bliss Center for Performing Arts. Imagine that, everything the, the falling down, windows, the dance studio, the dance studio where, that they had there, the window panes were broken out for seven years, seven years. We, it is our government with little or no money, we had to come along and repair all of that. And these people will sit there and talk about what they've done for culture. Absolute nonsense. We had to fix that. The Museum of Belize, the roof was collapsing. Imagine where you have your artifacts, the roof falling down. We had to appeal to the Ministry of Finance for some small funds to repair the roof, the air conditioning. Yes, absolute. That's, a, that's the, 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 the air conditioning at the museum. Imagine that, the air conditioning not working, not working for years. These, this is where you keep national, some, some, some of your national artifacts. Um, absolute neglect and abandonment, similar to what they did to the country. It's a microcosm of what they did to the country. Just concern about, about you know, living large and, and flying here and there and, and, you know, absolutely not focused on fixing, as I started out by saying, fixing the fundamentals of this economy fixing the fundamentals of our society. So, Madam Speaker, the, um, we are engaged in a real way with our artists, not like what took place under the UDP, um, where it was all about self-promotion, um, no accountability, self-promotion. Um, you know, we are engaging with artists and musicians. Um, they did nothing meaningful, Madam Speaker, nothing meaningful to support and assist these artists, these creatives, nothing at all. It was all about self-promotion, um, and we have turned the page on that, and I look forward to absolutely exciting, exciting times um, at, in terms of the way forward with, with, with culture. Um, allow me, Madam Speaker, to close by, by really thanking the people of Freetown. Um, it's, of course, a, a great honor for me always to, um, to represent them here in the National Assembly. It's a privilege to serve on their behalf. Um, you know, as, as has been stated over and over, um, it's been a very challenging year, but despite the challenges, um, we have been able to help our people um, with land, we have been able to help our people. Uh, we have started the process. We haven't delivered any houses yet, but we have started the process of, of building some homes um, for a few people. Um, we, of course, have tried to assist with education. We have tried to assist with health care. Um, we, of course, through the generosity of the, the government, um, with the new community development fund that is in place, we assist a lot of people with food, um, food assistance. Um, you know, very important, very food and health are big, big areas of concern. Um, people who are getting sick and need support, um, and of course, food assistance. So um, we've also done some work with the help of the Ministry of Infrastructure on the infrastructure, um, particularly in the Belama area where the infrastructure has been um, you know, it's very, very challenging for, for quite a period of time. Um, and of course, we continue to work on the, the, the big area, of course, of jobs. People want employment, people want jobs. Um, that will only come really from a growing economy, a developing economy. Um, but, you know, I'm absolutely committed uh, to ensuring uh, that we continue to work very hard each and every day um, to deliver on these important commitments uh, to the people of Freetown um, and to the people of Belize. 
So, Madam Speaker, it gives me great pleasure um, to support this budget. Um, we have a lot of work to do. This is only, we've only done year one. Uh, we have a five-year term. I remind everyone, uh, Plan Belize was based on, on a five-year plan. Um, so, we will get the work done, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm absolutely sure of that. Uh, and I want to certainly place on record how honored I am uh, to serve along with all of my colleagues on this side of, of the National Assembly. Um, I've never been around so, so a group of men and women who are absolutely committed each and every day uh, to the development of this country. Get up every day, um, I think, get up every day focused on doing what is right for the Belizean people. Not always, not what is politically expedient, that is the legacy of the UDP, uh, but about doing what is right for the people of Belize. And if we, I think we understand, if we do what is right for the people of Belize, the politics will take care of itself. So thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the member for Ohio Northeast. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to make my contribution and support of the General Revenue Appropriation 2022-2023 Bill, known as our Budget 2022. Madam Speaker, um, Minister Francis mentioned that he found it maybe difficult to move and speak after Honorable Cordell. But now I myself find myself in a position where I have to come after Minister Cordell and Minister Fonseca, two great speakers. Madam Speaker, I have to mention that in the beginning, the leader of the opposition was indeed very verbose. He's not here now, but he may be listening. And I know that if his father was here on this side, he would call his 56-minute rumbling as loquacious. Let me start, Madam Speaker, in congratulating Prime Minister John Briseño and our entire team for a budget presentation equal to none, but equally important for the accomplishments by the whole of government during the year 2021, despite the COVID pandemic and its accompanying debilitating effect on our economy, our social strength and cohesiveness, and indeed our very lives. But we were tough. We were resilient, innovative, enduring, and now stand here proud of our accomplishments. And for this success story, I also take this opportunity to applaud all those dedicated public officers, our private sector, and civil society, the religious community, for their hard work and support. Madam Speaker, this month of March is very busy with celebrations. As Minister Fonseca mentioned, this week, the world celebrates World Forest Day, World Water Day, World Meteorology Day. The entire month is celebrated and dedicated to women, and rightly so. The 8th of March was celebrated as International Women's Day. And so, very important also for many countries around the world, March 21, is celebrated as International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And tomorrow, the 25th of March, the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Madam Speaker, my ministry has endeavored to look at the balance and equitability in the employment, especially in the gender sector. I am proud to say, Madam Speaker, that overall, the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change, and Disaster Risk Management employs 54% females and 46% of males. Highlighting here, Madam Speaker, that that of the fire department has a total of 94% males with only 6% females, and NEMO with 78% males, 22% females. But when we look at the account section, my FO says we are 100% female power. But we have 
Also, the registry section with 71% females, the National Biodiversity Office with 66%, climate change 80%, forestry 77%, the Met Office with 53%. And I now recall that Minister Fonseca mentioned having UB and also Galen, Madam Speaker, is very important because this has given our opportuni opportunities to our females, our women, to go to university and look after those courses and specialize in those areas which they once never did. That is a great opportunity. And for us, national, uh, natural resource management is very important for my ministry. Madam Speaker, in just over one year, under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister, John Bresenio, this administration continues to be about a fair, inclusive, and prosperous Belize. The Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change, and Disaster Risk Management, the ministry that I have had the pleasure of leading over the last 16 months, continues to lead transformational and impactful change. Change that is driving a green economic recovery, addressing poverty alleviation, social protection, and environmental protection. A ministry, Madam Speaker, with departments that have to issue licenses and permits and very often criticized and damned if you do and damned if you don't. But we have to balance the economy, the social fabric, and the environment. Madam Speaker, let me paint for you briefly the budget of the Ministry of Sustainable Development. The 21-22 fiscal year, the ministry received a budget of approximately 23 million. Of this sum, more than 72% were recurrent expenditures, all expended on salaries and emoluments, building maintenance, and other administrative matters, leaving only 28% or 6 million to do actual program work. That is, to monitor more than 100 protected areas, provide oversight to more than 1,000 active companies and development projects, supply NEMA warehouses, construct and refurbish our fire stations, and maintain fire trucks and equipment, maintain our radar and other meteorology system, which is important for every single landing at the PGIA, just to name a few. Yet, Madam Speaker, our team within the ministry, hard-working public officers, continue to deliver, innovate, and transform with the limited resources afforded. My team embraced the challenge, knowing fully well the woeful economic situation inherited from the UDP administration, who, as we know, illegally spent more than $1 billion and misspent $1,000 million of the Belizean Petroleum and Petrocarib Bonanza. My ministry now gets a 6.5% increase in our budget. The ministry's strategic accomplishments over the last fiscal year, along with its priorities and targets for the upcoming fiscal year, align with the sustainable development goals and contribute to our international commitments. We are actively working towards the strengthening of the institutional framework for the implementation of these goals, such as poverty reduction, gender equality, and women empowerment, good health and well-being, climate action, and protection of the natural environment. Our ministry is working closely with the Ministry of Economic Development to ensure that Belize's medium-term development strategy is strategic, targeted, impactful, and solution-oriented. The medium-term development strategy will put Plan Belize in purposeful and rational action. Madam Speaker, our ministry understands that the environment Climate change and disaster risk management all intersect with people. This is why the Ministry, through the Sustainable Development Unit, secured funding of 2.3 million US dollars via the Li Li Lives in Dignity Grant facility to support displaced persons in migrant settlements to become productive members of their host communities and participate in furthering their common resilience, social economic growth, and sustainable development. This will see more than six villages, including Santa Familia, Billy White, the Docrons, and Los Tambos, or approximately 6,000 persons directly benefit from investments 
in climate resilience and sustainable development. Madam Speaker, the existential threat that is climate change is becoming increasingly adverse. This is evident through the loss of land from sea level rise, flooding, ecosystem degradation and freshwater stress, tropical storms of increased intensity, and the extreme droughts that we are currently facing. As a small island developing state, we are exceedingly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Understanding this, our ministry has made pivotal advancements towards scaling up Belize's leadership in the international climate change efforts, lobbying and leveraging finance flows to support climate change mitigation and adaptation in Belize, and strengthening the institutional framework for targeted impacts. Our efforts over the last year include participation at COP26 with a young and vibrant team where Belize earned nomination for a seat on the Adaptation Fund, enabling us to defend and negotiate its position in key areas of transparency, adaptation, loss and damage, and finance. We also updated our national determined contributions that set ambitious targets for the climate change mitigation and adaptation. This includes emission reduction in the energy, transport, and forest sectors. Key projects that address shoreline erosion, reduction, and climate change adaptability of target coastal communities, the provision of electricity to target villages in rural Toledo, and enabling a framework to participate in future Red Plus carbon payment transactions and climate finance mechanisms. Madam Speaker, in the area of biodiversity, in recognizing the importance of biodiversity management, our government immediately moved to operationalize the National Biodiversity Office. Key advances by the office included the establishment of a compliance and monitoring unit to increase monitoring and protection of Belize's protected areas. During this fiscal year, 32 rangers from protected areas across the country were trained as special constables, resulting in an expanded network of enforcement officers. Going forward, the office will utilize a spatial monitoring and reporting tool for strategic enforcement interventions across the protected areas landscape. With the implementation of a national smart system, there will be sufficient real-time data to inform intelligence-based responses to address biodiversity threats and pressures. To track finance flows and to allow for more target investments with the limited funds available, NBIO developed a biodiversity investment and impact tracking tool. Additionally, the NBIO continues to leverage grant funds to support results-based budgeting, sustainable green financing, and the development of new and innovative ways of financing to aid our country in meeting its biodiversity and environmental commitments. To foster collaboration and partnerships, NBIO has strengthened the framework for biodiversity and protected areas management in Belize through the establishment of the National Protected Areas Council, a participatory and inclusive approach to protected areas management. Under the Forest Department, as you know, Madam Speaker, Belize boasts the highest forest cover in the region. Not only has this been the cornerstone of Belize's historical social economic development, but it continues to remain our greatest asset in climate change mitigation. Nature-based solution at its best. To ensure the sustainability of this vital resource, the Forest Department via its geospatial monitoring unit, a newly established measuring, reporting, and verification unit, continues to provide monitoring and reporting support for the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector through land use, land cover monitoring, forest fire data and information, and national forest cover statistics. Through the MRV unit, the ministry was, has established the framework necessary to access the carbon market for results-based payment under the Red Plus mechanism of the UNFCCC. In its commitment to enhancing the department's efficiency and effectiveness, the department, with the support of our partners, has provided much-needed infrastructure renovation 
and procured vital equipment. The forest offices in Orange Walk, Stan Creek, and Cayo districts have all been renovated, and the fire management program has been strengthened through procurement of important fire equipment, radios, and a drone for improved communication and monitoring during the fire season. In further ensuring the sustainability of the sector, the Ministry has continued to strengthen much-needed legislation, policy, and strategy development. This includes the Belize National Agroforestry Policy, which is expected to allow the country to advance in the fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goals. To complement the Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology, Rome, Belize also developed a National Landscape Restoration Strategy which provides the roadmap for Belize to take action and achieve our restoration targets, which is our local attempt to contribute to the global agenda on food and water security and climate change. Mr. Speaker, we have now also graduated to work largely at the landscape level. Going forward, to ensure the long-term sustainability of our forest resources, the department will be moving to phase out short-term forest licenses and strengthen its long-term sustainable forest management program. To allow regeneration, we will augment local hardwood supply with limited imported quantities and species. Mr. Speaker, financing of protected areas management, even in this unprecedented fiscal environment, continues to remain laser focus of this government. Green, economic recovery, and sustainable development. This will include our protected areas and the communities who directly depend on them. This year, the Protected Areas Conservation Trust, PACT, under the guidance of my ministry, awarded more than $10 million in conservation investments to partners as part of its conservation investment program focusing on biodiversity and ecosystem health, financial sustainability and revenue generation, and the development and expansion of socio-economic benefits from protected areas. And to continue to sustainably manage and also to protect critical ecosystems and biodiversity hotspots. This year, my ministry, through the PAC, leveraged close to 13 million to complement PAC funds to continue supporting the sustainable use and management of Belize's protected areas, support socio-economic development, and build resilience to climate change. In the upcoming fiscal year, PACT will continue to strengthen its conservation investment portfolio to ensure increased conservation returns on its investments. Our government, Mr. Speaker, will therefore ensure that the PACT is operating on a lean operating budget and that priority for investments is to continue to support its conservation partners. We will continue to build national capacities to leverage climate finance through entities like the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund. Our efforts will continue to move from the readiness stage of grant support to developing full-scale proposals for real, tangible investments at the protected area and community level. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry recognizes that all our national economic drivers are ecosystem and natural resource-based, and in terms of environmental management, Mr. Speaker, we have moved swiftly to strengthen the institutional and legal framework of the Department of the Environment. We have strengthened the environmental impact assessment regulations, which includes the procedures for proper evaluation of development projects in Belize as is our commitment in Plan Belize. We will also institute requirements for the use of strategic environmental assessment and other scientifically based tools to guide our decision to ensure that Belize develops sustainably. We have also made great efforts to control and prevent pollution from all possible sources. This includes the enactment of the medical waste regulations which will stop the burning of medical waste in open dump sites. In addition, a state-of-the-art autoclave valued at $1 million was installed at the Mile 3 transfer station 
to properly treat and dispose of medical waste generated in Belize City. Also looking at the phasing out of single-use plastics and styrofoam and the introduction of biodegradable substitutes is an effective way to reduce pollution from plastics and the plan to completely phase out plastics in all protected areas. The endorsement of the National Implementation Plan for Persistent Organic Pollution, and this plan will guide actions to prevent, reduce, and eliminate the use of certain harmful chemicals in Belize. Mr. Speaker, these initiatives will decrease the harmful impacts of waste on the environment, therefore improving overall air, land, and water quality to the Belizean public. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry also recognizes that integrated water resource management is essential for consumption, recreational, domestic, industrial, and commercial uses. Our agriculture sector, one of our main economic drivers, is heavily dependent on water access and availability. In this regard, my ministry, through the Department of Environment, is pleased to announce that we have several activities to strengthen our national management of essential resources. These include the preparation of a comprehensive and integrated watershed management plan, plan for the rehabilitation of the new river. Mr. Speaker, as we continue to see disasters in multiple forms across the globe, we breathed a collective sigh of relief last year as a nation when we ended the hurricane season. This respite allowed the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, to ensure it is battle ready when disaster does strike. To that end, Mr. Speaker, we have been hard at work to strengthen our emergency response machinery. Over the last year, NEMO reconstituted its national operational and district emergency committees, some, which, some of which were almost defunct. Two new national committees were formed, namely the National Maritime Coordinating and Special Needs and Disability Committee. Emergency man planning sessions were conducted with the district committees and supporting civil society and private sector organizations and community leaders. In terms of training, our NEMO team trained hundreds of public officers, community emergency teams, village committees, volunteers, school wardens, and river monitors countrywide. In strengthening our battle armor and strategy, our operations team at NEMO compiled critical operation databases and accounting systems to improve operations and improve response capacity. Furthermore, acoustic tsunami sirens were installed along the entire coastline in partnership with UNDP in local police stations, emergency operation centers and offices, and fire stations to increase our readiness and responses to disaster. Still, we remained on the ground. Our humanitarian program distributed aid to over 900 families affected by fire thunderstorms, and other events. We are not the complacent, lackadaisical government of the UDP, Mr. Speaker. This is the PUP. Everybody for win, everybody will win with the PUP. Weather and disaster response also go hand in hand at the National Meteorological Service. And to strengthen our weather forecasting, to improve response to short-term events, we have invested in significant efforts to repair our Doppler radar system by an expanded network of automatic weather stations and early warning systems in both marine and terrestrial areas. For instance, three automatic weather stations were installed with the assistance of the five seas, the EU and other partners, which will enhance our ability to issue an early warning of potentially catastrophic weather events and provide farmers with timely and accurate information to increase productivity. No longer, Mr. Speaker, should our people suffer because we failed to put out the necessary early warning and evacuation systems in place. Mr. Speaker, in regards to fire, 
It is with dismay that I say we inherited a very demoralized fire department with a demeaning work environment and inadequate working facilities and equipment. As promised, our ministry has undergone a comprehensive institutional assessment of the fire department and has commenced the revitalization and strengthening of the National Fire Service. We want to assure, Mr. Speaker, that our workers who risk their lives for ours have the adequate training to carry out these often dangerous functions with efficiency and personal safety. Over the last year, we have focused on the comprehensive renovation of six fire stations and upgrading of equipment, totaling more than half a million dollars to improve the work condition and experience of our firefighters. These renovations are a part of our revitalization project and rebranding, which will see major improvements in the quality of services delivered by the National Fire Service. As I speak, refurbishing of the Orange Walk station is nearing completion. Mr. Speaker, we are very pleased to announce the construction of new fire stations in Placencia, Independence, Punta Gorda, an additional station in Orange Walk and San Ignacio, and a new headquarters in Belize City on Chetumal Boulevard, all commencing construction in the next few weeks. Furthermore, we continue to expand our emergency medical response, which will see our ambulatory service expanded from the Twin Towns to include Benque Viejo, Belmopan, and surrounding areas. Both stations will be equipped with ambulances to support emergency response. Future work will also see the creation of a central emergency dispatch center located at the Belmopan Fire Station and an emergency radio network to include NEMO, the BDF, and the police. In conclusion, conclusion, Mr. Speaker, these are our achievements over the last year. We look forward to furthering these achievements over the next fiscal year. We will ensure that everybody wins. Mr. Speaker, this new budget for 2022-2023 is indeed a people's budget with no new major tax revenue measure, one that will continue the employment of 15,000 plus public officers, supporting national security and national sovereignty, improved functionality of the judiciary, expand the support of the education and health system, one that funds the national infrastructure system, and once for all put emphasis on infrastructure for export, one that will foster a strong participation and collaboration with the private sector. A budget, Mr. Speaker, that touches all of our lives positively, including the areas of land tenure, facilitation of trade and investments, food security, rural development, and strongly supports tourism and aviation. A people's budget, Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister said in his budget speech, and I quote, that is an instrument for equitable national development and prosperity. Mr. Speaker, I take this opportunity to thank the many government and international agencies, the private sector and civil society for their assistance, collaboration, and guidance. Mr. Speaker, please allow me also to conclude by thanking the lovely people of Cayo Northeast and my executive committee for continuing to put their trust and faith in me. Please also allow me to thank my diligent and incessant CEO, the very supportive heads of departments and units, and all the hard-working public officers of the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change, and Disaster Risk Management, who have sacrificed day in and day out to deliver results with and on behalf of the people of this great nation. Once again, Mr. Speaker, I fully support this budget. Thank you. Members, before we proceed, I want to ask those of you who are not speaking or drinking to please wear your mask. I recognize the honorable member from Belize Rural Central. Pleasant good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support this budget of the People's United Party government for 
2023. Mr. Speaker, please allow me a small indulgence <coughs> to through you send sympathy to our honorable colleague from Albert. We send you our greatest condolence member and we wish you all the best. Mr. Speaker, before I speak about our Ministry of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs, please allow me to thank the good and kind people of Belize Rural Central, for whom it is my distinct privilege to serve. I never forget the words of George Price, Mr. Speaker. It is a privilege to serve. I am proud to serve under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister John Briseño and this government. And I wish to salute all the members of this house, but particularly those on this side, the lady and gentlemen who serve this country and who do so with distinction, Mr. Speaker. We are good colleagues. Sometimes we have our differences, but we are always collegial and respectful, and that is what I believe we must continue. Mr. Speaker, the people of Belize Rural Central are benefiting from the yeoman assiduous work of our Prime Minister and this government. After 15 months, Mr. Speaker, our constituency development fund is assisting our people tremendously. Mr. Speaker, we do have to ask for a little bit of patience because we just cannot do everything all at once. But I am proud, Mr. Speaker, to stand here today to say that the management of the finances of this country have been put back on a footing that I believe that every single Belizean can be proud of. We have been providing lighting for our basketball courts, Mr. Speaker, bleachers, Road works galore, if I could put it that way. Of course, everybody will want to say, well, where is mine, Miss Dolores? Because Belize Rural Central has nine villages. But we have been doing a lot of road work, Mr. Speaker. And we do know that more is necessary, but we will continue to put our shoulder to the wheel in that regard. Mr. Speaker, I want to salute also this afternoon the Honorable Minister of Education, the member for Freetown. I am particularly proud of the work that the Ministry of Education has been doing and the excellent report that my colleague, the Minister of Education and member from Freetown has given about every aspect of that most important ministry of this government. And I want to thank him in advance for the library that we will be inaugurating in Hattieville probably later this month or maybe a little after Easter. We are very, very proud and pleased to work with the Ministry of Education in soon inaugurating the Hattieville Library, Mr. Speaker. We are also going to be doing upgrading to the Ladyville Community Center you couldn't even call Ladyville a village, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if, it, if Ladyville will be part of Greater Belize City or if we will go for a town. I see certain people in the gallery here this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and I don't know if they're smiling because they have on mask. But I would say that attention must be given and continue to be given by this government to the Ladyville and Lord's Bank area. We are not forgetting, of course, Mr. Speaker, the road works that were done in hot mix paving, the road into Lord's Bank, of which we are benefiting thousands of people, Mr. Speaker, and we are very, very pleased. Mind you, when I speak to Minister Julius, and I tell him, Mr. Minister Julius, we need Freetong Sebun, we need Gales Point, 
he says, but Belize Rural Central, they get the most. So, <laughs> but it, it's never enough, Mr. Speaker, but we continue to work. And I am very grateful for that. We have recently completed some road works at Western Paradise. We are assisting our people of Gracie Rock and Freetown Ciboon. Of course, I have mentioned Lord's Bank already. And we are going to be we are going to be conducting a major renovation of the basketball court at Mahogany Heights. I believe it was Minister Francis who assisted us to inaugurate that basketball court when we built it while we were in opposition. And now we're going to be doing a major upgrade, um, Mr. Speaker. Also, we are assisting our people of La Democracia. I pause to acknowledge the Honorable Member for Lake Independence and Minister of Lands, Natural Resources, for the great help that he is giving with the land clinics. And also, we are doing our level best, Mr. Speaker, to find house lots for our villagers, for our members in our communities. We may not be able to help everybody at the same time, but it is our greatest effort right now to try to find a house lot for Belizeans, especially those in my constituency. And of course, Mr. Speaker, never to forget the lovely people of Gales Point Manatee. We visit on a regular basis, Mr. Speaker, and recently they have been so grateful at the assurance given by Minister Cordell that there won't be any allowances of strip mining and that kind of detrimental activity in the Gales Point Manatee area which is so historic, and the people of Manatee have sent their love and appreciation to our Minister of Lands, Honorable Cordell. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I, I, I ask you if I can refer to my notes now in relation to the work of our ministry. The Ministry of Human Development, Families, and Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Mr. Speaker, is the implementing body of our, core so, of our core social services, directly supporting the families and children, the men, the women, everybody in our country. It is a huge ministry, uh, Mr. Speaker, but again, we continue to do our work the best we can in providing the social safety net and in making sure that we can give the responses where the people who need it the most are asking for those responses. We respond to the issue of poverty that was made so much worse under the UDP and we uphold the human rights of every single Belizean through the interventions of our ministry. <clears throat> I would also like to say, Mr. Speaker, that we are extremely proud to have done the repeal of the Certified Institutions Act and to now consider the youth hostel and other facilities as residential care facilities as opposed to certified institutions for the punishment, as it were, of children who through no fault of their own many times, are in exceedingly difficult circumstances. We are very proud, Mr. Speaker, that we are making sure to take a human rights and child support approach to the work of the ministry. And I'm exceedingly proud to say too, Mr. Speaker, that our special envoy for the development of families and children has given the youth hostel so much in terms of donations for the support of the children and also is doing so much to support the advocacy work. It's as UNICEF says, and I'm not stealing their phrase this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, but UNICEF says that we have to be for every child. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, 
there has been major physical renovation of the hostel, which we will soon rename. The electrical and plumbing repairs were put in. I don't even want to tell you how it was before. The fence is there, security camera, but most of all, Mr. Speaker, we are beginning to change the lives of those children so that they can be at the hostel only when absolutely necessary and for the shortest period of time. We are also very proud to have given social assistance to over 2,000 individuals in the amount of almost half a million dollars. We are continuing the Boost program and the Boost Plus, which are conditional cash, cash transfers to families who keep their children in school and also make sure that they get their vaccination and go to the health clinic and things like that. Mr. Speaker, this government is serious about the social safety net. But I want to say to the member for Mesopotamia that, of course, social safety net would never be sufficient for a country. We must put our people back to work. And that is what the government of Prime Minister John Briseño is absolutely doing. Mr. Speaker, over 6,000 food baskets have been distributed countrywide, but still the demand is high. When we visit the children's homes, Mr. Speaker, they told us, I can call some of the names of the homes, Hopewell, Liberty, King's Children Home. Those people told us that they had never seen a Minister of Human Development in 15 years. They had never, ever, ever seen a minister. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say, not to beat my chest in any way, but I am proud to say that with the support of the staff that we have, we have visited every single private and public children's home and shelter in this country, and we are doing our best to upgrade them and to help them in every way. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, never again will it be that there is no input and visits from the minister and her team or his team to make sure that where there is need for residential care, that our children will get that attention. Mr. Speaker, domestic violence continues to be a never-ending challenge. But with the Spotlight Initiative, and with all our partners, we are continuing the struggle against this most terrible scourge. I also want to say, Mr. Speaker, that we have put in place what we call gender advocates. Many of them are men. And these gender advocates, especially in the rural areas, are assisting us in bringing to light the prevention of gender-based violence and also responding where we see those cases. And I want to pause to salute them this afternoon for the great work that they are doing. There are many initiatives taking place under this ministry that had never been done before. And I want to say how proud we are of the staff that we have, our social workers, all of our people in our ministry working so very hard. Our disability desk, as was mentioned by the Honorable Minister of Education, member for Freetown, is staffed by Mr. Marshall Nunes, who is doing a fantastic job in terms of his advocacy. And he has reminded us, Mr. Speaker, at the first National Disability Conference that was held last year, under the theme we are powered by inclusion, and am I in your village? We are so very proud of that work that is continuing to happen. And I remind the Belizean people that the motto of our ministry is equality and inclusion. Mr. Speaker, we have visited all the Garifuna communities of the South, we have worked with our Maya people. We are implementing the 
consent judgment of the Caribbean Court of Justice. We have visited 18 Maya communities in the Toledo district. And we have engaged, Mr. Speaker. I have all respect for spokespeople of the MLA, the TAA. I have all respect for everybody of the South. But nobody will come and tell me or my ministry that we are to exclude anyone from the conversation of implementing the consent order of the Caribbean Court of Justice. We have resolved many outstanding complaints. We have involved all the concerned organizations. We have filed the free prior informed consultation protocol, and we will continue to take seriously our mandate for that implementation in terms of balancing competing interests, but also rolling out what the government has pledged to do. Our three bodies, Mr. Speaker, the National Council on Aging, the National Commission for Families and Children, and our National Women's Commission continue to do us very proud on the new leadership and with the guidance of our good CEO, who is with us this afternoon. And I am extremely proud to say that the Ministry of Human Development, Families, and Indigenous Peoples Affairs is a whole different ball game than what was not happening under, I don't even remember his name right now, but never mind that. We put, we put in place a very successful children's parliament in November of last year with great kudos from all around and we were so very proud of the young people. And I think I had mentioned that they were better behaved than we are sometimes here in this, in this honorable house, but never mind that. And of course, Mr. Speaker, the training and the cooperation with our partners absolutely continues. Mr. Speaker, I'm beginning to, to wrap up now, but I want to say that the advocacy for women's empowerment continues and must continue, Mr. Speaker. We were privileged last week to represent Belize at the Commission on the Status of Women 66th session at the United Nations. And I'm happy to say that Belize joined with our Caribbean partners and sister countries in putting on the record the devastating effects of climate change and how disproportionately climate change affects our women, girls, and children, especially in the rural areas. And we were proud to say that Belize is moving in the right direction in terms of the continued advocacy for the empowerment of women. We're still in Women's Month, Mr. Speaker, and I pause to salute every single woman in this country who has worked so hard, many, many of them single mothers, to raise families and children who can build a better and a stronger and a more vibrant Belize. I want to thank, I want to thank, I want to thank all our partners, whether it be civil society, but mostly I do have to pause to recognize the continued sterling work of UNICEF after 75 years, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue, as I have said, to work with them. Let me once again thank every single colleague. I see some pretty colors over this side of the house this afternoon. Nice, um, coming out in nice, nice sartorial elegance, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased about that. And last but not least, Mr. Speaker, last but not least, I want to register for the record my humble recognition and approval for the decision of this government to grant to Nora Param a posthumous pardon.
I believe, Mr. Speaker, that the Belize Advisory Council is being sworn in today. And I expect that once we speak with them, we hope that they will advise Her Excellency Dame Froila Salam to grant the prerogative of mercy to Nora Param to correct what I have styled as a historical stain and a wrong that we can correct only in the way that we can do it now. Mr. Speaker, it wasn't said by me, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice and rightness. I want to say that and to commend that to this honorable house this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. It bends towards justice. We will do justice for the Belizean people. We will do right by them. And in delivering on Plan Belize, I want to say this afternoon, and once again thanking the kind people of Belize Rural Central, I want to say this afternoon that I give my unconditional and total support to this budget of, of our finance minister, our prime minister, and minister of economic development and investment, I recall your whole name. I give my full support to this 2022-2023 budget, Mr. Speaker. I thank you. recognize the honorable member from Fort Dart. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. I rise to give my contribution to the draft estimates of revenue and expenditure fiscal year 22-23. But Mr. Speaker, if you will allow me, I'd like to respond to a few of the comments made this morning by the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, when I heard the member from Mesopotamia this morning, the quotation that came into my head was, there is no fool like an educated fool. And it seems, Mr. Speaker, that he just continues to prove himself time and time and time again to be an educated fool. Well, he got his doctorate, his honorary doctorate, so I can say educated, right, Prime Minister? And Prime Minister, I'm wondering if the other side feels that they don't have to show up in the house anymore. Why is it? that you have so many empty chairs on the other side of the house. If the leader of the opposition, if the members who are here today on the other side are serious about democracy, are serious about moving this country forward, then they will make sure that their colleagues are here in the house at every single house meeting. They were elected to represent people, Mr. Speaker. They were elected to do the work of the people, yet they are absent. They are ghosts ghost representatives. I'm wondering if the D in the UDP now stands for DOPI, because that seems that what they are now, ghost representatives. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition spoke about there has been no new investment in, you, in the judiciary. It shows that he did not read the budget estimates quite clearly that the judiciary is getting serious investment Four new judges for the Supreme Court, Mr. Speaker. Four new magistrates. Three justices of appeal. Two more to be named in June of 2022. The access to justice program being undertaken by the Attorney General has brought justice more equitable, justice more relevant, justice easier to access, Mr. Speaker. These are all investments in the judiciary to make sure that our justice system serves the Belizean people. And Mr. Speaker, when he was speaking about access to cheap financing, I wonder if he has had any conversations with his brother who runs a pawn shop, who runs a loan shark business and speak to him about lowering the interest rates to poor people because what he's doing there is criminal, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I have to say that there is no fool like an educated fool. Now, Mr. Speaker, 
I ask your indulgence to refer to my notes as I go into the budget debate this afternoon. The economic recovery undertaken by the PUP administration, working closely with our social partners and the people of Belize, is unparalleled. And in, it's unparalleled in the region and has outperformed even the most optimistic forecasts. Mr. Speaker, what has been done in just 15 short months is remarkable. The leader of the opposition spoke about not performing, that the economy was underperforming. Well, I, do I need to remind him that it wasn't only the SIB that said that the economy was performing, it was the EU, it was CARICOM, it was the IMF, it was the IDB, it was the CDB, it was the MCC. They all came here and said that Belize was performing, Mr. Speaker. Even his friends came here, Fat Joe and what the next one name, Yeezy, even they are saying that the Belizean economy is performing. The government of Belize is exhibiting the kind of fiscal responsibility and prudence that has led to our recovery. A recovery, Mr. Speaker, that the former Prime Minister Dean Barrow said could never be done. He said he grieved for Belize. He and the UDP gave up. They threw in the towel. They bankrupted the country and tried to wash their hands of the numerous fiscal sins that they committed. On November 11, 2020, the Belizean people voted for a government that would work, for a team that had a plan, Plan Belize, to remedy the mistakes of the past and chart a better future for our country. Mr. Speaker, we were elected not to grieve, but to roll up our sleeve and get the job done. Perhaps the members from the other side need to be reminded where we were in November 2020. As Prime Minister Briseño said in his opening remarks, the UDP left an economy weighed down by corruption and incompetence, withering from prolonged recession, battered by lockdowns, strangled by rocketing debts and deficits, squeezed by costly credit, beset with surging unemployment. Not surprisingly, Madam Speaker, the member from Mesopotamia has tried to distance himself from what was happening under the former UDP administration, his father's administration. He has consistently said that he was not around when these things were happening. And perhaps, perhaps there was a time in there when he was having an identity crisis, traveling to the Middle East, adopting a new name, a new look. But other than that brief self-journey, he was right there sucking from the spigot of power and turning a blind eye to the pain and suffering caused by the misdeeds, corruption, and national robbery of the former UDP administration. That is why, Mr. Speaker, like the biblical name that he has adopted, he will never see the promised land. <laughs> On Sunday, they're having their little convention. And I hope, you know, sometimes I feel sorry for you, Honorable Member from Albert. It's almost like you are in a kindergarten and you have to take care of all the kids over that side. So I feel sorry for you. And I wish you luck on Sunday because that is democracy. And democracy is what we are all about. Mr. Speaker, just last night on the news, let me go back to the leader of the opposition because he, he, he seems to feel that nobody can speak to him. You know, he almost um, was trying to pretend that he was a deputy speaker in the House this morning. He was trying to quote um, standing orders and asking members what the standing orders were. But last night on the news, just last night on the news, he named a who's who of worthless UDP characters that he has surrounded himself with. Those who were enveloped in scandal after scandal, from lands to passport, to Sanctuary Bay, to Lev Derman. The list goes on and on and on. And he has surrounded himself with these people. It is guilt by association, right, member from Liz Rural Central? Guilt by association. And no matter how hard any of the members on that side try, they can't remove that deep, dark, 
dirty red stain. Maybe that's why the leader of the opposition is traveling so much, trying to validate himself with false, sorry, I mean misstatements. You are confused, leader. This is not celebrity big brother. You are not standing behind a microphone or behind a camera. This is real work, meaningful work. You were elected to serve the residents of Mesopotamia to represent them, not misrepresent yourself. If you want to do something beneficial, I'm glad he's coming back into the chamber now. If you want to do something beneficial, Mr. Leader of the Opposition. On a point of order, What's Mr. A point Speaker, of order? the member from Fort George needs to stick to the budget, to the revenue, to the estimates, to his ministry, trying to eviscerate me with personal attacks is not a part of the debate, Mr. Speaker. I have listened to him painfully, giving him much leeway, but he just wants to talk about me. I know he's obsessed with me because okay. unlike him, I am a self-made person. I never made a sub that it did like you. Okay, okay, opposition leader. Member, please stick to the Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, please he... abstain from personal attacks. Mr. Speaker, he runs in here because they get whop. If it's too hot, get out of the member, kitchen, my member, brother. Member, if it's too hot, get member, out of the kitchen. Don't worry about me. Worry about the people in Fort George and the people of Belize that your government was elected to serve. Mr. Speaker. Please proceed and stick to the budget debate, please. Mr. Speaker, if he wants to do something beneficial on one of his other trips, then he needs to go and find and bring back Rene Montero so that Rene Montero could face the music. If you're serious about it, then you need to do that. You need to bring your father to face justice for stealing $20 million. Members, Madam Speaker. members, no, no, member, Prime Minister, member for Fort George, member for Mesopotamia. I demand that he pulls back what he said, Madam Speaker. Members, I just walked into this chamber. But I, uh, if, if, if I point out, Madam Sika, since you just stepped in, he just accused the former Prime Minister, um, right Honorable Said Musa, about stealing $20 million. That's what he said just now. Yes. So I am demanding that he takes that statement back. Is that a fact? Nobody has a demand. Speaker, the former Prime Minister was arrested and accused in a court of law for stealing $20 On Trump million. On trumped-up charges that your father did. You trumped-up charges that, that your father happen. did. And that members. is why we need to refrain members. from personal attack. Members. Leader of opposition. Leader of opposition. It's, we don't have a problem with that, you know. But when you lie, that's the problem. Mr. Leader, Leader of opposition. Ms. Bear, I am calling you to attention. Members, members, leader of opposition, I am going to have to ask you to take that back. You just pointed over here and said you're the biggest thief. Member, you just said over there that you, you said point or no point, you said it. Point or no point, do not look at the irrelevant words in my statement. You said you're the biggest thief. Member, I'm going to ask you again. I am going to ask you again. You did. Member, I'm going. Members, I'm going to suspend for a short while to consult the official recording of what was said when I walked into this room and what was said afterwards. And let me repeat myself, which I will not do again. Ms. Bearer, I have put, called you on attention, regardless of which side. We are debating the General Revenue Appropriation Bill of 2022-2023. While I appreciate context, background, 
It is not the substance of the matter before us to debate. It will be allowed, but it cannot be the extent of the debate. I will suspend honorable members for five minutes to allow me to check exactly what was said since I walked in when something was said. The house is suspended for five minutes.
members, I have reviewed the official recording of what transpired just before I walked in. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank you for reminding members who are on their feet to stick to the budget and to reminding members in general to refrain from personal attack. There are a couple of statements that were uttered that are simply unparliamentary and unacceptable. One of them I have difficulty of repeating, particularly as we are in Women's Month. So I won't repeat it in full, but it is there. Where member for leader of opposition says, I never made a soft pan daddy like you. You will agree that's unparliamentary. No, I listened to what the member from Fort George said, and it was not that. This is not going to be on back and forth. I, you are invited to view the recording. When you're out of order, you're out of order. Member for Orange Walk South. There is a reason when members are on their feet, we should refrain from cross talk. So you too were out of order by referring to the member of opposition. As you said, a criminal, when member leader of opposition, when the leader of opposition said, you need to bring, I guess this is referring to the member of Fort George, that you need to bring your father to face justice for stealing 20 million. That is out of order. Remember, it's out of order because whichever member in this house or outside of this house, any citizen that is accused have a right to a trial and that person goes to court and the decision of that court was final. You were out of order. Yes, it has. I will now ask those members to withdraw those comments. Yes, you, member for Orange Walk South. I will ask that you withdraw your comment. I'm asking you to withdraw the comment. Thank you. Please have a seat. Leader of Opposition, I'm asking you to withdraw your comment. I withdraw my comments, Madam Speaker. Before we proceed, and I believe it was member for Fort George, if I have not lost my train of thought here, that was on his feet in the debate. In my absence, the deputy speaker cautioned about personal attacks. I have cautioned before about personal attacks. I have signaled to the mace bearer that we will proceed with today's sittings and that of tomorrow, as it obviously will continue into tomorrow but that I have reminded him, that I have reminded him of standing order 44, particularly 44.3b, on parliamentary language, behavior that is not becoming, and after the efforts of asking you to withdraw those words from this house, the mace bearer has the right to escort you out for the rest of the day's sittings. It does not matter to me, members, if you sit on the government side or if you sit on the opposition side. Another word of caution. Mr. Leader of Opposition, those who have sat in that seat before you have also not adhered to the standing order where the ruling of the speaker is final. You may disagree, but it is final. So this back and forth, we're not going to entertain it. You accepted it after a lot of back and forth. I will ask for your indulgence. So let's not practice the bad habits of the past. I have now noted to the staff that the words and statements I have asked to be withdrawn, so be withdrawn, including the statement the first statement that I referenced, which was totally unparliamentary. Member for Fort George, you may proceed. 
Much obliged, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I can quote the former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Said Musa, and tell the leader of the opposition, no watch me, watch yourself. Madam Speaker, all the members on that other side of the house either sat around the table or on the periphery of the table as the country sank into financial ruin, a descent that began long before the onset of COVID. A 2018 poverty assessment done by the Statistical Institute of Belize showed that poverty had increased under the UDP to 52%. Madam Speaker, the previous administration were so ashamed that they did not want to publish this report. What a disgrace that despite billion dollar budgets and hundreds of million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars from BNE and Petro Carib, poverty levels rose by double digits. The UDP narrative has been that COVID was the cause, but 2018 was two years before COVID. Madam Speaker, all indicators reveal that Belize was in a prolonged recession under the UDP. Real GDP per capita was on a steady decline since 2015 and falling sharply in 2020 to levels not seen since 1992. The unemployment rate soared from 10.4% to 29.6%, while the underemployment rate increased from 22.7% to 38%. The fiscal deficits ballooned to historical levels with the primary deficit at 8.3% of GDP and the overall deficit at 10.8% of GDP. Debt to GDP ratio had climbed to an alarming 133%. The national debt had doubled under Barrow's reckless incompetence. Imagine, it took 27 years from 1981 to 2008 six administrations, three different prime ministers to reach a debt of $2 billion. It took Dean Barrow and Dean Barrow alone to double that debt to $4 billion. The domestic debt went from 333 million in 2008 to 1.3 billion in 2020. Before the pandemic, Barrow was borrowing $143 million per year from domestic sources. Well, let me hear the point of order. Yes, Madam, Madam Speaker, before you left and when you've come back, the member is still not talking about this budget. We're not debating the budgets from the last 13 years, Madam Speaker. Point taken. Point taken. Member for Fort George, just let's tighten it as both myself and Deputy Speaker has cautioned before. Madam Speaker, if the member from Mesopotamia would look in the budget estimates... No, there's no... Sorry. Yes, Madam Speaker, what, what, Madam Speaker, what, what, the point of order is following up on what you just said, that he's not speaking to the budget. He is speaking to the budget, but this budget... Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, the member for Fort George... Could you? The member for Fort George was about to explain, I gather, his context. Please, I'm... I, I just need to make one point, Madam Speaker, that what the Honorable Member from Full Church is doing is building... There is no... It Member from Mesopotamia, do not assume my role. You've tried to assume others, but not mine. It's an order, the number. He is speaking the point, Madam Speaker, if the Member but, from Mesopotamia... Would I just shut up for a minute? No. No, none of you... Members, I will ask the member for Fort George to proceed. Member, no, I... I to, to make my point, Madam Speaker. What is the point of order? My point of order is that the member from Fort George is building from previous budgets. This budget is a reflection of what the UDP plundered for the past 13 years. Mem with and respect, we are fixing with respect. That is what he is doing. That is the point of order. Prime Minister, what? Mesopotamia, leader of opposition, member for Mesopotamia. Prime Minister, with respect, it is not a point of order. The member for Fort George 
has already explained or was about to explain. I have listened to the point of order and I will say again, member for Mesopotamia, I have said before, there is leeway to allow background and context. If you stand up again without allowing the member to provide that background or context, much of what you also did, I will have to ask the Ms. Ms. Bearer to escort you out so that the proceedings can continue without the unnecessary interruption. Point of orders must be valid. Member for Fort George. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I was explaining, and as the Prime Minister rightly said, Prime, uh, Madam Speaker, this is context for where we are. This is context for where we had to go from, what we had to do in 2021 with the previous budget, and why this budget is the way it is. It is fair for us to debate what was happening in the economy going forward. But well, Madam Speaker, I don't want to be here all day, because it seems that the leader of the opposition wants to be here till tonight. Madam Speaker, what I was saying is that even before COVID, the previous administration was borrowing $2.7 million per week. When COVID came about, that increased to $1 million per day, $30 million a month. They were effectively printing money from the central bank and saddling this country with very expensive credit. Madam Speaker, recognizing that this was an existential crisis to Belize, Prime Minister Briseño assembled an economic team to develop a plan, a plan that would borrow, to borrow a phrase from the CDB president when he visited Belize. Just this year, the CDB president said that Belize needed to undergo rescue, recover, and reposition. We needed to rescue the Belizean economy. We need to recover the Belizean economy. And now it's time to reposition the Belizean economy for what we need to do and to deliver on Plan Belize, Madam Speaker. You know, my grandfather used to tell me you can't make coffee in a burning building. When there is a crisis, you have to deal with the crisis. You have to deal with the crisis. And you have to make sure that you take decisive action. And this decisive action needed to be done. Madam Speaker, the new PUP government was elected with an overwhelming mandate and expectations were sky high, as they should have been. Through a cumulative and collaborative and consultative effort, we had developed Plan Belize and we were excited to execute what was included in that plan. But there was a crisis, a major crisis, and we had to address that first. And we did that. We did that with a five-part economic recovery plan. Number one, reduce current expenditure. This included everything from the goods and services procured by government to the utility bills to the rentals of property. The goal was 20%. And even though this was not achieved, Madam Speaker, government has to continue to tighten its fiscal belt. Number two, revenue enhancing measures. This included a more aggressive approach to collect customs duties, GST, land tax. It included the closing of tax loopholes and even the creation of a tax recovery unit for the collection of outstanding tax arrears. Madam Speaker, the efforts worked. Total tax revenue collected was over $150 million more than what was projected. And Madam Speaker, the next step, the next step is tax reform. We must make our tax system more fair and more equitable. The objective is not to tax some people more, but to make the distribution, distribution of the tax more level. And certainly, Madam Speaker, there should be no sacred cause. Right, Deputy Prime Minister? There is no reason that Bolido should be exempt from paying the same taxes that the other games pay right now. Maybe the leader of the opposition can explain why this company was given this privileged status, because I don't know. Maybe it's because of who is behind the Bolido. Maybe that's the reason why they were given this status and exempt from paying taxes. Number three, stimulate the economy. 
prolonged lockdown, Madam Speaker, was stifling the nation and exacerbating the negative effects brought on by COVID. We had to open up, but we had to do so safely, bearing in mind that the pandemic attacked in waves. Priority number one was to secure vaccines and distribute them across the country widely and free of cost. We did this in conjunction with opening up certain sectors of the economy, the free zone and other sectors. Government embarked on a plan to A, support trade facilitation and export of agricultural products and livestock, B, enable and enhance tourism recovery. And I have to say to both the member from Orange Walk South and the member from Pickstock that they have done an excellent job in making sure that they deliver both of their ministries. We accommodated the rapid growth of the BPO sector and we secured access to cheap finance through two main programs, Madam Speaker, a central bank $50 million liquidity relief program and an IDB funded $30 million DFC facility for the productive se sector. As a result of these initiatives, the primary sector of the economy grew by 11.2%, primarily from the agriculture and livestock industries. Banana production rebounded strongly. Livestock exports to Mexico and Guatemala doubled. The services sector grew by 10.1%, primarily because of tourism. All this led to an expansion of the Belizean economy that the IMF said grew by 12.5%, Madam Speaker. Unemployment fell to 9.2%, below double digits for the first time in a very long time. COVID has changed the way we do business and given a platform to entrepreneurs. On Tuesday, as another member had said, the Honorable Gilroy Usher gave away small grants to 50 small business owners, and I was happy to be a part of that process and that ceremony. This is not only an investment in the business, but an investment in the community, an investment in the people. Madam Speaker, statistics show that there are around 10,000 small businesses registered countrywide. If each of these businesses was given an incentive to hire just one person, just one person, we would create 10,000 jobs overnight. This can be done. The fourth component of the economic recovery plan, and a major one, was debt restructuring and reduction. Of course, the main one, and probably the single greatest debt restructuring arrangement undertaken, was the retirement of the so-called super bond and the replacement with the blue bond, which reduced the public indebtedness by over $500 million. $500 million saved for this country. We remember the former Prime Minister traveling to Miami and signing an agreement of $510 million, Madam Speaker, without any kind of oversight. The Blue Bond also created a marine conservation fund signaling Belize's reserve commitment to protecting our ocean space, our heritage. In addition, the debt restructure team rescheduled the Taiwan bilateral loans to more favorable terms. Belize has gone from serial defaulter to an example of how to properly restructure and program debt. I understand, Minister Perez, that at the recent CARICOM summit, a special technical team from Barbados came to discuss the blue bond and the blue economy. They came here because they wanted to learn from Belize. On the domestic side, government paid off over 90 million in overdraft advances from the central bank and reduce the outstanding domestic debt by 59.2 million. All these measures have resulted in a debt to GDP ratio to fall to 108%, down 25% in just one year. The fifth part of the plan was the salary adjustment, Madam Speaker. And of the five parts, this was the most difficult. I want to thank all public officers, our frontliners, nurses, teachers, police, soldiers, the women and men who made the sacrifice for the common good. What was achieved on the debt restructuring side would not have been possible without their sacrifice. We had to show the IFIs that we were serious. Remember, the IMF was recommending that government terminate more than 3,000 employees and raise GST to 19%. But the Prime Minister was very clear that this would never happen. 
He was determined to come up with a homegrown solution, and a team of ministers, of which I was a part, consulted with the joint union team to get this done. I want to thank those members of the union team who took me through a crash course in, crash course in unionism, Madam Speaker. I learned quite a bit from Brother Dean, from Brother Gerald, Shane, Brother Luke, Brother Cliff, Sister Elena, everybody from that team. They were quite an interesting bunch to meet. We didn't always see eye to eye, but we certainly believe in what needed to be done for the future of this country, and we have grown to work in partnership to deliver on those initiatives. It was and continues to be an incredible learning experience, Madam Speaker, and I am grateful. One of the outcomes of the consultations was the creation of the Social Partners Advisory Committee, ESPAC. Recently, the ESPAC met to discuss the escalating fuel prices and came up with mitigating measures. The Prime Minister has informed that some meaningful suggestions and recommendations were, ma were made in writing. I look forward to the continued involvement of the ESPAC on national issues. Yes, Madam Speaker, the decision to undertake a wage adjustment was not an easy one, especially for a recently elected government and a brand new first time Minister of the Public Service. And I said time and time again that I would continue to work with the Ministry of Finance and advocate for a restoration of this adjustment. So thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Minister of Finance, that July 1st, two years ahead of schedule, the 10% will be restored. But Madam Speaker, the wage bill is still a topic that needs to be addressed. Wages, pensions, and wage-related subsidies will cost government $704 million in this budget. 62 cents out of every dollar that government collects in recurrent revenue is spent on these expenses. The pension bill for this fiscal year is $101 million, up from $38 million in 2008. This is not sustainable for an economy the size of Belize. So the discussion of pension reform must start. Of course, we also need to continue to grow the economy and have an efficient and effective revenue collection arm, the public service. As the Prime Minister said in his presentation, my administration seeks an empowered, well-informed, well-trained, and equipped public service as a partner of and an implementer for executive policies. So I turn now, Madam Speaker, to the ministry for which I have responsibility. The Ministry of the Public Service, Constitutional and Political Reform. We added religious affairs this year. First, we face the same budget cuts like every other ministry. But with the able management of a dedicated team of workers, we were able to stay within our budget and continue to strategically manage the human resources of government while ensuring effective and efficient quality service to the people of Belize. Allow me, Madam Speaker, to acknowledge the hardworking persons in the ministry, starting with CEO Zetina, who I am sure found some of my abstract ideas of how we can improve the public service a bit confusing, but who never complain and who gets the job done. I couldn't have asked for a better chief executive officer. The heads of departments include Chief Elections Officer Mr. Mai, from the HRM Department Mr. Choco and Ms. Dona, Ms. Sonia from Finance, Ms. Sandra from the Training Unit, Ms. Freya from Quality Assurance, Ms. Michelle from the JCCU, another Ms. Michelle from PR, Ms. Radisha from HRMIS, Ms. Caetano from EAP, and the Commission Secretaries and all their respective staff. Madam Speaker, as you can see, that is the majority female as the heads of departments in this ministry. Before the House meeting started this morning, Madam Speaker, I heard the very sad news that one of our administrative officers passed away very suddenly, unexpectedly, from a heart attack this morning. So I'd like to extend my condolences to the family of Ms. Jacqueline Harris, who was an administrative officer there at the Ministry of Public, Services, Public Service. Certainly our thoughts and prayers are with her family at this time. What's that? And she was a sergeant in the volunteer guard of the BDF, Madam Speaker. This is a good team, and it is a pleasure to work with them. 
And of course, I could never forget the senior secretary and the one who keeps everything moving smoothly and who keeps me on the right path every single day, who keeps me organized, Ms. Christine Hyde. Over the past year and in line with Tan Belize, the Human Resource Management Unit strategic focus was to restore the autonomy of the public service, determine and deploy adequate human resources as needed across the ministries, introduce a recruitment model on the ministry's website, revise the public service regulations and manuals. In June, the job search portal was launched, making it easier to find out about vacancies, submit applications, and supporting documents. There is even a feature to build your own resume. The job classification unit continues with its organizational development exercise. So far, they have done 17 ministries and departments. The training unit is integral to the development of the public service in creating a culture of continuous learning and growth. Over the past year, 1,260 public officers benefited from the works done by this training unit at different levels. Including, including in this training opportunities was the clerical program cohorts one, two, and three, Microsoft Office 365 Teams platform, Global Leadership Summit, Fundamentals in English, Secretarial program, workshop for admin officers and finance officers, sensitization sessions, cohort two of the public sector management bachelor's program, IOM, IOM training. Last week, I was very excited to be a part of the completion ceremony for those public officers who successfully completed a course on good governance, transparency, and ethics in partnership with Galen University and Love Foundation. It is the hope of the Ministry of Public Service, Madam Speaker, that these, train, these trainers now go into their departments, into their ministries, and train different workers on good governance. We want to make this module a requirement for promotion within the public service, Madam Speaker. Plan Belize pledges to return principles and probity to public life, and thus modernize the public service and enhance customer appreciation. Madam Speaker, I had the privilege to be a part of the extension to the work of recognition and appreciation, which honors those public officers who have served 35 years. 35 years, Madam Speaker, 420 months. It has been 16 months since the election, and my hair is already going white. Maximum respect to those officers. They are the very definition of service. Salute to them all. Madam Speaker, a major part of the portfolio is reform. I am pleased to report to this honorable house and to the Belizean people that a good governance unit has been established in the ministry. This unit will be the focal point for all governance issues, including UNCAP, which is currently in the second round of peer review. The GGU, the good governance unit, will also be the secretariat for the People's Constitutional Commission, which will take and look and have a comprehensive look at the laws of Belize, including the Constitution, as well as the way we are governed. Madam Speaker, the decolonization process is enveloping the Caribbean region. Perhaps it is time for Belize to take that next step in truly owning our independence, but it is a matter that the people of Belize must decide on. I want to thank my colleagues in the House for approving in this budget funds for the People's Constitutional Commission as well as a much-needed redistricting exercise to the amount of $3 million total. Madam Speaker, I stand today in this honorable house because of the outstanding people of the Fort George constituency, some of whom are here with us this afternoon. I want to thank the Deputy Prime Minister for land titles already issued in Fort George, the Minister of Human Development for the continued support of grocery bags, the Minister of Education for continuing to support our students in the Fort George Division. He's a Fort George boy himself, Madam Speaker, so yes, I always look out for, for Fort George. The Minister of Finance for the Community Development Fund that has been used in the area to repair homes, support small businesses, encourage sports, and refurbish recreational areas. And I'm happy to say that houses are being built as we speak. Madam Speaker, last week we had a mini fair in Fort George. It was the same day 
of the former representative, the former prime minister's birthday. So we call it Saeed's birthday minifel. But really it was sh to showcase the entrepreneurs in the era. Entrepreneurs that have been in lockdown for two years and wanted to show what they have been doing. Wanted to sell their products. And we included representation from the Pickstock Division, from Freetong, from Caribbean Shores, from Kikaka. They all came out to show what they had and to have a nice community event, Madam Speaker. And this is what we need to do, and we need to continue to co open the economy. <laughs> they were there as well. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we have a saying in Fort George. We say, blaze your fire, right? Some think I was referring to blazing something else. But no member from Caribbean Shores, we're not debating that bill just yet. The fire I'm speaking about is the potential of our women and men, the potential of our children that drive to improve themselves and give back to their community every single day. The fire is a love for social justice, Madam Speaker, for equity, for the values that make us Belizeans. Madam Speaker, Dean Barrow, when he left, he quoted a French term associated with Louis XV. Après moi de reluge. I can't speak French as good as a member of Free Tongue, Madam Speaker. But basically what he was saying was that after me, the flood, he was predicting or maybe hoping for disaster or chaos after he left. But we have proven him wrong, Madam Speaker. The Belizean people have proven him wrong. So let me try some more French for him, right? Another term. Remember for Orange uh, for Toledo West. You have to correct me if I said this wrong, right? Toujours en avant, toujours en avant. And you know what that means, Madam Speaker? Ever forward. Always forward, or as we say in the Caribbean, forward ever, backward never. With the guidance of the Almighty and the support of the people of Belize, Madam Speaker, we will continue to move forward. It is now time to take this economy going in a more progressive, a more inclusive, a more productive way. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of Fort George, I support this budget. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, thank you for the privilege to make my presentation in this honorable house today. First of all, I want to say that I support this budget for the government of Belize for the year 2022-2023. I think it is the best budget that has been presented to this house over the last 13 years. And i like to give the man at the helm, the Prime Minister, kudos for making this possible. And he has chosen a very good team to work along with him to get a recovery for this country as quickly as possible. I could recall the last Prime Minister said that I'm sorry for the person who take up the leadership of this country. And Mr. John Bissonda, I think you were brave enough to say I want to take it up and lead this country to recovery. I was a bit dismayed last year when you said that we are going to take a reduction of 10% from the public officers and the teachers and the nurses and the policemen. But now after I reflect back, I realize that it was the best thing that you could have done to get this country back and running as quickly as possible. And I have now committed to them that on July the 1st, everything will be restored back to normalcy. I know your public officers will be happy your teacher will be happy, and the restoration is here under the government of the People's United Party. Madam Speaker, I represent a very large constituency. And every time I make requests to different ministries, I want to say that we enjoy a very cordial relationship, and the response is always wonderful and respected. So as I go from ministry, ministry to ministry, first of all, I want to thank Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Colonel Hyde, to go around this country to try to provide land for the people, especially the poor class of people of this country. He was in my constituency in December, 
I think he told me that well, you give me the most work because you had so many people out here today. And I can see where that man and his team worked tirelessly for two days until midnight. And he had delivered the services to the people of my constituency. While all the results are not out yet, every week he called me and said, well, I have some stuff for you. I come and I pick them up and I deliver them to the people. So Minister and Deputy, thank you very much. Minister of Education, without your support, many students at the UB level, at the high school level, at the primary school level, will not have, will not have been in school today. But when we, when we call upon you, you make sure your budget is there to provide for us. You're not, you're not selfish, sir, because sometimes people say, I will keep it for my own constituency, but you share it around the country for all of us. So thank you very much also. Minister of Infrastructure is not here today, but I want to give him kudos because every time I call on him, he's there. My constituency has never been the way it is when it comes to road improvement, drainage, and construction. He has done his part, and again, when I ask him, he always says, right, well, I'm going to get it done for you, and he do it. And likewise, the five homes, it was only five, but I must be grateful and gratitude for whatever you was able to do with the limited resources and those five people are going to enjoy those five homes for the next, for, for, I guess, for time to come. And I really got a call that get ready for the next five as soon as the new budget is open. So I'll take your five minutes, deputy. <laughs> so I am very grateful. I also have the Ministry of Rural Development. Um, he responded positively. When there is a breakdown in any water system across this country, you make sure you are there right on time. When I call upon you for the water system in Santa Rosa, San Roman, you automatically responded, and today they have almost a brand new water system. Thank you very much. Also, Judge Stung Mamapan, when they were out of water for almost three days or four days, immediately when I ask you, your truck was there the following morning and responded, and we find a way to help them purchase their water pump. So thank you again, Minister of Rural Development. Likewise, the village of Hopkins, they were complaining that the water was not, was not getting, getting enough water and they were requesting a second well. Today, Minister, you can say there is two well now supplying the, the village of Hopkins with potable drinking water. We appreciate that. Ministry of Health, you might be a small man, but you carry a lot of weight. And anytime we ask you for the support and the assistance, you are there, sir, and the people of this country appreciate, appreciate your presence, and we hope we can continue to work together for the betterment of the entire country of Belize. Ministry of Agriculture, in the early goings, you spent tireless time with me in Stanquick West to reach out to the farmers to make sure we get the message across to them, because we realize agriculture is the backbone of this country, and you are doing a fantastic job to try to improve our agricultural system that will benefit the entire country. Um, the last but not least on my list, I think, is the Ministry of Finance when it comes to the Community Development Fund. I have 10,000 voters, and I was fortunate to get the maximum, which is 20,000. But even though it is the maximum, it's still not enough, but I'm still grateful for what we get to represent and assist the people of my constituency. I represent 26 villages. And when I recognize what was the best approach and what to do, I said well, the best thing for me is to maintain the village clean, a vegetation control, until I can find another solution. So for right now, my money is being used to, can, to maintain and clean all the villages in my constituency. And I want to make it categorically clear to the nation that that money does not go into my pocket. That money goes to DAVCO, the District Association of Village Council, and they spend it wisely and make sure they are coming for every cent to the Ministry of Finance on a monthly basis. With that said, I was given a tough portfolio as the Minister responsible for transportation. It's a very difficult ministry because when I got there, there was basically no standard. There was no system, there was total corruption. At the end of the month, there was no accountability. No money was passing to the National Treasury 
and some of them was coming in from the Ministry of Transportation, especially from the bus terminals. There was no money from the rent, from the stalls coming into the ministry. So we took over and we went to all these vendors. We asked them, where is your rent money? Nobody can answer because the money was going to somebody else's pocket, not into the government of Belize. We collected that after maybe a month in office and make sure all revenues from the stalls go into the government revenue. That again, it allows the Ministry of Transportation to increase the revenue to government by $1.2 million in one year. The bathroom fees. Do you believe that bathroom fees is insignificant? But in one or two years, bathroom fees, fee, bathroom fees total over 600000 And then it went down to 100000 Then something had to be wrong. So we took over, we make sure we manage the bathroom fees properly, and now it's up to mark, and it's contributing again to our national revenue. With all this said, our terminals might be inadequate, needs to be renovated. As we find funds, we make sure that we put back what we can do to improve the conditions of our bus terminals across this country. The buses in this country, I believe it is high time that we find a way to improve our transportation system across this country. I might, I might not be liked by many of the operators because when I took the ministry, I said that we are going to modernize the transportation industry in this country and that I will make sure happen under my watch. And so when we introduced a new bus company, there were critics, and people said, oh, we're bringing a new company. I wanted to show the operators that this is the example that I want to set. And now I'm asking all operators in this country that they must now figure and find a way how they can upgrade their system. But they are sometimes reluctant. And I gave them a deadline. I said by June 2022, I want to see an upgrade with buses across this country. I told them about two weeks ago, we have not extended the time to December 2022. And I had several meetings with them, and they understand. And I told them I will be along with them every step of the way. So two weeks ago, I approached the National Bank of this country. And I said, Mr. Manager, I am asking if there's any way possible that you as a bank can assist these operators to improve the transportation industry in this country. The bank was very receptive, and I can say today that the bus operators have passed a message to them already that the bank will come out on an MOU to see that they are going to assist the operators to make sure they can buy better buses in this country. I was able to do it for all the school buses in the south, along with myself, Mr. Mike, Mr. Oscar, Mr. Zabani. We went to the bank. And all those who have school buses were able to get a loan through National Bank to be able to provide transportation for school children in this country. Thank you very much, National Bank of Belize. The government recognizes the efforts of the Ministry of Transportation, and we request 10 additional traffic wardens across the country and five brand new vehicles. I can stand here today and say that the Ministry of Finance has approved five brand new vehicles for the Ministry of Transportation and 10 new additional um, widens across the country of Belize. We are going to enforce the law and we are going to make sure that the, the, it is very safe for people to travel across this country. We are fortunate to get some butterizers and some speed guns and we are enforcing and make sure we have a safe Easter so we are going to be out there working for the betterment of the Belizean people. Um, I was also given the responsibility of the Minister of Youth and Sports in early January. I was once the Minister of Youth and Sports back in 2007. So I'm no stranger to the Ministry of Youth and Sports. And immediately as I get in there, we start to work and start to make a change and start to make a difference. And today I can tell you 
but we are seeing a positive stride in the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Minister Bernard, you did an excellent job, and I say most of all, we invent the wheel. wheel. So I continue from what you are doing, and I take over, and they are going to jump to leaps and bounds. And so you started the, the and the job training that was accumulated, I think, about 300 young people. And I want to make sure the new brothers start again to make sure we make provision for 300 young people across this country to get the opportunity and a job training program. Also, along with the Ministry of Home Affairs, the Ministry of Youth will work with, with the at risk youths in Belize City where some 270 jobs were provided for them in Belize City. Minister of Home Affairs, that is working very good. So it's good that we continue the partnership to make sure that we work together for the betterment of the young people in this country. Over the last two months, the Ministry of Youth has partnered with Humana People to People. Humana People to People is an NGO that is based in Stan Creek and Toledo. And they were fortunate enough to get a loan of 250,000 US dollars from the US government through the CASI program. And now they, that money will be used to open hubs, digital hubs, in both Stan Creek and Toledo. What these hubs will do, they will provide for young people, and they will also be able to go online and access government online and assist people within their communities to maybe fill out their board paper farms, their passport farms, their US visa farms. So we are going to bring government into the communities in the Stan Creek and Toledo districts. Sports. Sports could be the biggest industry in this country. And that can bring a country together. And so as I took up the responsibility of sports, I recognized that there were some deficiencies because when Minister Bernard took over, we had a pandemic. So not much could have been done. But when I took over, right away there started to be a relief and the people of this country is clamoring that we need to revitalize sports in this country. I visited Salvador with the female football team, I think maybe a month and a half ago. And my return, I was very dismayed because we recognized that there has to be some problems why our young people are not excelling in sports in this country. Because in Salvador, it's a basically it's an all day job for them to do sports. And see, in Belize, we only call our national team together when there is a match coming up in six weeks' time. How can we prepare ourselves in six weeks' time to be able to go down and compete with those countries that play football? 24-7. I commit to this nation. I hope down the road when the finances of this country get better, that the Ministry of Finance will recognize that we must provide full salary for the athletes of this country for us to look good when we go to compete international. So I will, I will come to you very soon, Ministry of Finance, within a year from now, to figure out how we can make sure this is accomplished. Across the country, basically there was nothing happening in sports. We are going to revive back primary school sports as soon as the new school year begins in August to make sure every district, every village participate in primary school softball, football, volleyball, whatever. And when I was in Salvador, I was told that there is a specific school in Haiti because of the poverty, the start with the young people from the age of six. And they live there, they sleep there, they eat there, and play football. And now Haiti is one of the best, has one of the best football team in the region. They even go and beat Salvador. They go and beat Honduras. So they beat all the top teams in Central America. A small, poor nation. And likewise, Belize can do similar. So as a minister of sports and youth, I will do my best to make sure we revitalize and improve sports across this country. And May the 7th, we have already made a commitment that we are going to start basketball nationwide from Corozal to Toledo. So I'm asking my colleagues to get ready to prepare because we'll need your support along the way. 
everybody, including some federal minister, have no fear. <laughs> and at the end of the day, then we are going to have a national championship in Belicity. We want to have an impact in Belicity so that young people in Belicity recognize that it is better for us to engage in sports than any other criminal activities. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, I have the biggest constituency in this country. 10,000 voters, 26 villages. And the span is about 75 miles from the farthest point, farthest point north to the farthest point south. So it's a huge area. And I have to figure out how I can manage it and also be a, mem a minister of government. It's not an easy task. But I try my best to reach out to them as much as I possibly can. So while I'm in Belmopan, I think about my constituency because they, have, they, they are the ones who give me a job first. They let me to represent the people at the Stan Creek West constituency. So I make sure I listen to their requests, I listen to their call. Just over a month ago, five homes burnt down in the village of Red Bank. And I was wondering how can I rebuild back these five homes? Because definitely resources are not there. And I launched a local and international appeal. And I can tell you as I speak today, the five homes are being rebuilt back today and a cement structure. And I will make sure that these homes come to completion. And they are going to get better homes than what burnt down. They are getting five cement structure homes. And I always believe that all things are possible. And so I want to encourage my colleagues Together we can. And plan Belize, all of us will win. So all of us must win. So Madam Speaker, with that said, the last thing on my, I want to recollect, I launched a serious appeal to Cabinet that the budget for the Ministry of Youth and Sports is too small. <laughs> Combined, it was about $4 million. And the majority of it was used for paying employees. There was nothing for programs, absolutely nothing else. Nothing else. And the Prime Minister had long seen when we had the, the retreat after my plea, I said he's going to increase the budget for youth. And thank you very much, Minister. All right. And we are going to increase the budget for youth and sports to two by two million dollars. We are going to utilize that $2 million wisely. As I speak, I, when I sleep, when I, when I, when I turn in my bed, I have to start to think then because I can't think during the course of the day. And I say, you know what? I need to farm. <laughs> so then my colleague said, are they, are they texting at 3 in the morning? <laughs> yeah. But I have come up now with an idea where we are getting people of intellects across this country to start to plan and organize together for youth and sports. Today we have about 40 participants and we are going to find money wherever it is to assist with the Ministry of Youth and Sports. So all those who accept to participate, I want to thank you and I know every day there is a conversation between everybody, everybody is eager, everybody is interested. So with that said, I want to hold a symposium after April 15th to bring the entire team together along with the business people and figure out how together we can make an explosion for youth and sports in this country. So Madam Speaker, thank you very much. And I appreciate this moment. And I want to say again, I support the budget of 2022-2023. Thank you very much. I, I recognize the member for Orange Walk East. Thank you. Madam Speaker, and I would ask my colleagues <laughs> to indulge me for as I speak on this budget. I've been asked to, to limit the time, but I will, I, I always say, you know, we have to take the opportunity when it comes. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I rise in support of the budget for the fiscal year 2022-2023. And ask your indulgence to allow me to refer to my notes. But before I start, Madam Speaker, I, 
I had a prepared speech and I don't want to throw no more blows to a wounded member of Mesopotamia. But I would ask you that you make an important clarification for this honorable house. You see, Madam Speaker, the member for Mesopotamia has on multiple occasions gone public in the U.S. to state that he is the leader of the House of Representatives. One time could be excused as a slip of the tongue, Madam Speaker, but he has said this over and over again in different forums. God knows what he says in private. So I am just asking for the public record that at some point, Madam Speaker, you clarify for the member his position in this house, just so that we are all on the same page. Madam Speaker, please allow me to say what an absolute pleasure it was to listen to a budget presentation that contained no fancy words, no rhetorical flourishes, and no quotes from obscure philosophers dead for centuries. For so many years, Madam Speaker, members, of this, uh, members in this house sat here listening to how amazing the UDP was in budget presentation after budget presentation. And then when they walk out of this house into the reality of a country that, is, that was being systematically brought to the brink of collapse by an uncaring, incompetent, delusional UDP government. This budget, in contrast, is real and reveals the clear difference between leadership and governance today, as opposed to the travesty which came before when those who stood on the other side behaved like wild pigs crumbling in the mud for treats, eating and eating and eating while the rest of the country slowly starved. Madam Speaker, I will spend no more time on my colleagues on the other side of this honorable house. It is not for us to judge them. The people have already done that and will continue to do that. I will simply, however, point out to all of them on that side, no one, notice none of them are here, that they had all the time to get it right and they didn't. Again, Madam Speaker, the difference is clear. Their leader believes that hanging out with Fat Joe makes him a big man. On this side, we have been busy meeting with the CDB, the IMF, the IDB, the EU, and other international partners who can really benefit our country and people. While he sits on talk shows in the US telling people he is the leader of this honorable house, we host regional leaders, including the Secretary General of the United Nations at CARICOM and SICA summits, where we can chart a way forward for Belize. Like I said, Madam Speaker, there is glitter on that side and substance on this side. A clear difference. As I turn to the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Madam Speaker, 2021 was another challenging year for the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The COVID pandemic has challenged the health systems around the world to respond to all health and safety needs. Many of those systems have failed in Belize, however, because of the selflessness and sacrifice of those on the front lines, as well as a ministry which was prepared, ours did not fail. This is a part of us ensuring Plan Belize is at work, Madam Speaker. This government, and I want to take my hats off to my colleague on my left, the, the former minister responsible for this ministry, ensure that additional COVID-19 testing sites were established in Belize in each municipality, making testing available and free of cost for every Belizean. In addition, 
the ministry, through its partnership and collaboration, was able to secure COVID-19 vaccines for the entire adult population and for children 12 years and older. We are delivering on Plan Belize, Madam Speaker. Today, two-thirds of the population 12 years and older has gotten a first dose, or some 50% have now gotten a full second dose. Again, Madam Speaker, for this success, we give recognition to the, to the dedication of the healthcare workers and to the reception to the vaccine by the Belizean people. Madam Speaker, the ministry had to recruit additional nurses, doctors, and data entry personnel to implement the vaccination program. In parallel, increased investments were also placed in health education and communication to ensure that the population had appropriate information regarding the COVID-19 vaccine, thus reducing vaccine hesitancy, misinformation, and disinformation. Mobile vaccine sites were also set up in rural communities, making vaccines accessible to all persons among the target group. Additionally, improvements were made to the COVID-19 treatment units in all the regional hospitals at the KHMH, with the procurement of over $2.6 million in medical equipment, not including supplies, PPEs, and medication to support treatment and enhance protection for the healthcare workers. All these investments, Madam Speaker, supported the ability of the country to reduce transmission and mortality, which allowed for the restoration of the economic sector. Madam Speaker, even though we were ravaged by the pandemic, other health services and programs were still functioning. Belize reported zero malaria cases for the third year consecutively and is on its path to certification of having eliminated malaria by 2022. There was also infrastructure development, including the retrofitting of the Bullet Tree Health Center, nurses' quarters at the Ladyville Health Center, Hattieville Health Clinic, and ongoing upgrades to the Pueblo Viejo and Santa Teresa Health Centers and the pediatric wing at the Northern Regional Hospital. This shows that this government, Madam Speaker, is serious about strengthening the health system and making it possible for every Belizean to have access to health care, removing barriers to access. Madam Speaker, this new budget presented for the fiscal year 2022-2023 will bring about many more developments to healthcare in Belize. The expansion of the national health insurance to the Rinjua district, increases and adjustments in members for clinics in the south side of Belize, will make primary care accessible and affordable to more persons. Enhancing primary care programs like NHI will help in the prevention and control of NCDs and promote healthier lifestyles enhancing the wellness of the population. Madam Speaker, this government is delivering on Plan Belize. A population's health is its wealth, Madam Speaker. And without a productive society, national development will be adversely affected. We have ensured that essential medicines, equipment, and technologies will be available at all hospitals. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has engaged with multiple suppliers to ensure that the ministry receives the best possible prices and quality of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. Madam Speaker, we recognize that our human resources are the most valuable asset of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. This new budget supports the creation of 74 new nursing posts, something that was never done in previous years. 
These new nurses will assist with the current shortages that we are facing. But this is only the beginning, Madam Speaker. This government issued 50 nursing scholarships last year and will continue to do so annually. Training for specialization in nursing in the areas of midwifery and public health nursing is planned for this year. Additionally, temporary medical surveillance and support staff were hired through different projects to support the team in the pandemic response. Earlier, Madam Speaker, I touched on infrastructure development in health. And Madam Speaker, I am proud to say that what was not achieved by the previous administration in 13 years, even without COVID, has already been surpassed by this administration in just over a single year. We continue to deliver on planned beliefs. I the leader of the opposition in his presentation stood up here in this house and said that the San Pedro Hospital was a UDP idea. Que descarado. That's being bare-faced. Yes. I just want to say to the member of Mesopotamia, he has been, he's being very unfaithful to the truth. In 13 years, the UDP was not able to build a morgue in San Pedro, Madam Speaker. We will build an entire hospital in San Pedro with construction commencing this fiscal year. With the assistance from our partners, we are constructing a health center in Kikorka and a polyclinic here in the city of Belmopan. Ground has already been broken for a polyclinic in Placencia with funding support from the Belize Tourism Board and the government of Belize. In addition, the retrofitting to safe and smart hospitals, standards of all the regional and community hospital with the support of the UK government and the European Union has been completed in some areas and works have already commenced in some of the other areas. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Health and Wellness has developed its plans to also retrofit health centers and health posts across this country over the next three years, investing in rural communities and primary health care services. Again, Madam Speaker, I reiterate, we are delivering on Plan Belize. This government is committed to engaging its stakeholders to bring changes that will have great impacts on the health and well-being of the Belizean people. We are committed to achieving the health goals set out in Plan Belize, Madam Speaker, and in just over a year in office, we are delivering on Plan Belize. Let me point out again, Madam Speaker, the difference between that side and this side. 13 years. 13 long years and our health system suffered. You will hear them have a lot to say in these, next, in these two days. We already heard from the leader of the opposition. He loves to hear himself speak, but the truth speaks for itself. In one year, the work this administration and the Ministry of Health and Wellness have done in health and in every single other area, far exceeds what they did in 13 years. And no Fat Joe or Didi or Kanye can change the facts, member of Mesopotamia. Though he has been known to ignore facts completely many times. Madam Speaker, now turning to Orinjoa East, an area I am proud to represent. We all know the hardship we faced coming into office. And truthfully, the COVID pandemic was bad, but not as bad as the UDP pandemic, which left this country as close to bankrupt as it has never been before. Industries failed, 
people neglected, infrastructure in terrible condition, the economy in shambles. Thankfully, Madam Speaker, the people of this country had the vaccine for the UDP and got rid of that virus in November of 2020. Just yesterday, Madam Speaker, I was in Santa Marta for the opening of a brand new, fully equipped school building for the Santa Marta Government School. That building, Madam Speaker, will serve as the preschool for the community. Since the nearest other school is in Carmelita, 18 miles away. This is development which matters, Madam Speaker. And I want to give thanks to the Minister of Education, my colleague from Freetown, for pushing this very critical project to completion. And I also want to say to you, Minister of Education, my colleague from Freetown, I want to thank the Ministry for choosing Santa Marta Government School to be part of the Health, Health is Starting, uh, Start Feeding program that will commence this year in September. Madam Speaker, I believe that the twin pillars which drive every community are education and health. And so it is with great pride that I inform the residents of Santa Marta that I have also secured the funding in collaboration with the BTB for the construction of a new health clinic in Santa Marta Village with accommodation for a resident nurse. That clinic will not only serve the residents of Santa Marta, but also the Newland community and other communities between Santa Marta and Mascal. With the assistance of our colleague from Cayo South, we have been able to work out a comprehensive plan for the upgrading of village roads. Madam Speaker, I would like to point out here that the neglect of the previous administration and the previous representative, I don't forget his name, is a crying shame. Many of those village roads had never been touched. And our residents were forced to live in mud when it rains and dust during the dry. We are working hard to ensure that this situation in fix, uh, is fixed. And I want to thank our Honorable Minister of Housing and Infrastructure Development, for the great work that he has been doing there in his ministry. Additionally, Madam Speaker, I have worked closely with the Orange Walk Town Council to conduct major street upgrading in those areas of town which are in Orange Walk East. That successful collaboration will continue, Madam Speaker, because my colleague, the mayor of Orange Walk Town, believes in hard work and service and I hold those same beliefs. We are here to work for the people, not to build up our own coffers like that UDP representative who I won't mention. But in addition to the street works that has been done, Madam Speaker, we are replacing culverts in Orange Walk East across the, the constituency. Many culverts which were not serviced or replaced under the previous administration. We will get the job done for the residents of our rural communities so that they too can enjoy a proper road network. This, Madam Speaker, is once again us as a government delivering on Plan Believe. Because sugarcane also is the lifeblood of the North, and I too represent cane farmers, we have also worked closely with the Ministry of Infrastructure Development and Housing to upgrade sugar roads so our farmers can get their cane to the mill. And we will continue to do so. And in sticking with infrastructure, Madam Speaker, there will soon be a complete upgrading of the road passing through Carmelita. And that upgrading will include six new bus stops placed in strategic location in Santa Marta. We have been successful in getting reliable internet for that community, along with the current upgrading of the Green Park. We have insta installed lighting for parks in Chan Pine Ridge, in San Jose Nuevo Palmar, in Santa Marta, and Tower Hill, 
and we are currently building an exercise and walk path at the Nature Park in Orange Walk Town. We have secured lighting for the park in Carmelita and floodlights for the village football field. Madam Speaker, we have through the Ministry of Infrastructure Development and Housing handed over two homes to needy Belizeans, one in Santa Marta and one in Chan Pine Ridge. And we are in the final completion stage of the renovation of the home of an elderly woman residing in Orange Walk Town. And in fact, Madam Speaker, we are going to see the commencement of the other two homes being built starting next week. This is delivering on Plan Belize. We will soon inaugurate the new school building for the Louisiana Government School. And very soon, we will see the completion of five digital labs in Orange Walk East, in Tower Hill, in Carmelita, in Santa Marta, in San Jose Palmar, and Chan Pine Ridge. We continue to implement education, health, sports, and social assistance programs throughout the East. Madam Speaker, because the truth is that our people have gone through a very tough time during the UDP pandemic, we are hardworking and we are resilient. But imagine that for 13 years, our people got no help and no opportunities to uplift their own lives. It was a tragedy and a travesty under the UDP. I give thanks to my people of Orange Walk East for their confidence, their patience, and their support. Madam Speaker, I give thanks for the leadership of the Honorable Dr. John Brisenio. <laughs> this is leadership which consults and listens. Leadership which cares and has compassion. Leadership which is not afraid to make bold, visionary decisions because we know that we do it for the good of the people. I end today by saying this, Madam Speaker, may we never end up like those pariahs on the other side who abused the people and violated every single code of decency after being given the trust of the people. You see them there, Madam Speaker, they will stand up and amuse oneself but they know what they did to the Belizean people. They will act all righteous and pious, and like they knew everything. Madam Speaker, they should be ashamed to show their faces in this honorable house, much less open their mouths. What this administration, this Bresenio administration, has done in just over a year is a testament to good governance. I will always be a force for good governance, Madam Speaker, because that is how I was raised, and that is what I believe in. I am a no-nonsense servant of the people. Like my colleagues on this side, I knew what we would find when we got into office. But I also knew that we had what it takes, the vision and the will to overcome. I knew that with the support of our people, we would turn this economy are wrong, and we have done that. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of Orange Walk East, I support this budget because we are delivering on, our, on Plan Belize for our people. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for Belize Rural North. Madam Speaker, I rise today to lend my full support on behalf of the people of Belize Rural North to this draft estimate of revenue and expenditure appropriation, Bill 2022-2023. With your indulgence, Madam Speaker, I would like to refer to my prepared notes. Madam Speaker, my first year under a full budget by our PUP administration, and as the era representative for Belize Rural North, was to say the least challenging owing to the fact that we are still focused 
on reducing our debt to GDP ratio using our full innovation, creativity, and shared sacrifice. Under the leadership of our Prime Minister, the member for Orange Walk Central, and with the continued support, resiliency, and hard work of our people, I can proudly report that through all the difficulties and challenges, we had a fruitful and productive year. Madam Speaker, it is common knowledge, but one that bears repeating over and over, lest we forget, this PUP government of which I'm proudly a part, thanks to the voters and the people of Belize Royal North, inherited a dismal, or I should say, abysmal economy and country from the corrupt UDP administration led by Dean Barrow and the member for Colette and supported by the likes of Edmond Castro, Jan Saldiva, Gaspar Vega, and Rene Montero, to name a few. This fact widely known, my team and I decided we would make much of the little that would become available in times of austerity. We decided we would lay the foundation following exactly what Moses did in Egypt by storing up during the seven years of plenty for the seven years of famine. Our situation, Madam Speaker, effectively is the reverse. These are our winter years, our challenging years, our pandemic years, and we must, in effect, sow seeds now to lay the, the proper foundation for future growth, real progress, and development in B BRN. Our ultimate goal for our division is full employment, land ownership for our youths, and first-time landowners and thriving entrepreneurs. Madam Speaker, allow me to share with this honorable house, this country, and more specifically, the good people of BRN, what we have accomplished since I last stood before this house a little over a year ago. As a team, my executive committee, my village committees, and I were able to secure and spread over 400 loads of hardcore materials on roads all over Belize Rural North. With Crooked Tree and the River Valley area receiving most of that material. In this new budget, Madam Speaker, I want to assure the people of Mascal, St. Anne's, Corosalito, Bomba, and Santana that we will upgrade that portion of the old Northern Highway affected by the aforementioned villages. 60 loads of hardcore materials have already, already been allo allocated to upgrade that piece of road between Lucky Strike and Mascal, and work is to begin promptly. I wish to express my personal thanks to our people in these villages for their patience as they daily traverse this piece of the old Northern Highway. Let me also thank the Honorable Minister from Cayo South, CEO Victor Espat, and Minister and the Ministry of Infrastructure of the tremendous support they have constantly given to BRN. I must also make mention of Mr. Larry Flowers and Mr. Peter Tycro, whose kindness and support cannot go unmentioned. It is true indeed that strength grows when we dare, unity grows when we pair, love grows when we share, and relation grows when we care. 
Let us seek to live in peace and not in pieces. BRN, much more can and will be accomplished as we work together. Madam Speaker, thanks to the member of Belize Rural Central, the member from Corozal Bay, CEO Tanya Santos, and the Ministry of Human Development. And our thanks also to our Prime Minister, who continues to make bold, aggressive financial moves. And we're we, we were able to distribute well over 200,000 in, in food assistance this year. This new budget has some six million allocated to continue the program of distributing food assistance to our most vulnerable citizens. And, and me and my team wish on this occasion to assure our people of BRN that we will continue to serve you to deliver these food supplies directly to your doors. BRN must also thank the member from Freetown and the Ministry of Education for the over 60,000 issued for education assistance. In December, Madam Speaker, of last year, my team and I distributed over 1,200 hams, 200 turkeys, 100 food hampers, and well over 3,000 toys. Thank you, Prime Minister, Honorable Chris Kowi, and CEO Narja Garcia. Utilizing a portion of our Community Development Fund, we invested some 35,000 in rehabilitating the Mascal Basketball Court. We will also repair and lighting, the lighting of both the football field and the basketball court in Moscow. Under this new budget, Madam Speaker, the work continues as we have the Biscayne Basketball Court to complete that was started by, started by and donated from the Belize Water Services, made to Edmond Castro and the current chairman of, the, of Biscayne Village. But suffice to say, the funds, though adequate to complete the project, were depleted and the work was not completed. Under this new budget, with an allocation of six million for continued developmental works throughout our 31 constituencies, my team and I will complete this basketball court and continue to focus and re renovating and remodeling the various sporting facilities throughout the division, along with other much needed infrastructure and developmental works. We will continue the process of consultation with our village teams and will prioritize the works as we move forward. Madam Speaker, we recently made a sizable donation to the Belize Cricket Association. As many may know, cricket is synonymous with Belize Rural North. Supporting this sport, in essence, is supporting our way of life. We will, Madam Speaker, continue to support all sporting disciplines in our area. And I am proud to announce that the Leal Cup which is a hallmark of BRN, will be back bigger and better than before. Madam Speaker, we were able, with the direct assistance of the Ministry of Finance and Belize Electricity Limited, to install 80 additional streetlights throughout the division. For our village communities, this is a big deal, and I am happy to report that we will continue to work to adequately light up all the communities, not only for safety and comfort of our residents, but as a definite deterrent to crime. My heart goes out to those in my, in my constituency who fell victim to crime this past year. I sadly recall the murders in Sand Hill and Boral Boom, 
and continue to express our condolences to the families of those who lost loved ones to these senseless and brutal murders. Crime and violence has no place in any of our villages, and we will work hand in hand with the authorities to stamp out crime whenever it shows its ugly head. Madam Speaker, my team and I, in yet another initiative that was started years ago and aimed to continue for years to come, assisted over 100 families with supplies for home repairs and, in some unique cases, provided physical labor to assist in repairing their homes. Special thanks goes out to Plan Belize and the Ministry of Housing for the five starter homes we issued to five needy single mothers and their families in this budget year. With more to come in this new budget, where some $5 million has been allocated, BRN has the land, Minister for Cayo South. Let's build the homes. We are ready. Thanks for your support, my brother. Thanks to the vision of the ministry Sorry, the member for Toledo West, who is responsible for re rural transformation, his CEO, Valentino Schall, and the drilling team led by our brother, Charles Galvez. Four water wells were drilled and deemed fu fully functional in the villages of Rayburn Ridge, Boston, Mascal, and Barrel Boom. Madam Speaker, our minister had assured us in BRN that more wells will be drilled to assist and support not only our villagers, but more specifically our farmers and by extension, our productive sector. This government is about service to the people and serve them we will. Madam Speaker, with the help of the Almighty, we assisted various schools and with cleaning their grounds and painting their, their buildings in preparation for the long anticipated opening of schools. While the other side and many of their supporters were predicting the skies would fall with the reopening, this side of the house made a bold violent moves, made the bold violent moves. It started with the free zone, tourism, and then the schools. Time has vindicated these decisions, and time has demonstrated that the timing was right. Our team continued to work. Recently, we constructed two bus sheds and two bleachers. Madam Speaker, I support this budget because it is in line with Plan Belize. In this 2022-2023 budget, BRN will see increased investment from this PUP administration in the agriculture sector. The farmers from the 24 villages and communities that makes up BRM, from Rancho Dolores to Bomba, from Sand Hill to Rayburn Ridge, and villages in between. BRN in years gone by was one of the main breadbasket of Belize. Under this administration and my leadership, in BRN, we will see us returning to being a productive people we are known to be. This budget year, Plan Belize will identify and distribute some 8,000 lots to first-time land own owners. I can assure at least 400 of our young people and first-time land owners that they will receive their land titles this year. And if we can do more, we most definitely will. For those who have been waiting for years to get their land titles in their hands, we will continue to work in close collaboration with the member from Lake Independence and Brother Paul Thompson and the hard-working public officers of the Ministry of Natural Resources to ensure that the land documents that you get your land documents you so rightly deserve. Madam Speaker, Plan Belize 
is also about the expansion of NHI and the national improvement of healthcare delivery in Belize. Belize Rural North recently witnessed the inauguration of the new health clinic in Crooked Tree. We have a functional clinic in Moscow, but it is the vision of my executive committee and myself to lobby to ensure that Sun Hill Village gets a fully functional polyclinic to meet the need of improved health care in BRN. We will continue the conversation to make this vision a reality. Plan Belize will deliver on this promise, Madam Speaker. With the return of the Laruta La Maya canoe race, it was a joy to see your people from all over this country, but more so from St. Paul's, Willows Bank, Bermuda Landing, Scotland Half Moon, and specifically from Doublehead Cabbage and Barrel Boom, two of our villages representing two of the three stops and overnight campouts of the paddlers and their support team in this four-day four canoe race. BRN salutes all the paddlers, organizers, support teams, and fans, and congratulates the winners of the 2022 race. It was a breath of fresh air to welcome this race back to BRN. Again, Madam Speaker, another bold move by this PUP administration. Madam Speaker, apart from what ha has already been said, let me clearly outline a few more initiatives we aim to accomplish in BRN under this budget and plan Belize. Rancho Dolores will see its cricket pitch upgraded, bathrooms and bleachers built for the cricket pitch. We will establish a corporation, a cooperative in Rockstone Pan and Lucky Strike that focuses not only on local production and sales of local art, but also to work with Bell Trade and Ministry of Foreign Trade to lobby for international markets to contribute to more foreign exchange earnings. We will continue to drive BRN as a tourist product. We will continue to lobby with Niche and the BTB to ensure that BRN gets its fair share of the tourism market so lucrative in this area. Madam Speaker, this year under my leadership, we will begin the consultation process with the Ministry of Infrastructure and Housing into the possibility of establishing a link road between Willows Bank Village and the George Price Highway. This road will not only shorten the travel time for the villagers from Isabella Bank, Lemonal, Bermuda Landing, Willows Bank, St. Paul's Bank, and Rancho Dolores, who needs to travel to Belmopan and beyond, but it will open up this part of the River Valley to new investments and opportunities. Let me go on record today, Madam Speaker, to say that this PUP administration is about innovation and real growth. Let me close, Madam Speaker, by expressing my heartfelt thanks to my fellow colleagues my family, my constituents, and all those who in any way prayed or sent a word of encouragement and get well wishes to me as I battled the dreaded COVID-19 virus. I wish to publicly thank the doctors and nurses at Carl Hushna Memorial Hospital and Belize Healthcare Partners Limited for their care and life-saving medical expertise. My battle was real. Many days, as I struggled to regain my health, I thought about my family, my people in BRN that elected me to represent them. I knew I had to fight, and fight I did. Thank God for pulling me through. Let me use this opportunity to, to again express condolences to the families of the 654 Belizeans 
or former member from Corozal Bay being one of them who had succumbed to this virus since it, since it was detected in Belize over two years ago. Madam Speaker, I have reached out to many who have tested positive in my constituency. In most cases, hand-delivered food baskets to their homes directly. My experience had taught me that we cannot let our guards down. We are still very much in a pandemic and we must do all to protect ourselves and our families. If you are still one of those who are unvaccinated, I encourage you to do so. Again, thanks to all for, for your prayers and well wishes. Madam Speaker, I am fully committed to our people in BRN and thank them for their continued support under the leadership of our Prime Minister and guided by Plan Belize, much will be accomplished for the betterment of BRN and the people who call it home. Madam Speaker, I thank you and I fully, fully support this budget. I, I recognize the member for Corazal South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon, Belize. Good afternoon, Corozal Southwest. With your indulgence, Madam Speaker, I rise to support this revenue expenditure 2022-2023. I will mention some of the good reasons why I support this budget. There's $1 million for survey and mapping of the 8,000 new lots to be distributed this year, and further $12 million land development and land acquisition program. Madam Speaker, for the past 13 years in the Corozal Southwest, haven't received no village expansion, no house lots for the most needed family. With this government, with this plan, Belize, we will assure that with the land development and land acquisition program, that my people will get new house lots, and, new, and not only new house lots, houses, new houses for our people of Corozal Southwest. Furthermore, we are going to get maintenance of village roads and feeder roads for all our farmers in, the, in general. We have some sugar roads for the past 13 years haven't been touched. Thanks to the Minister of Cayo West and the CEO, Victor Espant, with that close communication that we, the People's United Party and ministers we have, we already did many miles, but we still have more to do. Yes, Cayo South, sorry. Another good news for Corozal Southwest. Just remember that when I won in 2012, the only two constituencies that got the NHI were Corozal Bay and Corozal North. Now, I am proud to say that we, the PUP, Plan Belize government, got the entire Corozal in the program of NHI in San Narciso Polyclinic in full swing with the NHI program. Corozal East, we're going to inaugurate that program on Saturday in Chunosh Village. Since 2012, I beg for a water system in, in Libertad and Concepcion. Finally, again, PUP government and plan Belize with CIF, CDB, is invested $1.37 million in the system of Libertad and Concepcion. I give thanks to the PM and Minister of Home Affairs and New Growth Industries for the new police station in San Narciso. I have been begging this to the UDP since 2012, now 
this time will be a reality that we're going to have a new police station in San Narciso in the near future in Libertad, thanks to the plan Belize. Madam Speaker, the global gro growth momentum faced stiff headwinds along the way. The economy worldwide were hit hard by the COVID-19 variant pandemic. I give thanks to the Belizean people for supporting us on this 11th November 2020. We know that because of the pandemic, some of us lost our loved ones. This administration led our Prime Minister, reached to all members from Corozal to Toledo with the basket, food basket. In my ministry, we have been working tireless and give thanks to our staff and the CEO and my colleague from Toledo West. With less resources, we did many projects. And why I said less resources? Because of the mismanagement of the past administration. We still managed to assist in the rural communities with some wells for farmers cattle farmers, and some wells are airlifted. As we speak right now, we are having a big problem in Sardinia, and the crew is there working for the people. I want to give thanks to my constituency for the patience and support. I know we need more jobs. I know we need more infrastructure. But be patient. We are going to do our best to serve you all. I want to take this opportunity to give thanks to all teachers and public officers for helping this economy to grow up. I knew and I know that it's not easy, but we are passing that nightmare. And on the 1st of July 2022, you are all going to get back the 10%. Thanks to the Plan Belize, thanks to the Prime Minister. If you allow me, Madam Speaker, some words in Spanish. Quiero dar gracias a mi, a mi gente de Corozal Southwest por el apoyo. Sabemos. Uh, translated for the, for the um, purpose of the transcribing. Yes, I, I agree. I just want to give thanks to my people of Corozal Southwest once more. Quiero dar gracias a mi gente de Corozal Southwest una vez más for the apoyo, for the support, to being here again. Just remember, we are the voice of the voiceless. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I support this budget more than 100%. God bless Belize. I, I recognize the member for Toledo East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For the record, Madam Speaker, the Southern Caucus brought in the Honorable from Stan Toledo West, Stan Creek West, Dan Griga, and Toledo East. Of those four members sitting in this house today, two are ministers of government and two are backbenchers. And that has given me an opportunity that they have somebody to harass them give me time to go after them to serve the needs of the people that I represent. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's really a, a good feeling to be there helping the people and assisting them with what they need. During our meetings that we held over the years, we came up with the suggestion that an amnesty program was necessary for this country. But at that time, I believe in our debate among the four of us, we were looking more at single mothers, simply because we, in, in particular, in my constituency, we have quite a number of single mothers with Belizean children that are here illegally. So I must congratulate the, the, the cabinet for agreeing to go ahead with this amnesty. It will begin April 1st, as far as I understand. And so far, all the preparations are being made in order that this amnesty program can begin. 
each district area will be allowed three areas for registration. And for those people in the Toledo district, there is going to be a station at the Public Works Department in Punta Gorda or Ministry of Infrastructure. There will be one at the Forestry Department for the areas that covers um, Toledo West. And there will be another station in Bear Vista Village where people can go in to get registered. The program is not a free program. And that somebody threw it back in my face and said, but it's supposed to be amnesty. Yes, it is, but permanent residence today costs $1,500. The price is now being reduced to $500 for adults and $250 for children. So it is important that the, the, the word get out to the people concerned because now it is not only catering to single mothers, but to just anybody that has been living here for four years and, and working in Belize. I'd also like to take the opportunity, Madam Speaker, to address the problems we are facing in regards to land in the Toledo district. Punta Gorda town is completely surrounded by private estates, private ownership. And that, that was one of the reasons we, we took so long in trying to get the, the approval for houses for the, again, single mothers, because that is where it started. And, um, but in other areas, we have large, acreages of land and because of that there's a lot of abuse in that people just want to go and squat and take what they want and it is a di very difficult situation for me and for the minister involved with with lands in that area but so far we have been able to survey 164 lots in one area we already have we, we already have another proposal in the ministry for 500 lots because we have enough land, we have enough space. The minister say he want one, so we, we have to remember. But because of that, people take advantage. And, and it, it's hard to control it. And yes, you will make enemies when you make people understand, but you can't squat here. you got to move. And many times, you know, minister of police, we don't really get the assistance from the police in that they are claiming that they don't have no right to interfere in, in you know, that kind of situation with lands. But it is, because it, it can become volatile, it can become dangerous for people that you go and say, well, you, you don't business here, man, move. Because once we do the survey, you fall into somebody's home, what happened? Right now we are doing a survey where we have to put a, a drain, a drainage and somebody got one house sitting right in the middle of the drain. So, you know, it, it really gives a lot of problems. So, along with that, Madam Speaker, there's this, you know, you just gave us a letter recently in regards to corruption, but in public life. But I think this corruption thing is all over this country. Anywhere you move and Every time I complain, and I think economically it is affecting us and possibly affecting this budget here today. So that's why I'm, if you give me permission to, to discuss that matter. And every time I complain about it, I am told evidence. Bring the evidence. Well, Prime Minister, I will bring you the evidence. I will bring you a witness who has paid $20,000 to get his title from the lands department. And I will make you bring you the receipt. And the receipt is also stamped with a stamp from the Ministry of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. Now that is not a hard one because I had an experience recently where within my own village council in a particular village, some of the members, because they can't get what they want, they went to the Angelus Press and they got a stamp made for that particular village. How did we find out? We went there to get a new stamp. And remember, there's a video camera inside the Angelus Press. 
and it showed the person who went in there to get the stamp. And we got it back from the person. We did not take any kind of legal action. But this is, this is what is happening. This is reality on the ground that we need to address. In our education sector, we have completed a new high school in Bayer Vista Village for a cost of over $5 million. Now, we are not behave, behaving like the UDP, you know. Because what they do, they broke it down and start it over and say, we do it. That is Bear Vista Village, a new high school. San, I San Isidro Village. We are completing another primary school building for over $2 million, which should be completed this coming year, this fiscal year. We are also completing another high school in Corazon Village. Another $2 million plus. So, Prime Minister, thank you for keeping these programs alive because we need it for the people in the Toledo district. Because the way out of poverty is education. We have to educate our people that they can fight for themselves. In the health sector, when Minister Shabbat was Minister of Health, he initiated a program to revamp the Punta Gorda Hospital. They just had the inauguration for that, and that is ongoing. But myself and Mr. Rikena might say, but we want more. We want more because we have a problem, which I think we have raised in this National Assembly before, that we have an ambulance system that runs night and day, over 100 miles to take our patients to Dangriga for medical service. And I, I hope, Prime Minister, that sooner or later, we will try to solve this problem because it cannot continue. And that occurred on the, under the NHI program when that program was being initiated, and it continues up to this day. But I believe it has gone through its trial stages and has to be addressed. No, the big one we had this year was rain, rain, and more rain. In the Toledo district, I, I believe I made a report the last time I addressed the National Assembly that in the Toledo district, we get over 150 inches of rain every year. And this year was no exception. I think it might have been more. School buses stucking on the road, the Ministry of Infrastructure was going crazy, trying to find the necessary money to keep patching the roads. Because it was every day, every day we had problems. And they did try, whatever uh, efforts they made was what they could afford at that time. My comment now to the leader of the opposition, who was complaining this morning, that this is the second time, the second PUP government, where all, when I say all, I am talking about $15 million of equipment that we had in that district that was removed twice under the UDP government. Twice. Today, when I look at the list, again, to try and replace those equipment, you're looking at another $15 million. And I know at this time, because of the economic problems that we have in this country, it is difficult to just go and dig up another $15 million. So the equipment that we have working in the Toledo district is what we can afford. And yes, the people are dissatisfied. Yes, the people are not happy with it. But they also have to understand the economic situation that this country is going through. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to the minister for trying to assist. And right now, if, if you have a chance going into Santa Ana village, they have em, uh, employed a Mennonite with a stone crusher. And they have a whole mountain, I believe, about the height of this building of crushed material to put on the road between Santa Ana and Conejo Creek. But these things take time. You, you, you can't do it overnight. And I know Mr. Rekena 
Prime Minister, you're giving him about half a million dollars. And you're giving us another half a million dollars in order to try and fix those roads in the Toledo district. Thank you, sir, for assisting and, and being with us and being with the people in the Toledo district, who has been very faithful to this People's United Party. And I can never end without saying thank you to them. Thank you to them. Because they have been very faithful to the People's United Party. With all the hard times, with all the distance that they have to travel to get anything done, they continue to support the People's United Party. On the matter of housing, we have built two houses in the Punta Gorda town proper. We're supposed to build three more houses in Bea Vista, but the people have to understand that there are certain criteria that is used for you to be able to get one of these houses. So you must be a single mother and you have to afford $100 a month. The guy, that is the fee for the, for the house. And you have to own the property on which the house is being built. And that seems to be one of the problems that we are having in, 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 in the Bear Vista area in that the people have that old common law. You go to the chairperson, chairperson will tell you you could take lot number 10. That's for you. And that is a problem when you go to the lands department because they do not accept that. So the people must try to get their land leases because the housing project will continue. This is only the beginning of the housing project. And like one member of the house said today, that we build cement houses and they build cardboard house. Because if you see the houses that were built under the United Democratic Party, they are in terrible, terrible state. And I, I, if I go through, we built at Hopeville alone over 75 cement houses, two bedroom and three bedroom under the People's United Party, and over 35 cement houses in Independence Village. They are there for everybody to see. And we never say PUP only. Who could afford it? Go buy a house. And that is the attitude that I think we need to take in this country. Because we cannot continue this hate politics. This country belongs to all of us. PUP and UDP and whatever Green Party they are in. And we have to start thinking that way. And take that responsibility. So that our children will grow up with a totally different mentality. So, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the work goes on. Every month for the past, Madam Ministry of Housing and Labor, and we've been giving away $20,000 a month food supply to the people in the Toledo district, especially the towns, where people are being left out because they, they don't have any job. And we did not line up people like cattle that, that, that the way the UDP did it and take photographs. We delivered the food to their homes. Because I don't, man, like somebody said, this thing belongs to the people, not belong to us. We are only servants of the people. And we must continue to behave that way so that the people will also learn to respect us as leaders that they send to this National Assembly. And the people deserve more, because times are hard. People are unemployed. I see people crying when they get that bag. I hear children say, Mommy, now you could cook. Now you could cook. What is that telling you? That before that they had nothing to eat and nothing to cook. So we have to be very careful with the people that we represent. Madam Speaker, in sports, I heard the minister today saying that, yes, we need more sporting facilities in this country. And we are doing that. We are trying, with whatever allowances we get, whatever donations we get, we are trying to do sporting facilities so that the young people have activity, that they, COVID really destroyed football for the last two years that they, they were not able to go out and play their football. 
but there, there are other sports that we need to get our children engaged on. And we also have people that are being paid to run the sporting facility in the district. So we also have to find things for them to do and for them to promote the, the sporting activity in the schools and also for private use for those children that are outside. In agriculture, Madam Speaker, I was just complaining to the Minister of Rural Development. I said, Minister, be careful, you know, because I think it was yesterday night I was in a village and coming out, the chairman said, Minister, you look bad, you know. I said, why, man? He said, Mr. Rikina promised me that they have built Feeder Road and Farmer's Road. Farmer's Roads are very important to the people in Toledo, east and west, because this is how they make their living. They can't man, remember. <laughs> and, and, and our people are not like the Mennonites that have been able to use a horse or a mule. They, they work totally different. And it, it is difficult for them to be hauling their, their, their material or whatever they produce in these farms to, to wherever they're going. So, Minister, we hope that you will make peace with the village of Sunderwood because they, they are expecting it. Uh, this... Member for Toledo East, just a technical um, caution because of the mic. If you turn, oh, this yeah. One. Um, so the tr it's really for the report. All right, I will, I will close, like Madam Speaker, with this last one. And again, agriculture. We just attended a ceremony in Trio Village to assist the pineapple farmers in, that have that, that work in that area for nearly half a million dollars. Grant that they receive, they are going to put $33,000 towards the grant, so it, you know, it's funded both sides. And I think it's a good initiative in that many times we just go and, and arrange these programs they end up feeling like it's, it's a free gift. So they don't take it seriously. So by them contributing to the scheme, it makes them a lot more serious about what they're doing. The problem we have is that whenever, especially pineapple, we are producing over 6 million pounds of pineapple in the South. Remember, that's the area that produces all the banana. Five million bucks of banana for the air. Five million. Our farmers are trying to go to eight million. That creates more and more employment for our people. And I think that needs attention because the ministry will have to deal with marketing because the factory will only take one million pounds of pineapple. So what? the farmers have to do with the rest. And the, the, the ones they are taking at the factory is not the sweet variety. So they have to then plant the sweet variety that they could sell on the local market, which I think is not fair to them. Most of it spoiled. So, you know, it, it, it's an area that we have to look at in the agriculture department. Man, there are so many things you could do with pineapple. You go out to the key or anywhere else, you want a piña colada, they will open a tin when you could be using fresh pineapple produced in Belize. These, these, these are the areas I think that we need to look at and as a government we need to encourage so that our farmers can get the best benefit out of what they are producing. Because it is no use we are producing and can't sell. And this has caught us so many times. The rice industry for example we have just along with the minister from Toledo West to try and bring that back to life because it was the only commodity that our farmers in the south could sell one pound or could sell 10,000 pounds. And today, with a 15 million population, Guatemala on the other side, they need food. They come for our cows. They come for our feed from the feed mill to feed their animals. They will soon come for the eggs and the chicken because once spell they started taking the chicken out of Belize. So we have a market, 15 million people that need food right next to us. And we have to use that 
They sell their black beans because black beans is a common commodity on that side of the border. They sell their uh, uh, pumpkin seed. I did not even realize that pumpkin seed had so much of a value to the neighbors next to us. But these are areas that we need to expand and we need in, in, in our talks with the Guatemalans, man, they need it just as much. They need it and they come for it. I think this year we were offering 27 cents a pound for paddy. They came over and said, we'll pay you 30 cents a pound for paddy. Not even have to mill it, you know, you just write and they will come for it. So, you know, these are areas, Prime Minister, that we have to look at, expand, and get our people in the ministry to get involved with them. Madam Speaker, thank you very much, and thank the people of Toledo East. I, I recognize the member for Corazal, so Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I go into my speech, Madam Speaker, I don't, it's quite timely. And I will discuss a little bit more in my speech, but I just got a text from someone. We, are, we were having problems with the water system in Sartaneja. We, uh, there was a problem with the well, and someone, I guess, in his excitement just texted me. We just got a new well in Sartaneja. Thank you for your support and hard work of the Village Council, Madam Speaker. I will address that a little bit more. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would like your permission to indulge and uh, read from my notes. Thank you very much. I would like for you to know, Madam Speaker, and the Belizean public to know that in my ministry and in the Corozal Southeast constituency, we are delivering on plan Belize. That is our Bible for this period of government. That is what is guiding us in our, in our work in delivering for everyone, and that is Plan Belize. In the period of 2021, tw let me repeat, in the period of 2020 to 2021, despite the public health and economic challenges of the pandemic, my ministry remained resilient in the face of adversity. As the coronavirus threatened the lives and livelihoods of Belizeans across the country, our soldiers and the sailors mobilized to safeguard our borders and people to ensure the security of our nation. Our successes in 2020 and 2021 were due in no small part to the remarkable efforts within the security sector which grew out of our mission, our mandate, and our manifesto pledges of Plan Belize. Madam Speaker, I would like to divert, divert slightly just to acknowledge the partner I have in the, the member for Bengopan, Honorable Oscar Mira, because from day one, since the Prime Minister nominated us for this ministry, we have a mantra that we do. We make no excuses. We don't complain. We just get the work done. And we will not be here complaining of anything, Madam Speaker. We have been given a challenge, and my partner, Minister Mira, and I, we are going to get the, the job done for the sailors and soldiers in my ministry. The overarching strategy of the ministry was aimed at addressing welfare, accountability, and standards within the BDF and the Belize Coast Guard. We launched several capacity building initiatives which were crucial to address vulnerabilities that existed within the Defense Force for years. Welfare, morale, gender issues were identified as areas that required serious legal and policy revisions. Some of the major initiatives that our ministry undertook during this period includes the first one, and I am very proud to present to speak of this one, Madam Speaker, is the Joint Sexual Violence Prevention and the Response Program. Our ministry, Madam Speaker, and I've already explained this to the member from Belize Rural Central, Minister Dolores, that this ministry, under the leadership of myself and Minister Mira, is the lead ministry in 
in dealing with gender issues and gender violence in the country of Belize. This program brought together the BDF, the Coast Guard, and the Belize Police Department under one umbrella to reduce the incidence of sexual violence within Belize's security sector and provide effective response services should an incident occur. I want to report that just yesterday there was a lead, there was a symposium on this very issue, Madam Speaker, hosted at the Coast Guard base that included the police, the BDF, and obviously the Coast Guard. And the main speaker was our Governor General, none other than none other than Dame Froila Salam. She was there, and I remember her telling me how excited she was about being able to address this issue yesterday. The other issue we worked on, Madam Speaker, after our countrywide inspection of the military installations of the BDF, I, ident I identified priority areas for immediate reconstruction to improve the standard of living of the soldiers, the women, and men who serve. These included major repairs to bathroom facilities at Price Barracks, bathroom facilities which have gone without major repairs for over 30 years, and they needed new windows, doors, electrical, and the plumbing. The renovation was completed on the 3rd November 2021, affording officers a decent space to conduct their personal administration and boosting officer morale. The we are currently reconstructing the kitchen at Camp Belisario, Madam Speaker. We do all this work, Madam Speaker, because it is critical. We have soldiers and sailors who are at the forefront on our borders, protecting our country, they do not complain. But we, at the very least, have to ensure the facilities they use when they're on the base at least have to be basic. It has to be good. It has to be clean. It has to be functional. We did not encounter that when we took over the ministry. We, have also, have, we also have future major refurbishment of critical infrastructure that has been identified for the BDF to include accommodations, offices, and medical facilities, which will commence shortly due to the Kadai funds which were secured by this government, Madam Speaker. Future, criti future critical development for the Coast Guard has also been identified, which primarily includes the construction of the station at Big Creek to create a substantial presence at the port the surrounding areas to safeguard our economic and national security interests. This again, Madam Speaker, is something we're very proud of and we have already secured the Prime Minister's commitment to personally be there when we do the groundbreaking, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, our ministry have also hosted the Central American Security Conference, or CENSEC, in late January to early February, where we highlighted our work and progress in the areas of women, peace, and security under the team, collaborative responses to regional security and humanitarian assistance. Due to the pandemic, Madam Speaker, our officer cadets were unable to attend their usual training at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, in the UK, due to cancellation. Instead, we innovated and invited instructors to provide a short commissioning course for the first time in Belize and anywhere else, might I add. This afforded 25 cadets, not just from the BDF, but also from the Coast Guard and the police to participate in this unprecedented opportunity. My ministry encourages collaboration and shares our opportunities with other ministries, Madam Speaker. We encourage unity and we lead by example. The next issue, Madam Speaker, is that during this piece, we've, uh, during this past year, we've had our Coast Guard and BDF responding to flooding in the Kaya District and the Belize River Valley to provide transportation, medical assistance, rescue and recovery operations to the communities affected by the disaster. Madam Speaker, one of the things that I am pleased to be in this ministry is that I know whenever there is issue, whenever the country has trouble, people are always calling on the BDF and the Coast Guard for assistance and they always respond admirably. My ministry also recognized the need for an overarching umbrella strategy for national security 
and Defense, and the NSDS, National Security and Defense Strategy 2022-2026, is in its development stage with consultation from key stakeholders, Madam Speaker. This, we got this straight out of Plan Belize. As well, Madam Speaker, this year we are, co we are co hosting Trade Winds 2022 with Mexico, a Caribbean, which is a Caribbean security focused exercise to build interagency preparedness on the ground, on the sea, and in the air and cyber domains to improve the operational readiness of our troops while building regional partnerships. Madam Speaker, I want to take the time to point out, if you notice, we had the CANSEC earlier this year. We're now having trade-ins later on this year, all with our regional partners. This expresses confidence in our country, in the leadership of the country, and as well in the leadership in the BDF and Coast Guard to work with our regional partners to ensure security for Belize and within the region. This did not exist prior to 2021, Madam Speaker. The final part I want to talk about my, my ministry, Madam Speaker, is we are going to be introducing quite shortly a defense bond. A lot of work has to be done. Our installations and the facilities in both the Coast Guard and BDF, a lot of it has been run out. We also have to prepare for the future, Madam Speaker, and we realize only via some form of a long-term financing, we will be able to give our soldiers and sailors proper facilities, proper training, proper equipment for them to continue to do the work that they have been tasked to do. And also to meet whatever future challenges that this country, whatever future threats that this country may face, Madam Speaker. I would like now to turn to my division, Madam Speaker, the division that I'm quite proud of, I'm quite honored to represent, and I am grateful to the people of Corozal Southeast for the support, Madam Speaker. This is the one division that did not buy the fallacy of the United Government policies, Madam Speaker. They never did, and they won't. We continue to work tirelessly and have begun essential roadworks in all villages, Madam Speaker. This includes Ranchito, Carolina, Calcutta, Caledonia, Capabank, Progreso, Trinoche, and Sartaneja. These roadworks were neglected for the past 13 years, and now we continue to make improvements. Here, Madam Speaker, I want to thank, I don't see him, the member for Cayo South, Honorable Julius always supportive, always responsive. So, Madam Speaker, I am truly grateful. And again, because these are our uh, road from White Mall, it is an ongoing process. We constantly have to keep this work going on an annual basis. So we still continue, Madam Speaker. Turning to water issues, Madam Speaker, when we inherited four water boards in my division, all were, and some are still in debt, and I believe what is definitely a tra travesty is that, in particular, the Trunush water system and the Sartaneja water system were severely neglected, Madam Speaker. In Trunush, Madam Speaker, the, when the PUP left under the former Prime Minister, Said Musa, he left in 2008 this latest state-of-the-art reverse osmosis system for the village of Trunush. Within one year of the UDP taking over, that went into the ground, and they did not spend one penny for that system. And now, Madam Speaker, it is taking us a lot of work in collaboration with my friend from Toledo West, the Minister of Kenya, in trying to bring back that system. This is going to be a slow process, but bring it back, we will. Madam Speaker, I go to Sartaneja now where, again, that was another issue, complete neglect. We had to buy a new pump. We had to provide new parts and all that for the system. And we also had an oil well that began to provide brackish water. This is water that, you know, creates that scent that people were using. Luckily, luckily with Minister Rekenia, quick response. 
we now have a new well that is going to be functioning and providing fresh water to the villagers of Sartaneha, Madam Speaker. That's why, I, and, and as I tell you, I just got the text half a minute before I began presentation, Madam Speaker. So, PUP government at work, plan Belize in execution. This Saturday, Madam Speaker, in the village of Chunush, finally, finally, national health insurance will arrive, and it is going to be inaugurated to provide health services to Chunush and the surrounding villages of Copper Bank, Sartaneha, and Progreso. Madam Speaker, one of the things that one of the things that is bittersweet about this is that we had for the past 13 years the Minister of Health from the Corozal District and NHI could not reach that area, Madam Speaker. That is a crime. That's utterly disgusting in anyone's performance as a minister. The PUP, thanks to Minister Kevin Bernard and also the push from the former minister, Minister Michaud, we now will inaugurate NHI in Trunosh Village for the surrounding areas, Madam Speaker. This, I am particularly pleased of one of our accomplishments already. In the division, Madam Speaker, we continue to provide educational assistance for a wide cross-section of students from primary to tertiary school students, regardless of political affiliation. And we continue to help more every day. In support of our schools and children, we continue to improve the neighborhood parks with plans to improve sporting facilities with necessary equipment in the near future. Madam Speaker, a generous friend have just donated to me some, like I believe about a thousand chess sets, and I'm hoping we can create like a chess revolution in Corozal Southeast. I truly hope we can do that, and we'll be distributing that to the schools quite soon. We help many schools and we help many schools get much needed internet access, Madam Speaker. Again, as we now know, internet is not a luxury, it is an essential tool. In the village of San Joaquin, we have teamed up with the FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization, a branch of the UN, to begin a student meal pilot program that will, that upon its successful completion, we will extend it to all the other schools in the Corozal Southeast Division, Madam Speaker. I also want to comment on housing and sports, Madam Speaker. Again, this will be coming out in this year for us. We already have three in the works, Madam Speaker, and there is more that is going to be coming out, in particular in the housing program. Not one house was built in 13 years under the United Democratic Party, Madam Speaker. We are working energetically with our constituents on their land matters. Madam Speaker, again, this, this must be given credit. For the first time in 13 years, a Minister of Lands visited the Corozal Southeast Division and attended to the people, Madam Speaker. I truly am amazed at the work uh, my colleague from Lake Independence, Honorable Cordell Hyde, I know I shouldn't say the name, but please bear with me. You know, he came, he worked, he addressed every issue, and he made the work look easy. And I do believe that the people feel good that finally someone were attending to the issues in land. You would be surprised, Madam Speaker, that some land papers for 13 years were not touched because they didn't have access to the then government of the UDP in their natural resources. Madam Speaker, I want to close by congratulating in my ministry the civilian staff our security forces, and all who contributed to the successes of this period. I say thank you for the work that we have done. It was no small feat. Madam Speaker, what I am pleased to say, I had expected to be dealing with personnel issues when we had the 10%. On the contrary, I want to say I am pleased to report to the House in my ministry, no one no one gave half, everyone continued to work, and they worked very hard. And as well, no one in the security forces were playing games. They continue diligently to do their work, and I want to thank them for that, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, of course, I can't close off without telling 
my executives, and they know who they are, of the hard work that they have done to address the issues for the Corozal Southeast constituents. Each of the con executive members from each of the village, they don't have working hours, Madam Speaker. They work 24-7, Sunday to Sunday, every day. Sometimes my calls come at 8 o'clock the night Saturday, sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning Sunday, but they're always working. My executive team has never one day told me, no, I will not do something. Whatever task I've asked them to do on behalf of the community, they've always jumped on it and they've gotten the work done. I want to personally thank those who work for me in my office for the big support, Madam Speaker. As well, I want to thank the constituents of Corozal Southeast because they have stood by us and I want to commit to them again. I will not let you down. I will continue to work very hard to ensure that Corozal Southeast gets a chair of Plan Belize and that everyone can win in the Corozal Southeast Division. Madam Speaker, I support this budget. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for Kyle North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to make my contribution to the debate on the General Revenue Appropriation Bill 2022. And with your permission, I wish to refer to my notes. Madam Speaker, Belize's growth in 2021 was nothing short of impressive. The IMF estimates that Belize's economy expanded by 12.5%, while the Statistical Institute of Belize's preliminary number is just below 10%. One of the factors which contribute to this growth, Madam Speaker, according to the Central Bank of Belize, was a strong vaccination campaign. Madam Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to thank all those nurses, doctors, community healthcare workers, the vaccination, IT, and communication teams at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and all those persons who collaborated in 2021 to reach across the length and breadth of this country and fully vaccinated over 200,000 Belizeans. Madam Speaker, with your permission, I pause to publicly thank Dr. Natalia Baer and Dr. Melissa Diaz for their dedication and untiring efforts in this regard. Of course, Madam Speaker, that would not have been possible but for the will of the vast majority of Belizeans who understood that getting vaccinated was the only path to reopening and rebuilding the economy. Madam Speaker, this new budget which is being proposed will be the largest spending and investment budget in the history of our country. For me, Madam Speaker, I, am, I continue to remind myself of the words of President Roosevelt, who in his inaugural address on January 20th, 1937 said, and I quote, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. The Ministry of Public Utilities, Energy, Logistics, and E-Governance plays an important role in helping to lift our people out of poverty. Water represents life, and clean water means health. Electricity is transformative as it removes barriers that inhibits learning and productivity. Access to data brings the world to our fingertips. This year, 2022, this fiscal year, 2022-2023, the ministry will be commissioning two new microgrids and will see the upgrading of an existing microgrid bringing electricity to four villages, to over 500 households, to four health centers, to three schools, and to countless students who will now be able to do their schoolwork at night. 
these systems will not only bring light, but will also bring opportunities for the residents of these communities. This ministry is also working on electrifying an additional six villages through partnerships with the European Union and other strategic partners. Madam Speaker, we are delivering on Plan Belize. <clears throat> the Ministry will also be partnering with the Ministry of Transport to bring the first electric buses to Belize's highways and Belize City. The Ministry is also pursuing the national goal of obtaining 75% of the total electricity consumed in Belize from sustainable renewable sources by 2030. Madam Speaker, although 92% of our population have access to electricity, we must ensure that within the terms of this administration, we increase that number to provide access to many more of our people. While in some quarters there is the belief that the price of rural electrification is too high, we at the ministry say that the cost of poverty is even higher and more burdensome on our economy. During this fiscal year, the ministry, among other things, will also be looking at capacity building within the ministry. We will be looking at energy security and sustainability, and we'll be finalizing draft regulations to address distributive energy generation. Madam Speaker, it is anticipated that this financial year will see the launching of an RFP for the provision of electricity from sustainable renewable sources such as solar, wind, and hydro, which will make the country more energy independent. The future under Plan Belize is bright and full of energy. In relation to data, the National Telecom is currently partnering with the Ministry of Education to offer Wi-Fi to 197 schools countrywide so that, so that students can access the internet in their classrooms and common areas. I am proud to say that included in that expansion will be the Bulletree Seventh-day Adventist Primary School and the Immaculate Conception Roman Catholic Primary School, both in Kai on Earth. It is expected that mobile services will be expanded this year to 25 new areas across the country, thereby improving the lives of our citizens by having connectivity. While people may be able to live without food, we cannot live without water, Madam Speaker. Water is a basic human right. In this regard, and in keeping with Plan Belize, it is, ex it is intended to expand access to water across the country. Rural water boards will be strengthened and systems expanded. Madam Speaker, the past administration failed to provide access, adequate access to potable water and misspent hundreds of thousands of dollars on failed water systems like the one in Bulletree Falls. Just as clean water represents health, attention must also be given to sewage, which affects our environment. In this regard, and in conjunction with the Belize Water Services Limited, attention will be given to the treatment facility in Belize City and on the construction of new sewer systems in Kikaka, Placentia, and Nert and Burgess Key. Turning to logistics, Madam Speaker, which includes post office and ports, they will also benefit from the forward movement of the ministry. The Belize Post Office, under the direction of the new Postmaster General, will be reorganized into a modern, relevant, reliable postal career to serve the needs of the Belizean people. In this regard, the ministry will be strengthening the policy and legislative framework of the post office. It will undertake training and certification of postal employees. It will see the creation of a digital delivery platform where customers will be able to track their packages. 
There will be the creation of new products and services. We will see the establishment of new district postal couriers in various parts of the country to serve the underserved communities where mails and packages are not easily accessible. Madam Speaker, in relation to ports, the time has come for the development of a national ports master plan. In this regard, and in collaboration with the Belize Ports Authority and the various stakeholders, the Ministry will be reviewing the various international maritime treaties which have been ratified and now require domestication on our national laws. We will be reviewing existing national legislation, we'll be building capacity in the maritime area. And in this regard, Madam Speaker, I am happy to announce that the Belize Ports Authority will be, for the first time in its history, offering four scholarships to the Caribbean Maritime University in Jamaica to students wishing to obtain a bachelor's degree in one of the various maritime disciplines. <laughs> Madam Speaker, along with the Belize Ports Authority, we will be looking to acquire capacity in the areas of maritime emergency response, including tugs, salvage, firefighting, and pollution. Additionally, Madam Speaker, in this, in this fiscal year, the Belize Ports Authority will be developing and implementing a central documentation portal aimed at improving its services to the public. In relation to e-governance, Madam Speaker, the advent of the internet, the impact of natural disasters and pandemics have all dramatically affected our lives and how we do business. Consequently, we need to rethink how we operate, how we govern, and how we provide services to our citizens. I am proud to say that it is under this Prime Minister and this administration that the Ministry of E-Governance and the E-Governance and Digitalization Unit has been constituted. Belize's first nat National Digital Agenda 2025 is the pathway that will guide our country's transformation into a digital nation with the ultimate goal of improving the lives and quality of services to our citizens. And may I pause, Madam Speaker, to recognize the work done by the Honorable Kevin Bernard while he was the Minister of E-Governance. The Ministry has supported improvements in the following areas. Services for export and import license issued by the Suppliers Control Unit, vehicle and driver's license processing, permits for the import and export of scrap metal, used tires, acid batteries, it has been involved in the formulation of new legislation, including a Data Protection Act, a Public Sector Data Sharing and Electronic Funds Transform Crime Act, which forms the enabling environment for governments and private sector transformation. In this fiscal year, Madam Speaker, the Ministry will be initiating the following projects. One, the National Identification Project, the Digital Skills Program for public, for public Service Officers, Digital Inclusion Program for Citizens, One Stop Shop for Government Services, Legislative Reforms to Strengthen E-Governance e Implementation. We'll be looking at a data policy framework, looking at electronic payment solutions, such as the piloting of mobile wallets for online payment of government services. The Ministry also aims to support the much-needed strengthening of the Vital Statistics Department and the Lands Department. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of the Public Utilities, Energy, Logistics and E-Governance, guided by Plan Belize, is on the move. And we will do our part to deliver for the people of Belize. Madam Speaker, briefly, in relation to Kai on Earth, we continue on a monthly basis to deliver grocery bags to approximately 350 families. 
we have, re we have undertaken the rehabilitation of various roads in the Bulletry Falls village. We have painted and placed solar lights on the two bridges leading to the village and also on the main bridge that connects the village. We have rehabilitated the clinic in Bulletry, the Luisa Manzanero Clinic, and we have brought primary care health services to the village. We intend to rehabilitate to rehabilitate the park and football field in Bulletry. Shortly, Madam Speaker, we are going to be launching our sewing program for single women in Kayanert. In relation to houses, two have been built and three are expected to commence shortly. I am proud to say that sports is back in Kayanert. This Saturday, we will be hosting our first basketball competition at the Vic Victor Galvez Stadium. Madam Speaker, in Bulletry, we continue to support the Water Board in their efforts to maintain a constant supply of water to the village. We have constructed a bypass connecting Santiago Juan to Collins Avenue. We are, con we are currently conducting surveys for the expansion of light and water in those areas of the town where they are needed. Madam Speaker, with the assistance of the Honorable Francis Fonseca, we were able to help many young students continue their primary, secondary, and tertiary education. We are currently working with the Lands Department to identify lots for the people of Kayanert. Madam Speaker, let me end by thanking my hardworking executive who, would, without them, this would not be possible. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the people of Kayanert, I support this budget. Thank you very much. Honorable members of this house, uh, before I suspend, please allow me um, just a few remarks. Since we last met in this house, I announced since we were in the Women's Month of the uh, Women's Parliamentary Caucus and that it was a bicameral um, effort. I'm pleased to announce that we now have added one more member uh, to that chamber, which is really a plus for the National Assembly and the people of Belize with the uh, appointment of Senator Janelle Chanona. So the Women's Parliamentary Caucus is now 11 strong. Um, I also wanted to remind members and really ask for your support on both sides. We do have uh, what is called political whips for both sides, but to kindly work with members for those who do not attend house meetings, that standing order 84, the clerk really ought to be, the office of the clerk ought to be notified. If the office of the clerk is not notified, please know for the record that is not regarded as a absence that has been duly um, cited with notice. So I'm asking for your indulgence as we continue to work on the effort of revising the standing orders that will hopefully correct the issue with absences. But until then, um, we do need to adhere to standing order 84. And with that, honorable members of this house, the meeting is suspended until 9 a.m. That's 9 a.m in the morning. Thank you.